particularly the propaganda of the so-called Leninists, and considering such propaganda no less pernicious than any other counter-revolutionary propaganda, at the same time considering it impossible to adopt any repressive measures against propaganda, while it remains mere propaganda, the Executive Committee of the Soviet of Soldiers Deputies recognizes the utmost urgency of adopting a series of measures to counteract this propaganda with our own propaganda and agitation. April 28th. However strange it may sound, some of the first to raise their voices against Lenin and all the false pacifists who stupefied the soldiers' brains were the discharged invalid soldiers. Their union, organized at the very beginning of the revolution, deserves special study. These men, who had sacrificed their youth and health to their country, who had often passed through the degrading hardships of imprisonment, now saw to their horror that all their heroism, all their sacrifices were being rendered useless by revolutionary catchwords, and that obscure and irresponsible talkers were thrusting Russia under Germany's heel. There was something infinitely touching and tragic in the sight of those cripples, without arms or legs, blinded and disfigured by war, straining every nerve to prove that the war must be carried on, that no liberty was possible without victory. Members of the Disabled Men's Union organized meetings, visited barracks, appealed to the government and made street demonstrations. On April 29 an enormous crowd of invalids gathered in the Kazan Square and marched towards the Toraide Palace. The placards they carried bore the inscriptions, Lenin and Company back to Germany, the motherland is in danger, our wounds call for victory, and so on. As they approached the palace they were met by members of the executive committee of the Soviet. We have come here to expose Lenin's tactics and your attitude towards him, declared one of the invalids. Skoplev, Tsretli, and other Soviet orators said in reply that although they did not entirely agree with Lenin, they did not deem it possible to oppose him by other than intellectual methods. Apparently, the disabled men were not particularly satisfied by the explanations received from the Soviet orators. The future minister, M. Skoplev, did use the rather risky phrase that we must beat Germany, but no one supported him, while Gvozdv, a prominent labor leader, declared, We consider the war should be ended by an agreement with the German proletariat. After prolonged discussions out in the square the invalids drafted a lengthy resolution, ending thus, we greet our allies, and ask them to believe that in unity with them the Russian army and people will bring the war to a victorious end for the consolidation of our newly acquired liberties and the self-determination of all oppressed peoples. Meanwhile around them stood the young, strong, and healthy soldiers of the Petrograd garrison who had never yet been in the trenches and smirked contemptuously. Unfortunately not only the Soviet but the government itself did not for a long time realize the danger of Bolshevism. Even the cadet leader, Miley Ukov, the avowed antagonist of the entire Soviet policy, speaking at a meeting a few days before his definite rupture with them on the 29th of April, said, Lenin is a harmful fanatic, but you cannot demand that we should oppose him with the methods of the old regime. It was not till later that Miley Ukov began to insist on the arrest of Lenin and the Leninists. But having rejected the Tsarist methods of diverting the currents that threatened to undermine the state, the new government had failed to discover any other adequate means of dealing with them. Those were right, who ironically called Prince Lvov's government a Tolstoyan government of non resistance to evil. Both in Soviet and government circles there existed a childlike certitude that evil should be combated by force of conviction, that mere persuasion, without prohibition and compulsory measures, would be sufficient to prevent anarchy from spreading at the front and in the rear. Meanwhile, not only in intellectual circles, but among the crowd in the streets, Bolshevist speeches at first excited indignation and a desire that some power, strong and just, would put a stop to such iniquity. When the Bolsheviks summons to end the war with Germany and begin the war against the provisional government was first proclaimed from the balcony of Kesinska's house, it was received by the crowd with the same disapproval as were Lenin's speeches at the conference. On the very first evening, April 25th, the indignant audience arrested about 20 people at the Troitsky Square and conveyed them to the militia. This was absolutely useless, 
for those in authority found nothing criminal in such speeches. But the same kind of speeches were uttered not only in the neighborhood of Kesinska's house, they could be heard all over the city, in the army, throughout the length and breadth of the land. And they were often uttered by strange looking men, speaking broken Russian. While a certain discipline still remained, it is curious to note how the army reacted against such propaganda. Towards the end of May, according to a press agency telegram, Ensign Cruiser, arriving at the Romanian front from Kronstadt, preached fraternization and distrust of the government, and even falsely asserted that the Odessa Congress of Frontal Delegates demanded annexations and indemnities. He was arrested and sent off to Jassy because the workmen at Skudini had promised to stain their hands in blood if he again dared to make an appearance. The Soviet of soldiers and officers deputies at Jassy denounced his activities as harmful, but, possessing no means of counteracting them, dispatched him to Odessa and decided to appeal to the press in order to devise some means of opposing such pernicious agitation. This was but one of countless cases. Yet how could effective means of counteraction be found? when every attempt to restrict the irresponsible agitation at the front met with indignant resistance from the Soviet, and when generals who dared to point out the danger of such propaganda were branded in the Izvestia and other organs of the revolutionary democracy as counter-revolutionaries. At the same time, the Germans and Austrians lent vigorous aid to this extreme socialistic propaganda. They propagated Bolshevist ideas in proclamations sown broadcast along the front, and in newspapers printed in Germany and Vienna in Russian. These papers were distributed not only among the prisoners, but among the soldiers in the trenches. For instance, the Berlin Russian Messenger, in its issue of April 27, wrote, Aided by the English, a clique of deputies to the Duma have seized the power and formed a provisional government. The new cadet party is preventing the workmen from taking the power into their own hands, and, after ridding Russia of English aggression and the supremacy of English capital, proclaiming a social republic and making peace. The Central Powers were therefore already engaged in active propaganda, incriminating the provisional government and advertising Lenin and his catchwords. This strange coincidence between the ideas of the extreme Russian socialists and those of the official propagandists of His Majesty the Emperor of Germany has more than once been commented upon by the Russian press and not only in the bourgeois papers. Polekhanov's small but lively and patriotic paper, Unity, Edinstvo, carried on a passionate campaign of accusation. One of the oldest Russian revolutionary emigres, Leo Duch, published in this paper information concerning Trotsky's propaganda in America. Duch justly called him a hater of Russia. Madame Kolontai's activities in America were contemporary with those of Trotsky. Her tirades against us, that is against differencist socialists, were, said Duch, so revolting that Russian workmen in several towns expressed, both by word of mouth and in the press, the suspicion that perhaps she had been expressly sent by German socialists for the purpose of whitewashing German social democrats, by calumny directed against those who advocated the defense of the ravaged countries. But all these warnings and facts were ignored by the revolutionary democracy, and indeed rather tended to enhance their friendliness towards the Bolsheviks, whom they always exalted as their comrades in ideas. Soviet leaders and journalists defended Lenin and his satellites at meetings and in the socialist press, and all attempts to disclose the poisonous substance of Bolshevism were branded as bourgeois calumny. Lenin himself felt no scruples in attacking the socialist center, and did so with great polemic astuteness. In May, he issued a pamphlet entitled Political Parties in Russia and the Task of the Proletariat, in which, in the form of questions and answers, he gave character sketches of both the bourgeois and socialistic parties. His estimate of the latter was ironical. To a question as to the attitude of the social democrats and the social revolutionaries towards socialism he gave the following answer, they stand for socialism, but to think of it now and to take immediate practical steps towards its realization they have not the courage, for they think that would be premature. The Bolsheviks, on the contrary, are all for trying to bring about socialism forthwith. 
beginning by the seizure of all land and the nationalization of the banks. Lenin gives a sarcastic definition of the non-Bolshevist socialists' attitude towards the seizure of power. If the Soviets alone seize power we shall be threatened with anarchy. For the time being, leave power to the capitalists, and the contact commission to the Soviet. The contact commission served as a link between the revolutionary democracy and the government. Lenin invariably insisted that no contact was necessary, because the government should not be supported, the people should be prepared for the sole and absolute power of the Soviets, and all propaganda, agitation, and organization should be directed towards the delegation of all power to the Soviets in the immediate future. The cadets, Lenin declared, though enemies, were at any rate straightforward. But those whom he called differencist socialists, he urged, while agreeing with the Bolsheviks in words, drew back timidly before the necessity of at last suiting the action to the word. And he exposed the ambiguity of their attitude with the ruthless familiarity of an old fellow worker. He accorded the same treatment to the social revolutionaries and to the non Bolshevist social democrats, although these latter still regarded themselves as being members of one undivided party, to which the Bolsheviks also belonged. Lenin's description of the attitude adopted by the social revolutionaries and the social democrats towards the war is as follows. We are generally opposed to imperialistic war, but are ready to let ourselves be duped, and will call the support we offer to the imperialistic war conducted by the Guchkov Miley Ukov and Company government by the name of revolutionary defensism. And as to fraternization, their attitude was, yes, it is useful. But we are not all of us convinced that such fraternization ought to be encouraged at once in all belligerent countries. He himself was certainly decidedly against the war and for fraternization. It is useful and absolutely necessary. It is urgently necessary to encourage attempts at fraternization between soldiers of both belligerent sides in all belligerent countries. Only on the question of army organization, more particularly of that of the election of officers, was he ready to grant that his socialist comrades possessed a definite view. Their answer was brief elections must take place. The Bolshevist answer was more lengthy. Not only must officers be elected, but every step of an officer or general must be controlled by soldiers specially elected for the purpose. To the question is the arbitrary dismissal of superiors useful? Lenin made the social democrats and social revolutionaries answer, yes, it is useful but it remains uncertain whether the dismissal must take place before referring to the contact commission or vice versa. The Bolsheviks asserted, it is useful and necessary in every way. Soldiers obey and respect only elected superiors. Thus point by point Lenin not only expounded the views of his party, but also his attitude towards that section of the revolutionary democracy which, at that time, still played the leading part. His subsequent behavior was but the logical outcome of all his actions and declarations. It was futile after the November coup d'etat for the defeated socialist center to raise the cry that the Bolsheviks were traitors. They acted openly right through, and it was easy enough to understand what deeds would be the tragic outcome of the interminable torrent of speeches so often uttered in unison by both the right and the left socialist wings. Upon one point only in the above quoted pamphlet did Lenin's words differ from his subsequent action. Must the Constituent Assembly be convoked? He asked. According to him, the cadets did not desire to fix a date. The Social Democrats and the Social Revolutionaries wished it to be called as soon as possible, but were unable to insist upon the date being fixed. The Bolsheviks were the only ones to desire a speedy convocation. There is, however, said Lenin, only one guarantee of the success of the Constituent Assembly, the increase in numbers and in strength of the Soviets, the organization and arming of the working masses. Curiously enough, although the pamphlet was published in May, after the formation of the coalition cabinet with a socialist majority, Lenin did not modify his acrid criticism of his comrades in ideas. On the contrary, he added a note declaring that the pamphlet was by no means out of date, because the contact commission has not disappeared, but has only passed into the adjacent room, that of Messrs. the ministers.
that Jin often does really have passed into another room does not signify that their policy or that of their party has changed. He was displeased with their policy of words without deeds, but in view of the undoubted honesty of the great mass of revolutionary defensists, he appealed to his comrades to explain to them patiently and persistently the indissoluble links uniting capital and imperialistic war to prove that it was only by overthrowing capital that they could without violence achieve a truly democratic peace. Chapter of the First Government Crisis Shilgin and Tsritli, whence is the danger, crisis because of the word victory, resignation of Miley Ukov and Guchkov, the coalition ministry, the declaration of the new government and the Zimmerwald formule, the socialist ministers, Alexov's speech, his retirement of the post of Generalissimo. In the spring of 1917, the revolutionary democracy was blind both to the danger of Bolshevism and to the military peril. Of this, we have clear evidence in the speech delivered on May 10 by the Soviet leader, Tsritli, a Menshevik, at the extraordinary meeting of the Four State Duma, which reviewed the events of the first two months of the revolution. This first public meeting, the first public skirmish between the two principal political groups the socialists and the bourgeoisie coincided with the first ministerial crisis. Warning voices sounded from the right. They emphasized the German peril in view of the growing disruption of the army, pointed to the spread of anarchy throughout the country, the land riots fraught with the menace of starvation, and the ambiguous position of the government. The Kiev deputy, Shulgin, a courageous and able patriot, said in his pointed way, the Tsar's government is shut up in the fortress of St. Peter and St. Paul, while the provisional government is under domiciliary arrest. A keeper is appointed to guard it with the instruction, keep a sharp look out, they are bourgeois, they must be closely watched. Shulgin spoke of the criminal incitement of soldiers against the officers, of the open street propaganda against the Allies, particularly against England adding that all this pacifist propaganda among the ignorant masses emanated from Lenin and his pack. Zritli's response was imbued with the spirit of the Zimmerwald conference and its denial of a class truce during wartime. The so-called defense of the fatherland in the present war is nothing but a fraud, aiming at subjugating the people to the service of imperialism, declared the manifesto of the second Zimmerwald conference. This, too, was the standpoint from which Tsritli estimated the war and Russia's relations with her allies. Everything for the war, said Shulgin in his speech. The spokesman of the Soviet objected that this was the motto of the autocracy, to whom war was both a name and a means. From the benches of deputies he was reminded that in England and France that was the motto of the whole nation. But Tsritli did not believe that unity between the people and the government could exist anywhere, even in free countries. The French and English nations are one thing, and the imperialistic gang another, and you will soon see this proved there as triumphantly as in Russia. We are profoundly convinced that the English working classes will direct the policy of their ministers in conformity with their class interests. Zretli did not wish to re-establish the formula of the destruction of German imperialism, because the destruction of a foreign country's imperialism by armed force is the surest way of implanting imperialism and barbarism in one's own country. The idea of vanquishing the Germans was as abhorrent to him as it was to the Bolsheviks. Like them, he did not so much desire to fight as to apply the utmost endeavors to provoke a certain corresponding, revolutionary, movement in other countries. Yet, at the same time, he expressed the assurance that so long as our country was threatened by the invasion of imperialistic armies, the Russian democracy would stand firm for the defense of its liberty, and no wavering would be possible in the ranks of the army. Not only the Stavka, headquarters, but all the generals, and even the army committees expressed alarm at the growing disintegration of the army. But Zretli simply did not believe these rumors, https colon slash slash www.yamaguchi.com slash library slash tikava slash tikava underscore 04.html just as he declined to believe that Lenin was leading Russia to civil war. I do not agree with Lenin and his propaganda, said Prince Zretli, but Deputy Shulgin's words are a calumny against Lenin. 
Lenin has never preached anything preventing the onward march of the revolution. Lenin is conducting a propaganda of ideas and principles which is nourished by such demonstrations as that of Shulgin and the so-called moderate propertied elements. Thus the possibility of an agreement with the bourgeoisie is eliminated. According to Lenin's standpoint, when the bourgeoisie becomes incapable of dealing with problems concerning the entire state, it must be set aside and the Soviet of workmen's and soldiers' deputies assume full power. If Shulgin's ideas were shared by all the bourgeoisie, then I must say that the only hope for Russia's salvation lies in the dictatorship of the proletariat and the peasants. Such ideas as Shulgin's constitute the only real menace of civil war. Subsequent events showed the lamentable short-sightedness of Tsritli. It was not the bourgeoisie but Lenin and his satellites who unchained the demons of civil war in Russia. But the revolutionary democracy, intoxicated with the new wine of liberty, looked only to the right for its enemies, expected blows to come only from that quarter, and hastened to put into practice all its cherished watchwords, all the resolutions adopted at once obscure and unpopular but very long-winded socialistic meetings and congresses. The ministerial crisis which took place in May was a manifestation of that distrust of the right parties which was so skillfully and persistently fanned into flame by the Bolsheviks. This time the word victory, used by the Minister of Foreign Affairs P. Miliukov, in a note addressed to the Allied countries, served as a motive for the crisis. From the very beginning of the revolution this word was regarded in Soviet circles as counter-revolutionary. On March 30th, for instance, the Izvestia published an article advising the soldiers taking part in manifestations to replace on their banners the motto war until victory by that of war for liberty. A demonstration was organized against Miley Ukov on account of his note declaring that the entire Russian people aspired to continue the war until final victory. The Bolsheviks started their agitation in the barracks. On May 3 a section of the Finland regiment marched up to the Marie Palace, where the government sat, carrying placards with the inscriptions, down with annexations, down with the government, down with Miley Ukov and Guchkov. They were joined by other military units, but a strong counter-demonstration was at once organized in support of Miley Ukov and the government. Hot disputes for and against the government raged at street meetings. Soviet orators came to the palace and urged the soldiers to disperse. General Kornilov, commander of the Petrograd military district, also appeared in the square. You represent an armed people, he said. Therein lies your strength. But you are also weak, because you are not as well disciplined as good troops should be. Then try to be not merely an armed crowd but a real, well-disciplined army. The demonstrators dispersed. But the instigators of the demonstration won the day. A split was created in the provisional government. The executive committee of the Soviet, which from the first had looked suspiciously on the firm patriotism of Guchkov and Miley Ukov, secured their resignation. The Izvestia did not conceal its joy when the Minister of War, Guchkov, resigned on the 15th of May and Miley Ukov on the 16th. This important government change was welcomed with equal rejoicing by the Berlin press. In point of fact it was but the first step towards the realization of the Bolshevist demand full power to the Soviets. The Bolshevist Central Committee of the Social Democratic Party exerted a very resolute pressure upon its less energetic comrades in order to achieve this end. The Pravda published a lengthy appeal from the Social Democrats to the soldiers of all belligerent countries calling upon them to put an immediate end to the imperialistic robbers' war. The Russian Provisional Government, wrote the Pravda, published on 3 May a note confirming the old predatory treaties, and expresses its readiness to continue the war until complete victory is attained thereby raising indignation even among those who have hitherto trusted and supported it. The Pravda therefore demands the transfer of power to the revolutionary Soviets by means of a workman's revolution. The appeal ends with a new war cry, peace to the huts, war to the palaces. Hurrah for socialism! Simultaneously with this open summons to civil war the Bolsheviks wrote, 
party agitators and orators must refute the dastardly lies of the capitalists and capitalist papers, accusing us of being the instigators of civil war. Party agitators must again and again protest against the hideous calumnies spread by capitalists, that our party is advocating a separate peace with Germany. We consider William II. Just such another crowned robber deserving of execution as Nicholas II, and the German Gutschkoffs and German capitalists as being robbers, grabbers, and imperialists as much as Russian, English and all other capitalists. We are opposed to negotiations with capitalists. We stand for negotiations and fraternization between the revolutionary workmen and soldiers of all countries. We are firmly persuaded that the Guchkov Miliukov government are trying to render the situation more acute because they know that the workmen's revolution is beginning in Germany, and this revolution will strike a blow at the capitalists of all countries. All the subsequent work of the Bolsheviks demonstrated the hypocrisy of these protests. Both separate peace and civil war were but the logical consequences of their agitation. But in the spring of 1917 the masses of soldiers and workmen, simple-minded, ignorant, bewildered by unintelligible foreign words, intoxicated by demagogic promises, firmly believed that it sufficed but to put all the downs into practice for the war to end as if by magic, and every workman to become a gentleman. Committee meetings and conferences, all packed with soldiers, adopted without demur the most extreme resolutions, particularly those which promised a speedy peace. Resolutions rose everywhere, like bubbles on the water's surface. Workmen, schoolboys, servant maids, doctors, soldiers' wives, railway guards, sextons all hastened to embody their particular needs and newborn political ideas in lengthy and often quite amusing resolutions. But the Soviets lent an attentive ear to all these chance decisions of chance meetings. After the resignation of Miley Ukov and Guchkov, the provisional government found themselves definitely in the power of the Soviet, which could no longer maintain the attitude of an irresponsible critic. The formation of a coalition government with the participation of socialists became inevitable. The Bolsheviks, led by Trotsky, who by that time had returned from abroad, protested very sharply against the coalition headed by the bourgeois Prince Lvov, and even then urged the Soviet to take the power into its own hands. But the Soviet would not go so far and only introduced five of its members into the government Jinov, Peshekhonov, Skoblev, Tsritli, and Pereverzev. The new cabinet was composed of six socialists, including Irinsky, four cadets, and four non-party members. Https colon slash slash www.yamaguchi.com slash library slash tikava slash tikava underscore 04. Html since, however, one of the cadets, Nekrasov, and the Minister for Foreign Affairs, Tiresh Kenko, frequently voted with the socialists. All the power was practically concentrated in the socialists' hands, insofar at least as the provisional government represented a power. What the aims of these new statesmen were, and what was their conception of their duties towards the destiny of the Russian people, may be gathered from the declarations of the executive committee and the provisional government respectively. On entering the provisional government, the representatives of the Soviet, while associating themselves with the general and insistent aspirations for the consolidation of liberty, have imposed on themselves the following task, to pursue an active foreign policy openly aiming at a speedy conclusion of peace based upon the self-determination of peoples, without annexations and indemnities, and more particularly the preparation of negotiations with the Allies for a revision of the agreement based upon the declaration of the provisional government of May 9th. April 27. Thus spoke the Executive Committee. The declaration of the coalition government, dated May 19, repeated the same words with regard to a speedy conclusion of peace, without annexations and contributions, based upon the self determination of the peoples. This was the first occasion on which an official document of the Russian government quoted a part of the formula which formed the basis of the invitation to the Third Zimmerwald Conference. This invitation had been sent out by the Swiss socialist, Robert Grimm, 
to all parties and organizations that accepted the program of a fight against the party truce, the renewal of class war, a demand for an immediate armistice, and conclusion of peace without annexation and indemnities based upon the free self-determination of the nations. After the Brest peace the tragic irony of this formula appeared in all its nakedness. But every discerning mind had perceived it long before, and a large section of the press and such politicians as Miley Ukov, Kropotkin, Polekhanov, Portesov, and Korolnko strained every nerve to disclose the madness and criminality of such watchwords in Russia, where the enemy occupied vast stretches of territory inhabited by small nations whose right to self-determination would certainly not be granted by victorious German troops. It was a hopeless struggle. No amount of logical argument could overcome the academic socialistic prejudices which held far more powerful sway over the minds of the revolutionary democracy than all the realities of Russia's internal, external, and, in particular, of her military situation. The revolutionary democracy sank ever deeper into the mire of Bolshevist formula which, disguised or undisguised, pervaded the Soviet declarations. The second point of the declaration of the executive committee that explained the reason for the socialists joining the government demanded the democratization of the army, the organization and strengthening of the fighting forces, and of their capacity for defensive and offensive operations in order to avert a possible defeat of Russia and her allies, an eventuality not only fraught with the greatest calamities for all nations but one which would render impossible the conclusion of universal peace based upon the above mentioned principles. Admitting in word that the defeat of Russia and the allies would spell calamity to all mankind. The Soviet politicians with a kind of frenzied fury went on destroying the spirit and body of the army. Democratization and the elective principle, thoughtless or provocative committees and meetings and talk of a speedy peace, loosened organization and discipline in the army, and darkened the soul of the weary Russian soldier. In their first reports to the Soviet, May 26, the socialist ministers stated their method for carrying out the Soviet's principles of home and foreign policy. Zretli announced that, despite the predictions of their antagonists, nothing alarming had occurred in foreign politics, they had been neither obliged to capitulate before the Allies, nor to seek the way of a separate peace. This was said a week after the socialists had entered the government, he described the visit of the socialist ministers to the British ambassador, whom they had asked whether he did not find the time ripe for a revision of the treaties. They had told the ambassador that they acted not only through diplomatic channels, but tried to get into touch with all the democracies of the world, which would, according to Tsretli, follow revolutionary Russia. As Sir George Buchanan made no response, Tsretli was of opinion that their first step in foreign policy might be considered a success. It is hard to refrain from a bitter smile on reading the report of this naive conversation now, when it has become so clearly apparent how these infants in statesmanship, playing at international politics, were only paving the way for the Bolshevist state criminals who were stealthily watching for their turn. At the same meeting of the Soviet, after Tsretli's ingenuous report on his diplomatic achievements, the new Minister of Labor, the Social Democrat M. Skoplev, made a still more naive declaration, I had meant to go to the Zimmerwald conference, he said, and now am I a minister. According to him, before his time the affairs of state were conducted by ignoramuses, and Russia was being ruined. Everything must be altered, all branches of social life interfered with. The position of the laboring masses must first of all be ameliorated, and to this end all the revenues of the banks and commercial enterprises should be taken over. Propertied classes should be taxed up to 100%. If capital desires to hold to the bourgeois system of economics, let it work without interest. Shareholders, bankers, and factory owners would call upon the government, lay down their registers and keys, and say, take over our business and do as you will. But we know, Skoblev answered, when and what to take. We must force these gentlemen to submit to the state and establish for them a labor conscription. It was their duty, that is to say, to remain in their positions at the command of the government. Such was the scheme of the Minister of Labor for saving Russia from ruin. 
In the same breath he defended the workmen accused of a democratization of profiteering, that is of presenting economic demands which destroyed all production. His defense was extremely biased. In reality the workmen's excessive demands had already, in the spring of 1917, undermined Russian industry. The anarchist Blitchman praised the speech of the Minister of Labor, declaring that it was in accordance with Lenin's principles. But both the anarchists and Trotsky thought that the socialists had played long enough at supporting a coalition, and that the Soviet should now be given full power. In that respect they were more logical than the socialist ministers, who did not wish themselves or the Soviet to be wholly responsible, and while inciting the masses to a struggle against the capitalists and landowners, considered that the bourgeoisie must share their responsibility. In order to dispel all doubts as to the adherence of the new socialist ministers to the Zimmer Wild program, the Soviet Department for Foreign Relations, then still directed by Skoblev, send out a note to the nations of the world. It appeared as a sort of response to an article by Hussmans published in the Swedish Social Democraton, in which he compared the Russian socialist ministers with their French and English colleagues. The Russian socialist ministers, this note declared didactically, are delegated to the government for the purpose of obtaining a peace by an agreement between the nations and not of prosecuting an imperialistic war in the name of the liberation of the nations at the point of the bayonet. Russian ministers have no intention whatsoever of supporting the party truce which had been created by the military menace. The basis of the socialists' participation in the government lay not in the cessation of class war, but, on the contrary, in its further development with the weapons of political power, is Vestia, number 70. This conception of the part to be played in the government by the socialists obviously struck at the very roots of any idea of a coalition based upon an agreement between the socialist and bourgeois parties. It created an inner front upon the very heights of authority. The German army occupied the whole of Poland, the northwestern region and part of the Baltic provinces. The menace of a further German invasion was perfectly obvious to anyone who had eyes to see. At a time when by a three years war and the criminal mistakes of the Tsarist regime the economic life of Russia had been undermined, the new power of the revolutionary democracy which succeeded it saw its prime duty, not in the defense of the state, nor in the building up of a new order of internal freedom, but in the deepening of class war in fulfillment of the sacred will of Karl Marx. Yet, Notwithstanding all this, Skoplev cries with a fine flourish of trumpets, let no one say we shall be a plaything in the Kaiser's hands, no, the Kaiser will be a plaything in ours. Given this puerile misunderstanding of the terrible burden of the war borne by the Russian people, it is not surprising that the socialist ministers, deeming themselves the sole exponents of the people's will, listened angrily and impatiently to the bitter warnings of the military leaders. General Alexov, the commander-in-chief of the Russian army, spoke very plainly at the First Officers' Congress, May 10. Russia is going to ruin, he said. She is tottering on the brink of an abyss. A few more thrusts, and with all her weight she will crash into its very depths. The enemy has occupied the eighth part of our territory. He cannot be bribed by the utopian phrase, peace without annexations or indemnities. He openly desires both annexations and indemnities. He stretches out his greedy porter where no enemy soldier has ever been before, he stretches a hand towards wealthy Volinia, Bodolia, the Kiev region, towards the entire right bank of Anipa. And what of ourselves? Will the Russian army ever permit it? Shall we not hurl this insolent foe out of our country, and then leave diplomacy to conclude a peace with or without annexations? Let us be frank, the fighting spirit of the Russian army is exhausted. But yesterday stern and powerful, it now faces the enemy in a trance of fatal inaction. A longing for peace and quiet has replaced the old traditional loyalty to the country. Base instincts of self-preservation are reawakened. Where is the powerful authority at home for which the whole state is yearning? We are told it will come soon. But we do not see it yet. What has become of our love for the mother country? Where is our patriotism? The sublime word of brotherhood is inscribed upon our banner, but it is not written in our hearts. 
class antagonism is raging in our midst, whole classes who had honorably fulfilled their duty to their country are placed under suspicion. As a result a deep abyss has yawned between soldiers and officers. We each think only of ourselves, of our own interests. Bread is plentiful, yet the Russian army is underfed, while the horses are completely starved. New and brighter days have dawned, but where is the animation, the transport, the enthusiasm of a young nation that has attained to the supreme blessings of humanity? As yet we see it not. Russian officers must unite and think how to pour this enthusiasm into our hearts, for there is no victory without enthusiasm, and without victory there is no salvation, there can be no Russia. We are confronted with the colossal task of restoring discipline, of recasting into a united whole that which constitutes the Russian army, that is the officers and privates, of strongly bridging over and ultimately completely filling up the gulf which divides the private from the officer, of once more molding them into the rock which was the old Russian army. The mass of the army has sincerely, honorably, and rapturously accepted the new regime. The details of the new state organization will be decided by the Constituent Assembly. We must all unite upon the one great platform, Russia is in peril, we, as members of a great army, are bound to save her. Let this standard unite you all and give you the strength to work. Let there be ever present to your mental vision raced in fiery letters the words, Yes, Russia is perishing. This speech with its clear and precise prophecy of the terrible danger menace in Russia was made at the very time when the socialist ministers were promising peace by means of a class war. The Soviet leaders responded to the bitter warnings of the military authorities and honest patriots by a storm of frenzied abuse, which was taken up by the entire socialistic press. Three weeks later, June 4, to the unconcealed joy of the Soviet, General Alexev was obliged to resign the post of commander in chief. By that time, Alexander Kierinsky was already Minister of War and Marine. His was an exceedingly difficult position. As a social revolutionary, his former attitude in regard to the war had been one of great reserve, and before the revolution, he, like Chides, spoke in the Duma not so much of defending the state as of bringing the war to an end. After the revolution Chides stubbornly held to his former views. But Kierinsky was changed. Novel experiences drove him to new, healthier political ideas. He essayed to become the link between the revolutionary democracy, whose favorite he was, and government circles. But he was devoid of clear ideas of statesmanship as well as of a just conception of his own powers. By education, a lawyer, with the psychology of a civilian and the ingrained mental habits of an internationalist socialist, Kierinsky, intoxicated by the success of his speeches and his ever-increasing popularity, did not hesitate to take upon himself not only the government of the Russian state, but also the administration of the enormous Russian army at a time when the country was wearing itself out in a military struggle beyond its strength when all government activity had to be concentrated on the solution of the most complicated military problems. How could Kierinsky achieve this, fettered as he was by the dogmas of revolutionary democracy, which concerned itself chiefly with the democratization of the army, not with its military efficiency? He proved incapable even of defending the army's highest asset its commanders. The resignation of the able, gifted, Experienced General Alexev was one of the many instances of the blunt, ruthless, and cruel persecution of officers emanating from Soviet circles. At times Kierinsky took a bold stand, but the essential point was beyond his comprehension that an army is incapable of existing, much less of fighting, without discipline and compulsory and punitive measures. Like many other revolutionaries, he thought that high-sounding phrases and passionate speeches were sufficient to reawaken the old fighting spirit that had been overstrained by a prolonged war and finally shaken by propaganda. Kierinsky rushed from staff to staff and from camp to camp along the whole front, and made speech after fiery speech to the soldiers, while behind his back, in the heart of the Soviet, his own position was being steadily undermined. The temper of the revolutionary democracy was so much the reverse of warlike that the Minister of War did not at once obtain permission to utter the word offensive, 
while all talk of victory was absolutely forbidden. To take one example out of many. A few days after the reorganization of the government the Social Democrat internationalist Sukhinifa published a threatening article in one of the most influential papers of the left, Novaya Zizn, edited by Maxim Gorky. The watchword of an offensive that has eclipsed all others since the advent of the new government has acquired not its ordinary innocent technical meaning but an odious political significance. The entire trend of the new government's policy gives this watchword a menacing character. Sukhinif uttered the warning that neither agitation nor the call of the bourgeois press would obtain any results until every measure has been taken for the liquidation of the war, and until the war is purged of all signs of national and allied imperialism. Now we know how the Bolsheviks have done the purging and its results are seen. Even Gorky's paper was later forced to oppose those with whom as a matter of fact it marched shoulder to shoulder during the first stage of the revolution. The fruits of this friendship proved bitter to the now Bolshevist socialists, yet they ought to have known their friends, for the Bolsheviks never concealed either their program or their political and social aspirations. Representatives of other socialist groups were well acquainted with the moral worth of Lenin and the Leninists. In the chronicles of Russian refugees and in the history of the Social Democratic Party there are many facts proving their contempt for truth, justice, and honesty their demoralization verging upon moral insanity. But the revolutionary democracy shut its eyes, blindly worshipping a class doctor in which, it believed, obliterated all that was foul and atoned for every crime. Chapter VTHE International Policy of the Soviet Attitude Towards President Wilson Cool Reception of Allied Socialists Friendly Relations with Zimmer Waldists The Robert Grimm Scandal The Stockholm Conference. The revolutionary democracy tried to lead the new Russia along the path indicated by the resolutions passed by the international socialistic minority. This also determined its relations with the Allies and with Germany. As the Soviet politicians persistently asserted that the war must be decided, not by the force of bayonets, but by that of the Labour Internationale, they were not too pleased when the United States joined in the war. In this new belligerent coming to the aid of the Allies and of Russia, they only saw a new obstacle to a democratic peace. When on the 7th June President Wilson issued his note on the objects of the war in which he said that the war must not end in the re-establishment of a status quo ante, that nations must not be subjugated, but that damage done should be made good, the answer to this in the Izvestia, the official organ of the Soviet and of revolutionary democracy, was as follows, President Wilson is mistaken if he thinks that such ideas can enter the hearts of the revolutionary people of Russia. Russian revolutionary democracy knows too well and feels too sure that the road to the passionately longed for universal peace lies only through the united struggle of the toilers all over the world against world imperialism. It cannot be misled by any hazy and high flown phrases. It is obvious what feelings will be aroused by the strange attempt to represent the spirit of brotherhood and peace, which is growing stronger and stronger in international socialism as being the result of German intrigue. That is not the language spoken by the democracy of Russia. Other socialistic papers followed suit. The social revolutionary Dilo Naroda, People's Cause, declared that liberty and right are obtained by the people by means of an internal struggle, by revolution. Gorky's half-Bolshevist Novaya Zizn, New Life, in analyzing the note, says, only a decisive universal rupture of civil peace. Only the most pitiless war on the imperialistic cliques of all countries will save Europe from plunging into savagery. This displeasure at Wilson's imperialism found official expression in the note which on the 13th June, Tiresh Kenko, Minister of Foreign Affairs, delivered to M.A. Thomas. In that note the Russian government proposed to convene a conference of the Allies for the purpose of reconsidering the agreements as to the aims of the war. By this means did the socialistic ministers carry out part of the plan of international policy drawn up by the Soviet. Obviously this plan did not include the maintenance of friendly relations with the socialists of allied countries who had come to greet the Russian people, now freed from the yoke of Tsarism. They had a cool reception from the socialist ministers, and a still cooler one from the Soviet. And how could it be otherwise? 
the new arrivals were representatives of the socialistic majority which, in England and France, had supported the policy of defending their country against the Germans, while the Soviet, as well as Lenin, took the point of view of the Zimmerwald minority, and had no sympathy with chauvinist socialists. When the first delegation of French and English socialists came to Russia in April, the Bolsheviks at once raised a clamor against them. On the 29th April, at a meeting of the Social Democratic Party in Moscow, convened in honor of the Allied Socialists, the Bolsheviks came forward with a declaration of protest in which they pointed out that the Socialist delegates represented the government and not the people. The Bolsheviks reminded them that, since the beginning of the war, part of the socialists had forsaken the idea of class war and were in solidarity with the imperialistic bourgeoisie. The representatives of this political tendency in England and France had taken part in government, had entered bourgeois ministries, and under the banner of war to a finish had carried on a fierce struggle against Zimmerwald socialists. As the delegates were representatives of the right socialistic wing the Bolsheviks would enter into no negotiations with them. We consider it necessary to protest most decidedly against the claims of the delegates to speak in the name of all the socialistic proletariat of their respective countries, and we consider it our duty to explain to Russian workmen that the majority of the French and English proletarians are far from taking a socialist chauvinist point of view. Similar assertions were made by Russian Zimmerwaldists at meetings and in the press. The French and English socialists were forced to publish explanations that they were no pretenders, but fully qualified delegates of their respective parties, in which the majority were for carrying on a defensive policy. The French delegates, M. Mouthy, M. Cushin, E. Lafont, reminded their hearers that among French socialists the rift was not by any means as great as the Bolsheviks represented. In France both the majority and the minority voted for war credits, with the exception of three votes. The English delegates, Messrs. Thorne, O'Grady, and Sanders, declared that the independent Labour Party, to which the Bolsheviks referred, hardly represented 1% of organized labor in England. The very necessity for entering into such explanations shows how the Allied Socialists were received and it was not only the Bolsheviks who were hostile. The executive committee also issued a declaration which again showed the ambiguity of its position, so caustically pointed out in Lenin's pamphlet. The occasion for this declaration was the question asked by Mr. Philip Snowden in Parliament concerning the visit of the British delegates to Russia. The executive committee made haste to reply indirectly condemning the Allied Socialists for their culpable friendliness to their respective governments. Being fully aware that the delegates represent only one fraction of the British Labour movement, the Executive Committee has not, however, been informed of the special relation of the British government to its mission. Then follows an appeal to the socialistic parties and trade unions of these countries, with a formal invitation to take part in the celebrations of Russian liberty through properly elected representatives of the whole labor movement. This hazy declaration is full of half-expressed condemnation and distrust of the allied delegates who do not hold to the strictly class point of view. Even such prominent labor leaders as Messrs. A. Henderson, Albert Thomas, and Van der Velde met with no success among the revolutionary democracy. But when the socialists of the central powers appeared, they were received with open arms, no questions were raised and a confidence was shown them that disregarded not only caution but even common sense. The Austrian Otto Bauer, then a prisoner of war in Russia, took part in meetings of the executive committee, and after spending some days in this center of the revolutionary democracy, left for Austria. An important part in the activities of the Soviet was played by the socialists of enemy states who had come from abroad, and who continued to work for the international minority. Afterwards it was found that this internationalism was quite compatible with German imperialism, working in conjunction with the Kaiser's diplomacy. But their connection with Berlin has not been fully revealed. Both the Bolsheviks and members of the Soviet persistently demanded the abolition of secret diplomacy. They were diligently supported by the agents of the Internationale from abroad. But their own diplomacy.
their own international connections and affairs were carefully veiled in secrecy, and only chance lifted the curtain here and there. The greatest influence on the Soviet was wielded by Ganetsky first and Berg, Karl Radk, and Robert Grimm, especially the latter. The past and present activities of these heroes of Zimmerwald were exposed in the Russian press, both in the Codet, Constitutional Democratic, papers and in those of the National Socialists, especially in Pelekanov's Yedinstvo, Unity. The resulting portraits were far from attractive. Karl Radke, an Austrian Jew and a journalist, had been expelled from three socialistic parties, from the Polish party in Galicia, from the PPS in Russian Poland, and from the German Social Democratic Party. In the Lemberg Socialistic Paper Nepsid, forward, for September 7, 1910, a letter was published from E. Hecker, the editor, announcing that Rad had been dismissed from the editorial staff, not because of any difference of opinion, but because he lounged about Davins, and called for food and drink and did not pay, and because when he was on the staff of the Nepsid he had stolen a comrade's watch. A poor lady teacher backed a bill for him, which he did not meet, and the teacher had to pay it with her last penny. This action is ethically worse than the theft of a watch, says E. Hecker. This resulted in his comrades giving him the nickname of Kradk, which means thief. Hecker's letter was reprinted in 1917 in the region and was not refuted either by Radk or his friends. This petty adventurer came with Lenin from Switzerland via Berlin and Stockholm. Ganetsky first and Berg was an adventurer on a larger scale a collaborator with Parvis the Provocateur, a socialist with a very tarnished reputation. Parvis, Helfand, had grown rich, as he asserted, by corn contracts in Turkey, or, as others declared, through the generosity of the German government. During the war Parvis settled in Copenhagen, where he opened a suspicious socialistic bureau. His friend Ganetsky Furstenberg had been sent out of Denmark for shady smuggling transactions. This same Ganetsky was an old friend of Lenin's, and together with the latter and with Zinovov, at the Congress of Russian Social Democrats in Austria, they whitewashed Milinovsky, the important agent provocateur. Milinovsky had been a Social Democratic member of the Duma, where he was an extremist, acting under double orders those of Lenin on the one hand and of the director of the Tsar's police on the other, the exact documents referring to this fantastic affair have been published. Through Ganetsky Furstenberg the Bolsheviks used to obtain large sums of money from an unknown source abroad. This was discovered after the first attempt at a coup d'etat made by the Bolshevists in July 1917. The activity of Robert Grimm is even more curious as characteristic not merely of Russian socialists but of Zimmerwaldists in general. A Swiss, and the president of the Zimmerwald Conference, he had yet on August 8, 1914, voted for the Swiss Army Estimates, and wrote in the Bernatag Blatt, Our valiant soldiers, who do their duty without a murmur, must feel behind them the unanimous support of an organized people. But it proved that this internationalist, as not infrequently happens, had two standards one for his own country and another for Russia. As soon as the revolution began Grimm hurried off to Russia. Miley Ukov, then Minister of Foreign Affairs, knew that Grimm was not only bringing with him the resolutions of the Zimmerwald and Cantal conferences, but had likewise been commissioned by the German government to prepare the ground for a separate peace. Miley Ukov refused absolutely to let him into the country, in spite of all the persistence shown in the Matu by the Department of Foreign Communications attached to the Soviet. When Miley Ukov had to leave, Tiresh Kenko, the new Minister of Foreign Affairs, allowed Grimm to enter Russia after Skoplev and Zretli had vouched for him. Grimm was solemnly received by the Soviet, and elected member of the Executive Committee, to which the Russian Social Democrat Pelekanov could gain no admittance. Grimm immediately began his propaganda in the barracks, preaching a separate peace with Germany. The Mensheviks who had vouched for him were abashed. Skoplev said they did not think that separate peace was part of the Zimmerwald program. But their position became distinctly delicate when on the 16th June the provisional government published a cipher telegram, dated 5th June, from Hoffman, 
the Swiss Minister of Foreign Affairs, to M. Adut, the Swiss charged Affe in Petrograd. In this telegram Hoffman commissioned M. Adut to inform Grimm by word of mouth that Germany will not make any further advance as long as an agreement with Russia seems possible. After conversing with people of high position I am convinced that Germany is seeking a peace with Russia, honorable to both parties. Then came the possible conditions of peace, defined in very general terms. On being made aware of the existence of this telegram, Zreetli and Skoplev were commissioned by the government to call on Robert Grimm for explanations. The latter declared that he knew nothing of the matter, that he considered the telegram a German attempt to make use of his Petrograd speeches in favor of a universal peace. But when the socialist ministers demanded that the Zimmerwald leader should declare publicly that he considered such procedure on the part of the German government a piece of underhand provocation, and the mediation of the Swiss minister in this matter as flunkyism and an encouragement of provocation, Grimm of course refused to do so saying that such a declaration might be prejudicial to the neutrality of his native country. This internationalist could not afford to quarrel with his country or with Germany. The ministers who had stood surety for him, instead of trying to penetrate further into his pacifist activity, suggested that the president of the Zimmerwald conference should leave Russia, which he did very precipitately. On the day after his departure there was a Congress of Soviets at which the left wing protested against the arbitrary expulsion of such a prominent internationalist as Grimm. The ministers Skoplev, Tsretli, and Gierinsky had to defend and exonerate themselves. As yet the Bolsheviks had no majority in the Soviets, and the motion by which it was found that Zrikli and Skoplev had acted in accordance with the interests of the Russian Revolution and of international socialism was passed by a majority of 640 to 121. Then the Bolshevist minority, together with the internationalists, filled the whole of Petrograd with invitations to meetings of protest against the expulsion of their comrade Grimm. A few days after, the official is Vestia No. 98 stated that the cipher telegram from Hoffman was merely a reply to a cipher telegram from Grimm himself, in which he had described the state of affairs in Russia for the information of the German government. The longing for peace is universal, wrote Grimm. Obstacles to its attainment are raised by France and difficulties made by England. At present negotiations are being carried on with them. One of these days it may be expected that pressure will be put on them. The only thing that might prevent the success of negotiations would be a German advance on the Eastern Front. Let me know about the military aims of the government of which you are aware, as this will guarantee negotiations. Thus part of Robert Grimm's secret diplomacy was unmasked. He turned out to be a German agent, and had succeeded in imposing on the Russian socialist ministers by an impudent lie. But how could they help believing the president of the Zimmerwald conference himself, when that conference was to them what church councils were to Catholics in the Middle Ages? While assuming an attitude of ill-concealed unfriendliness towards the allied socialists, who supported their respective governments in the struggle against Germany, the Soviet considered it its duty to take the initiative in paving the way to peace. This socialist pacifist policy reflected the political outlook of the leaders of the first Soviet. The actual methods of realizing this policy were as yet obscure, but the Soviet leaders knew that the socialist patriots who were represented by the delegates from Italy, France, and England, would not share their point of view. In the Entente countries the socialists had proclaimed a class truce during the war with Germany. The behavior of the German social democracy had proved that the solidarity of the international proletariat could not be depended upon, whereas it was precisely on this solidarity that the Russian revolutionary democracy built up its hopes of a democratic peace. One of the means towards attaining this purpose was the so-called conference. It became the subject of endless talk and passionate arguments. Lengthy proclamations and resolutions were sown broadcast by telegraph and wireless. And although the conference remained a mere project, 
Nevertheless this unborn international infant had its passionate defenders and no less passionate opponents. It is not my purpose to follow the endless and not excessively interesting history of the correspondence and intercourse between the various socialist groups and committees upon the subject of the proposed Stockholm Conference. Especially so as many, and perchance the most interesting negotiations of all, took place in the secret recesses of international socialist diplomacy still jealously concealed from the criticism of public opinion. From whom did the initiative proceed? What was the part played in all this by Austro-German socialists, and what did they seek at the conference? Did not Branting, the able and honorable Swedish socialist, become the plaything of the no less clever but dishonest adventurer Parvus? As yet it is extremely difficult to give a precise answer to questions like these. In any case Sidman's and Adler's visit to Copenhagen in April 1917 served as a stimulus for raising the question of a socialist conference, at which the socialists of all belligerent countries should discuss war aims. Meanwhile Helf and Parvis had made Copenhagen his headquarters, and thence this adroit adventurer managed his miscellaneous enterprises such as the contraband sale of expensive drugs for the Russian army, the supply of cheap German coal for the needs of Danish cooperative societies, revolutionary propaganda in Russia, and perhaps not in Russia alone. The coal transaction common https colon slash slash www.yamaguchi.com slash library slash tikava slash tikavo underscore 5 html being of great advantage to the Danish Socialist Party, tended to strengthen Parvus's position both in Germany and in Denmark. As is generally known, the Danish Socialists were the most energetic in advocating the meeting of the Stockholm Conference the invitation to attend it having been brought to the Petrograd Soviet at the beginning of May 1917 by the Danish socialist Borgjörg. But this representative of socialist diplomacy had the imprudence to bring in his other pocket a copy of Sidman's peace terms, thereby clearly establishing the connection existing between the Stockholm device and the German Social Democrats, who supported the Kaiser's policy. It should be noted that, from the standpoint of organized international socialism, the preparations for the Stockholm Conference had taken an illegal course. The right of calling such a conference belonged exclusively to the Central International Bureau and to its president Van der Velde, whereas Van der Velde, as well as most of the Italian and French socialists, was opposed to a conference with German socialists. A separate Dutch Scandinavian committee was therefore formed at Stockholm, and this committee assumed the initiative. Simultaneously Agram was sending out invitations to yet another socialist assembly the third Zimmerwald conference. The Russian socialists of the center, the then guiding spirits of the Petrograd Soviet, held the view that the victory of the revolution laid an obligation on them to place themselves at the head of a worldwide socialist movement. They believed that history had placed the destinies of mankind in their hands and therefore declining all proposals of the newly arrived socialists, they passed the following resolution, the Executive Committee of the Soviet of Workmen's and Soldiers' Deputies assumes the initiative in the convocation of an international socialist conference. All parties and groups of the proletariat international, who are ready to adopt the platform of the Soviet message to the peoples of the world must be invited to take part in the conference. It should be added that the Allied Socialists, dazzled by the revolutionary successes of their Russian comrades, did not sufficiently endeavor to sober them down nor to bring them back from the abstract realm of revolutionary formula to the unfortunate realities of the war. Such friendly reticence only strengthened the Petrograd Soviet's childish assurance that they indeed formed the vanguard of world socialism. Russia's poverty, the illiteracy of the masses, the absence of organization among labor all this faded away before the intoxicating sonority of revolutionary cant. Upon the question of the Stockholm Conference some of the allied socialists seemed inclined to grant concessions to the Soviet. The British labor leader, A. Henderson, became one of the most passionate defenders of the scheme. But upon his return to England from Russia he was met by strong opposition from the British workmen themselves. 
in common with their French and Belgian brothers they had not the slightest desire to meet the Germans until France and Belgium were evacuated. The British government learnt from a telegram of the Minister for Foreign Affairs, Tiresh Kenko, that Gierinsky's cabinet had adopted a very reserved attitude in respect to the Stockholm Conference and considered this enterprise as a purely party matter its decisions being in no wise binding upon the Russian government. This was confirmed by Albert Thomas in one of his speeches, the resolution to take part in the conference, adopted in May, was provoked by a feeling of admiration for the Russian revolution and the desire to lend it active support. At present it is an open secret that Gierinsky no longer exhibits the same interest in the conference. HTTPS colon slash slash www.yamaguchi.com slash library slash tikava slash tikava underscore 05.html Having weighed all the alternatives in the balance, the governments of France and England refused passports to members of the Stockholm Conference, thereby virtually sealing its fate. The organizers of the conference desired that it should constitute a powerful peace congress dictating its will to the governments, but not a conspirative socialist meeting. The former plan proved to be impossible of realization. The Russian socialist center groups proved incapable of altering the course of international relations. It should be noted that the Bolsheviks were opposed to Stockholm. They did not wish to sit with the socialist patriots who according to Bolshevist opinion had falsified the international for the gratification of their governments behind the socialists' backs. Perhaps the Bolsheviks were also opposed to the conference, because at the time they did not consider themselves strong enough to speak at a responsible international congress. Or perhaps they hoped that Grimm might succeed in calling a third Zimmerwald conference, the principles of which would be sympathetic not only to the Bolsheviks but also to socialists of the center. The socialist ministers gradually became more familiar with the machinery of government. They gained a clearer sense of the realities and practical imitations of Russian life, and began to make earnest endeavors to frame a more sober policy. But the principles of the Zimmerwald conference obsessed them like an evil spirit, distorting their good intentions, and drove them sometimes against their will, along a path which led to the ruin and destruction of Russia. And in the van, a noisy and brazen mob, ran the Bolsheviks, seducing the soldiers, laborers, and peasantry with lying promises and poisonous party cries. The revolutionary democracy resisted, though weakly, and still tried to fight against the madness of these party cries. But it could not help itself because many of these cries were symbols of their common faith, because its own banners, as well as those of the Bolsheviks, bore the same device class warfare and the dictatorship of one class over the whole nation. Professing such principles, the revolutionary democracy was unable either to defend its native country or to reorganize the state on the basis of the new liberty attained or even to hold the power it had for any length of time. Perhaps one of the explanations and even extenuations of the weakness of the socialistic center may lie in the fact that it was more scrupulous and humane than the extreme left wing. While calling on the masses to wage class warfare, the center, at the same time, did not desire any coercion and stopped halfway. It intoxicated and weakened the soldiers by talking about a democratic peace but bashfully withdrew from the idea of a separate peace, justly seeing in it treachery and destruction. But the Bolsheviks feared nothing, lied always and to all, and were not squeamish as to their tools and means. Although the whole Soviet welcomed the suspicious gang of Radk, Furstenberg, Grimm, etc., as comrades, the latter were more akin to the Bolsheviks. Leo Duch, the old Russian Marxist and revolutionary, was right when he wrote in the Yedinstvo, why have people of a criminal type clustered round Lenin, especially from 1903, when the split in the Russian Social Democratic Party was brought about by him, until the present time. The spirit of the agent provocateur naturally clung to Lenin as the inevitable consequence of his tactics, expressed in the maxim many means are good enough. It is known to the chronique scandaleux of our party that Lenin and his assistants, Kamenya Frozenfeldt and Zinov Afraid Omislav, have committed acts which are clearly criminal. 
these and other accusations of the corruption of the Bolsheviks were almost daily to be met with in the pages of Russian papers, just as in every list of the Tsarist Okranics, secret police, half the names were those of Bolsheviks. And among them were seen such prominent members as the deputy Malinovsky, Jinamazov, the editor of the Pravda, Truth, Shinra, who subsequently went to conclude peace with the Germans, and many others besides. Chapter V The First Congress of Soviets and Kierensky's advanced faculties of the socialist center theory and practice the allurements of Bolshevism. The Congress of Soviets as a review of the forces of revolutionary democracy. The leniency displayed by the Soviet center to the Bolsheviks is to be explained by a great variety of reasons, but principally by the ties that united all socialistic groups, woven of the imposing theories they shared in common and also by the common memory of secret work and conspiracy together, of punishment and exile. But there was also a certain amount of involuntary subjugation of the moderates by the Bolsheviks, for the latter were candid and unblushing demagogues, and were well skilled in the art of swaying crowds. Bolshevist agitators and propagandists could make a far more telling appeal to the masses than could the socialist center. The former enunciated the most extreme views that could be deduced from the general doctrines of socialism, and preached them without let or hindrance in what was now the freest country in the world. The basis of the Marxist point of view is class warfare. According to this view it is an immutable law of society that secret and indirect conflict is all in favor of privilege, and must give place to open and direct attack. Then the bourgeoisie will be overthrown and the dictatorship of the proletariat, that first stage of victory, will be established. As proletarians have no fatherland, the interests of this latter entity have to make way for those of the laboring classes. Hence the war cry, proletarians of the whole world, unite. The view in short is that proclaimed in 1848 by Marx in his communistic manifesto. The Russian socialists of the center, both social democrats and social, revolutionaries, whose program contained all the principal points of the Marxian manifesto, were greatly embarrassed when they suddenly found themselves masters of the situation, leaders of the democracy of their dreams. All their theories must now be put into practice, but how? By overthrowing the bourgeoisie. But the bourgeoisie itself rejoiced at the revolution and the dawn of political liberty, and no logical grounds for conflict existed. And even if the bourgeoisie were hostile they were helpless, since under the old regime they had been unable to organize openly and were unwilling to do so in secret. When the revolution broke out it was found that there was no strong bourgeois party in Russia at all. There was only the cadet party which did not defend the interests of any one particular class. It displeased the landowners by advocating the obligatory expropriation of land and its transference to the actual tillers of the soil, it repelled the manufacturers by endorsing the minimum labor program of the social democrats, down to the eight hours day inclusive. From the socialists themselves, however, it diverged even more radically. It strove for a government superior to class distinctions, for the preservation of the principle of property in national economics, and for continuing the war to a finish. This was enough to raise a sharply defined barrier between the cadets and the socialist politicians, who were suspiciously on the lookout for counter-revolution around them. But still to the moderate center a rupture with the bourgeoisie was a thing to be avoided. From time to time warnings were heard in Soviet circles, which were still dominated by socialists of the center, not to yield to the extreme Bolshevist demands for a social revolution but to be content as yet with a political revolution. But the glittering theories of their Marxian program dominated them against their will, even if they could not act on them. Social revolutionaries preached the immediate expropriation of land, the same demand was made in the Marxian communistic manifesto, and social democratic ministers like Skoblev made speeches which increased the unrest among labor. The wildest demands of the workmen, who had themselves raised their wages to an amount which no industry could stand, were instantly acceded to. The socialist members of town corporations and zemstvos were ruining public institutions in their eagerness to please the workmen. 
As a specimen of such demands I need only mention that in Petrograd the scullery maids in the municipal hospitals, who had hitherto received board and lodging in 15 rubles a month wages, now began to get 175 rubles, while a boarding school mistress got 120 rubles and had to keep herself. Cole Hevers received up to 80 rubles a day. When a social democratic member of the Petrograd City Council, from the Pelekanov group, proposed to replace them by soldiers, as the municipal treasury could not stand such expenditure, the socialist majority on the city council voted against his proposal and only passed a motion to the effect that the executive committee of the Soviet should be informed that the demands of the workmen were ruinous to the town. In the beginning of May the manufacturers came to Prince Lvov with a declaration regarding the condition of the industries, which were being ruined by the laziness of the workmen, by the absence of all discipline in factories, by the mad increase in wages and by the fact that engineers, directors, and all the educated managing staff in general were in constant fear of coercion on the part of the operatives. The elective principle had been introduced in the works, and frequently some clever adventurer, quite unfitted for the task, was placed at the head of affairs. The declaration of the manufacturers produced no impression. The government could do nothing, having no organized force at its back and the left parties, including the Bolsheviks, openly declared that this was as it should be, that the workmen ought to expel the owners and engineers, and take everything into their own hands. The Soviet and the socialists connected with it did not know what to do, first urging the workmen on, then calling on them to keep themselves in hand. At the very beginning of the revolution, on the 20th March, the Izvestia said that if any owner of an undertaking, who was dissatisfied with the demands made by the workmen, refused to carry on the business, then the workmen must resolutely insist on the management of the work being given over into their hands, under the supervision of a commissary of the Soviet, see number 8. This was the control which was afterwards so fully utilized by the Bolsheviks. A little later, frightened at the anarchy which had broken out at the works, the Izvestia began to speak of the thoughtlessness of such reconstruction of disorganization, of everything having its limits, and of the impossibility of satisfying old demands, see number 81. But if there was any criticism, or anyone pointed out that both the soldiers and workmen were losing their heads, that discipline was as necessary in the industrial army as in the military, then the Soviet orators grew angry. Tsretli, with his usual impetuosity, speaking at the meeting of the Soviets held on the 11th April, said, they say that the workmen are not standing at their lathes and are not working. All the democratic authorities declare this to be a foul slander and the first Congress of Soviets must conform this. The Congress of course declared it to be a libel, but the workmen did not work any the better for that. When they entered the government the socialists found themselves in a still more difficult position. The principles of the program did not work out in practice. Skoplev, the Minister of Labor, at first promised to put all capitalists under a hydraulic press. Later, however, he issued a circular address to the workmen, in which he said, The seizure of factories makes workmen without any experience in management and without working capital temporarily masters of such undertakings, but soon leads to their being closed down or to the subjugation of the workmen to a still harder taskmaster, is Vestia, number 103. These are not the words simply of a minister but of a socialist minister. But whom were the workmen to obey, if at the same time the Bolshevist members of the same United Social Democratic Party to which Skoplev belonged were urging them to make haste and seize everything before the bourgeoisie had time to organize a counter-revolution? Why should they not disarm the bourgeoisie by means of such seizures, if the Soviet itself were constantly dinning it into their ears that the chief foes were the property-owning classes, if even ministers loudly proclaimed that they had entered the cabinet for the purpose of exacerbating class warfare? Such contradictions were constantly to be met with, and were clearly seen at the Congress of Soviets held in Petrograd, 16th June to 6th July. The Congress was composed of 1,090 delegates. 
Of these 285 were social revolutionaries, 248 Mensheviks, 105 Bolsheviks, and 32 internationalists. The other socialistic groups had very few representatives. The populist socialists numbered only 11. At this congress the new democracy reviewed its forces and ideals. As yet the Soviets had neither legislative nor executive powers, but their influence on state affairs was already predominant. The motions passed at these worry sittings were no mere verbal exercises, but practically affected the life of Russia. And yet the speeches still reflected the same old hazy dogmatism of the irresponsible party congresses, though some orators, especially the socialist ministers, were already making desperate efforts to find a more practical way. They struggled with the extreme wing. They tried to find a position where their socialistic ideology would not be at variance with the interests of the Russian state. The boldest opponent of the Bolsheviks was Kerensky, then Minister of War. A regular duel took place between him and Lenin. At that time Kerensky was preparing for the summer advance against the Germans, that last desperate attempt of revolutionary democracy to solve the insoluble problem to make the soldiers fight after having freed them from all bonds of discipline. Kerensky had already visited the front. Clothed now with authority he had got a near view of what went on in the barracks, at the rear and at the front. He said, turning to the Bolsheviks, the policy of fraternization coincides with that of the German general staff, which hides itself behind Zimmerwald watchwords. We must show more caution towards Zimmerwald lest we play into the hands of Germany. https colon slash slash www.yamaguchi.com slash library slash tikava slash tikava underscore 06. html Zreedly exerted all his southern eloquence in support of his fellow minister. He even ventured to defend the right of the Russian army to advance. He put the question to the Congress as to whether it were necessary to advance, and from various benches came the answer. It is. Only the Bolsheviks laughed in reply. Perhaps it was because even then they knew better than their less extreme associates to what a state the army had been reduced by the incoherent and criminal propaganda of socialist agitators. Lenin determinedly opposed the advance which would only prolong the war. Another Bolshevik, Ryazanov, demanded that no punitive measures should be taken against deserters, as that would be interference with the liberty of citizens and a member of the same party, Ensign Krylenko, a half-insane young man later raised by the Bolsheviks to the high rank of commander-in-chief, reproached Kerensky in his report on the army with doing nothing for its democratization. He said that the soldiers were murmuring, the combing out of generals has been done from below, while now we are being ordered from above to obey unconditionally. The Congress listened to these Bolshevist speeches. It did not approve, neither did it protest against their mad criminality in fomenting mischief in the whole army. The degree of political intelligence at the Congress was quite indefinite. First, it riotously applauded Pelekhanov's passionate appeals to fight the Germans, and then immediately passed the following motion on the war, the termination of the war by the defeat of one group of belligerents would be the source of new wars, making the breach between nations still wider. The idea of a separate peace was rejected by the Congress, for the reason that it would increase the tendency of the dominant classes towards annexation, would not free Russia from the grip of world imperialism, and would make the international union of the laboring classes more difficult. In short, there was a complete confusion of ideas. No attempt was to be made to gain a victory over Germany, but neither was a separate peace to be concluded. This formula, enunciated by the Soviet state in July 1917, was very similar to Trotsky's later famous neither peace nor war. In the motion passed by the Congress of Soviets on the war, there was not one word to encourage the army to military activity. All hopes were centered on the earthly establishment of revolutionary internationalism, on an appeal to democracies to join in the cry of peace without annexation and indemnities. The war can only be ended by the united efforts of the democracies of all countries. This is not a unity in warfare, but solidarity of labor. Lenin put the matter more simply. 
he demanded that an ultimatum should be sent to the Allies, did they or did they not agree to reconsider the aims of the war in accordance with the program of the Petrograd Soviet? The minister Zretli and his colleagues likewise tried to get the Allied governments to agree to such a revision, but they did not see the possibility of presenting such an ultimatum, and wished to carry on negotiations with the Allied democracies. In this, as in many other questions, they differed from the Bolsheviks not as regards objects but in tactics. The Congress was more occupied with disputes about the war and about government than with social problems. Nevertheless, an agrarian resolution was passed, the first clause being, the land with its mineral wealth, water and timber rights, must be withdrawn from the market. The sovereign right to dispose of land must belong to the whole people, who must administer it through the democratic institutions of self-government. Thus the Congress acknowledged the principle of the nationalization of land and a complete rupture of all existing agrarian relations. They took no account whatever of the impossibility of carrying out such a reform at a time when disorganization of food supplies and national economy was so complete that the description given by the food minister, Beshek Honov, and the minister of labor, Skoblev, gave a sobering shock to their listeners. But the Bolsheviks, in Lenin's person, at once turned this impression to advantage by suggesting a simple way out of all difficulties. Let them take the power into their own hands by arresting the capitalists and all would be well. The Congress could neither agree to this nor find any other issue. The majority of the members of the Congress professed economic materialism, but even the stern voice of economic reality could not bring them to their senses, and make them cast away revolutionary romanticism. For they could not be guided by the practical necessities of storm-tossed Russia, when, According to their exponent Lieber, the Russian Revolution had to settle social questions involving the interests of every worker in the world. These beginners in statecraft were far more concerned about the Stockholm Conference, and the creation of a coalition of the laboring democracies of the world, than about the defense and organization of Russia. Now Russian affairs were very much on the decline. During the first three months after the revolution both the military and the economic situation had grown still worse than under the Tsar. The people, freed from the stifling prison of Tsarism, were drunk with unwanted liberty as with wine. They understood liberty as the possibility of throwing aside all forms of obligation, all discipline, and with it all ideas of duty. This is a painful process, an inevitable fermentation accompanying every revolution. In Russia it was intensified by war weariness, the ignorance of the masses, and the dogmatic narrowness and blindness of those who had undertaken to lead them. Little by little, not hearing any words of real denunciation and stern rebuke, not meeting with any serious rebuff either from the government or the Soviet, the masses became unbridled in their actions, they grew accustomed only to demand and to give nothing in return. They had not yet attained either to an idea of a state or of any real feeling of responsibility and duty, and, nevertheless, at all the meetings it was dinned into them, all is now yours, take it and reign. Political liberty, which to the educated classes and to the more thoughtful representatives of the people was in itself something of absolute value, did not bring any real change into the life of millions of poorer Russian citizens of either sex. What is the good of liberty when one has, as heretofore, to sit in the trenches, work at the factory, perform dreary, toilsome labor, and to plow the land often another man's? And inevitably a wave of economic social demands arose. These were the same demands which all the socialistic programs promised to satisfy and therefore the majority of the leaders not only lacked the courage to raise obstacles to the unrealizable desires of the masses, but frequently prompted and incited them. In questions of state authority, the Soviets, holding the class and not the democratic point of view, could likewise do nothing to instill ideas of discipline and order. Already in April 1917 all kinds of independent republics began to be formed all over Russia some country town, led by an enterprising Soviet, and sometimes by a lunatic or a black gangsterist, would declare itself independent. At first such news merely raised a laugh. 
At the beginning of the revolution everyone was in a good humor, and was prepared to regard the wildest escapades as innocent child's play. But already in June it became clear that this was no chance game of local politicians, but a sign of an insidious disease of the state. Zaritsyn, Kasson, Kasnov, Kostroma, Ekaterinburg, Irkutsk, Helsingfors, Kronstadt all declared themselves autonomous. Nevertheless, they still demanded money from the provisional government. And the government gave it, partly from weakness, partly on the old theory of non resistance. Thus the resources of the Russian state treasury endowed all these independent new republics. At the same time numerous races inhabiting Russia attempted to apply the principle of self-determination to their own case. The old autocratic regime was dead. The new had not yet been born. What it would be like, what it ought to be, no one as yet knew. Some said that Russia must be a federal republic. Others considered that wide powers of local government in an undivided state would be sufficient. The Soviet took the first point of view, and accordingly supported the claims of the different nationalities. Lenin went still further and maintained that Finland, Poland, Estonia, Courland, the Ukraine, and Transcaucasia were all annexed provinces which had the right to secede from Russia. Finland wanted complete secession from Russia, thereby creating a military menace to the whole north of Russia and the Baltic fleet. In the south, a group of the intelligentsia, supported from Vienna, had begun agitating in favor of the foundation first of an autonomous and then of an independent Ukraine. This gave the first impulse to that ruinous civil war between the south and the north of Russia, owing to which so much blood has been and is still being spilt. But at that time, in July 1917, few people clearly understood all the destructiveness of these local separatist demands. On the other hand everyone saw the military danger of the situation in Finland at the two naval ports of Helsingfors and Kronstadt, where almost the whole of the Baltic fleet was concentrated. Into these places, almost from the very first days of the revolution, German agents had wormed their way and a successful Bolshevist propaganda had been carried on with the inevitable accompaniment of a systematic massacre of officers. Notwithstanding the enormous strategic importance of these ports, Prince Lvov's cabinet did not even attempt to struggle with the secessionists or to save these naval bases from criminal agitators, both German and Russian. When, on the 1st July, Kronstadt declared itself an independent republic, and made Rochelle a student twenty years of age, president, the government supinely carried on negotiations with this boy, and let him indicate whom they were to appoint as government commissary. But when the naval officers, who had been arrested during the first few days of the revolution, were imprisoned in the Kronstadt torture house, even the Soviet found it necessary to interfere and to issue an appeal containing the following words. It depends on the inhabitants of Kronstadt whether the black spot on the revolutionary horizon will disappear forever, or grow larger and larger, until it obscures the rising sun of liberty. Fortunately, besides this appeal, they also sent delegates, who succeeded in having the officers brought to trial. The trial disclosed revolting particulars of mob law and insults inflicted in most cases on totally innocent men. The majority of the persons arrested were set free. But the fleet was rapidly rotting in the same way as the army. As early as the end of May, Kurpiknikov, the famous private of the Volinsky regiment, who could hardly be accused of being counter revolutionary since in March he was the first to lead the soldiers against the old government, wrote an open letter to Prince Lvov, in which he called upon the government to fight against anarchy, saying, the fraternization with Germans at the front and criminal leniency in the rear are crimes of equal magnitude against our country. The revolutionary army cannot remain inactive before the enemy, or the revolutionary government before sedition. This was one of many appeals made from all sides. The officers, insulted, constantly subjected to degradation, given over to the control of the soldiery by order number one, lived in an atmosphere of suspicion and insults. But nevertheless they tried to organize, although the Soviets and then the committees looked very much askance at officers' organizations. 
In consequence of perpetual threats that grew up among the officers a tendency to display subserviency to their new masters, the soldiers. The position of honest patriots in the army became more and more difficult. Later, at the Moscow Congress, General Alexov defined the position of the officers in the following bitter words, the best officers are perishing, the worst are becoming thorough scoundrels. In the summer of 1917 preparations were already being made for the coming wholesale massacre of officers. They were systematically discredited in the eyes of the masses, counter-revolutionaries were most diligently sought for among their number, although it was well known that the regular officers, who had more of the spirit of caste, had been killed off during the first years of the war, and that by the time the revolution broke out the army was wised by men of all classes sons of the clergy petty employees, peasants daughters has already been mentioned, the very first officers congress, at which Alexov made his prophetic speech, drew down upon itself the acute displeasure of the Soviet. But still the officers league was organized. In June another officers congress was held in Petrograd, with an attendance of 500. Now there was already a certain rift in their ranks part of the officers going with the Soviet, more anxious to impregnate the army with the political opinions of revolutionary democracy than to make it efficient. The other party demanded that the provisional government should be fully supported and trusted, since with divided authority there could be no powerful army. After a hot discussion, a motion was passed demanding the enactment of a law punishing the non-fulfillment of military orders at the front. The following clause in the motion is of special importance, the work of the army committees shall be restricted, within clearly defined limits, to economic, social, cultural, and educational questions, and a decided struggle should be carried on against the tendency to put into practice the election of commanders, and the corporate direction of military operations. The question as to how far the principle of election might be carried out in the army and the limits of the jurisdiction of the committees, was one of the sorest points of the revolutionary period. Subsequently, the first serious conflict between General Kornilov, Commander-in-Chief, and the Premier, Kierensky, arose on this very subject. Already by the middle of the summer of 1917 we see the melancholy results of the committee muddling, which converted the army from a disciplined body, united by the will of the commanders, into a mob of meeting attending and, alas, thieving tattlers. The most tragic news came from all parts of the army. During the first half of June there was a regular mutiny in Shkabachev's army. Four regiments were cashiered for refusing to obey military orders. The cavalry surrounded and disarmed them. But the ringleaders were not shot. The government merely published an appeal and Kierensky spoke of the shamefulness of fraternizing with the German soldiers and selling them Russian bread. This was at the very time when Kierensky, as war minister, went to the front, trying to arouse the spirit of the Russian soldiers by his eloquence. In one of his speeches the socialist minister announced to the regiments gathered round him that, as they had managed to fight so courageously under the yoke of Tsardom, they had even more cause to perform miracles of bravery now when fighting for liberty and land. One of the soldiers asked with a grin, and if I am killed, what land shall I get then? In these simple words we see the psychology of millions of peasants in soldiers' tunics. One after another they left the front, deserting to hurry home, for fear that the land would be reallotted without them, and that they would get nothing. Kierensky was a great success at the front especially among the young soldiers of revolutionary but not Bolshevist tendencies. But his desire was chiefly for popularity among the soldiers, he did not seem to understand the importance of the officers, and during his stay at the front did nothing whatever either to support their authority or improve the discipline of the army. And, indeed, what conception of discipline could be left in the mind of a soldier who for three years had served as a private in the Tsar's army? with its severities and brutal subordination, when the Minister of War himself appeared before him, and in answer to his address of General, he was answered by Kierensky, I am not a general, but a comrade. At this time the Okopnea Pravda, Trench Truth, and other Bolshevist and non-Bolshevist papers were carrying on an anti-war propaganda, 
undermining all confidence in the commanders and the whole government. The Bolsheviks knew that the front was preparing for an advance, and tried to prevent it by making an advance in the rear on the government. The other socialists became agitated. Soviet orators went the round of the factories and works, proving that the Bolsheviks wanted to stab the revolution in the back. And the Bolsheviks kept declaring that the Congress of Soviets where their motion had been rejected was composed of imperialists and landed gentry, and that the whole coalition government had sold itself to the bourgeoisie. The offended comrades of the Bolsheviks openly called them traitors and betrayers of the revolution, Workman's Gazette a Menshevist organ. Nevertheless, the Soviet appointed a demonstration for the 1st July, to show democratic solidarity and to intimidate counter-revolutionists, who were more and more feared in Soviet circles. On the day fixed for this demonstration, Petrograd discovered that our army had made an advance near Brzezny, captured part of the German trenches, and taken 10,000 prisoners. It would seem that the whole capital ought to have celebrated this first victory of the Revolutionary Army. Https colon slash slash www.yamaguchi.com slash library slash tikava slash tikavo underscore 06. Html but only the intelligentsia, officers, women, and disabled soldiers took part in the demonstration hastily got up by the cadets and Pelekanov. The soldiers sneered. In Peterhof the famous machine gunners thrashed the military cadets who took part in the demonstration. The workmen in the town took no part whatever in the manifestations. Kierinsky had already lost his popularity among the social revolutionaries. At the Congress of this party, he was not elected to the Central Committee. But the Executive Committee of the Soviets still supported him as well as its other representatives in the government. The furious pacifist propaganda, which for three months had been so madly carried on by extreme socialists, now bore fruit, although the same Congress, which had passed the motion on the danger of the defeat of any of the belligerents, was obliged, in answer to Kierinsky's triumphant telegram, to send a fraternal greeting to the democratic organization of soldiers and officers tempered in the fire of the revolution who are shedding their blood on the field of battle. But the Soviet added a rider to the effect that it is not our fault that the war is still going on. They emphasized their opinion that the result of the successful advance did not lie in the victory over the Germans, but in the fact that your organized strength, as proved by this advance, gives weight to the voice of revolutionary Russia in speaking to the belligerent, neutral and allied countries, and will help to end the war. Thus. Even when military operations were resumed, the Soviet placed both the Allies and the Central Powers on the same footing, not once using the word enemy. But it was perhaps for the first time that the word motherland had been used in an official document. No one in these days dare evade doing his duty to his motherland. Hitherto they had only spoken of duty to the revolution. Possibly this divergence from international phraseology may have been due to the influence of the more moderate, sober, and patriotic Soviet of peasants delegates, whose signatures stand at the bottom of the manifesto. This document, printed on the 3rd July, is a typical example of the ambiguous position of the Soviet in fundamental problems of state. When the particulars of the advance began to arrive, the joy of the patriots was rapidly damped. It turned out that the principal part had been played by the officers. It was they who advanced, often alone, without their soldiers. Whole units did not wish to obey orders, and held sittings and meetings, disputing and discussing whether to advance or not. The same soldiers who in the Tsar's time advanced without a murmur, and though almost unarmed, and without the support of artillery performed the most difficult operations now, with unheard of quantities of munitions, under undreamt of conditions of liberty, proved they had lost the spirit of an army. Such was the ruin wrought in the army by revolutionary seasoning and democratic organization, which, however, 
should be more justly termed anarchistic disorganization. https colon slash slash www.yamaguchi.com slash library slash tikava slash tikavo underscore oh six dot html and day by day its fruits became more evident. Chapter by ear and front broken through high independent Ukraine and the ministerial crisis the July Bolshevist insurrection German advance front broken through disputes about capital punishment state of the army the save the revolution the committees or powerful government in july a series of very important events took place which gave a clear idea of the extent of russia's dissolution dot the whole period from the entry of the socialists into the cabinet early in may until the november bolshevist revolution is full of the tragically futile attempts of the Soviet center to effect a transition from the Zimmerwald position to that of state responsibility. Although the revolutionary democracy with all the sincerity of despair tried to rally round Irinsky's government, and gave all its strength, all its best men, this transition proved impossible. There was no opposition from the right. In spite of all the acuteness of the difference of opinions, both the Constitutional Democrats and the Employers' Party in Moscow sent their members to the cabinet, although after every crisis it became more and more difficult to find a common language, since the socialists were obstinately pursuing the path of class government as opposed to national. The left wing, that is the majority of the Social Democrats and part of the Social Revolutionaries, carried on an incessant agitation, both secret and open, striving to obtain the immediate introduction of the dictatorship of the proletariat. The doctrinal exponent of this group was Lenin, while the practical executor was Trotsky. In reality, Jinov, the social revolutionary, was also working in that direction. The socialist center could not withstand the pressure put upon it. Trusting neither the bourgeoisie nor the radicals, the center gradually went over to the left lost its footing and fell, dragging after it the whole of the Russian population, in whose name the first and second Soviets had acted. Bound to the Bolsheviks by their primary ideas and program, the socialists of the center, even after the July insurrection, could not break away from their comrades in ideas. Meanwhile, in July, both the Bolsheviks and the Germans almost simultaneously managed to break through the rear and front respectively. Considering the vastness of Russia, the complicated network of military operations, the national, economic, party, and class conflicts, the general chaos entailed by every revolution, it is no easy matter to reconstruct the real history of the Russian Revolution, or even of separate episodes. It is still more difficult to fix exactly where the casual and elemental end, and forethought, intention, and planning begin. But there are certain coincidences, at whose meaning we may guess. On the night of the 16th July, a Bolshevist insurrection broke out in Petrograd. It coincided with certain other events which shook the stability of the Russian state, with the declaration of the independence of the Ukraine, the government crisis and the German advance. The dismemberment of Russia, aflame with revolution, began all over her vast area. On August 1, 1914, Russia occupied one-sixth of the whole surface of the earth. First separate towns and boroughs, then whole provinces, would declare their independence. And the weaker the revolutionary government grew, the more strongly was the separatist tendency of the component parts felt. This is partly explained by the lawful feeling of self-preservation, by the desire to shield oneself from infection, anarchy, and political dissolution. But it was likewise to a great extent due to political adventure and personal ambition. The history of the Ukraine secession bears obvious traces of both one and the other of the aforesaid causes. Strictly speaking, the Ukraine, as a definite political or even ethnological whole, never existed. In bygone days Kiev was the capital of ancient Russia. The inhabitants of a part of southern Russia, that is the provinces of Poltava, Chernigov, Kiev, Volynia, and Podolia, speak the South Russian language or dialect. Philologists are still disputing as to whether this may be called a language. Apparently it would be more correct to consider that there are three dialects of the common Russian language, namely, the Great Russian, 
White Russian, and Little Russian. The last is likewise spoken by the Ruthenians in Galicia. For several centuries the South Russian provinces lived the same life as the rest of the Russian Empire, and together with the rest of the population established both the Russian state and Russian culture. But in addition Little Russia had her own culture, her own folklore, her own customs, her own songs, and even her own literature the latter very poor as compared with that of Russia as a whole. There were some far from numerous circles among the educated classes who made it their aim to arouse the national Ukraine spirit. They were unsuccessful. The Tsar's government, with its usual despotic narrowness and blind centralization, fought against these as yet purely cultural aspirations of the Ukraine patriots by means of brutal repression. It was even forbidden to print books in the little Russian dialect and the works of their poet Shevchenko could for a long time circulate only in manuscript. When at last books and newspapers were allowed to be printed, the common people simply failed to understand them, since for the expression of the more complex, more abstract ideas, the Ukrainists employed the so-called Lvov or Lemberg language which is entirely unfamiliar to the peasantry of southern Russia. The use of the Lvov literary language by the Ukrainians of southern Russia today has a more than philological significance. Those Ukrainians who under the Tsar's regime found it impossible to work in Russia, took refuge among the kindred population of eastern Galicia, where, under the protection of the Austrian government, who sought in them a counterpoise to Polish influence and a lever for weakening Russia, they established in Lemberg a Ukrainian national and literary center. The movement was fostered not only from Vienna, but from Berlin. The idea of enfeebling Russia by creating an independent Ukraine was a favorite theme of aggressive Austrian and German politicians before the war, and during the war a so-called League for the Liberation of the Ukraine was one of the chief instruments of the propaganda of the Central Powers in Eastern Europe. The Russian government watched this movement with the greatest suspicion, and shortly after the war began, closed down in Russia the Ukrainian press, the long-standing restrictions on which had been relaxed after 1905. The revolution restored to the Ukrainians liberty of action and Kiev became the center of a new national movement in which both hitherto quiescent Russian Ukrainians and Ukrainians from Galicia took a very active part. It should be added that the ardor of the Galician Ukrainians was stimulated by the political oppression they had suffered after the Russian occupation of Galicia. In May Congress assembled in Kiev loosely representing several parties, chiefly socialists, which had adopted the Ukrainian national program and also a number of Ukrainian educational and cooperative organizations in the south of Russia. This congress was very demonstrative in its assertion of Ukrainian autonomy or home rule, but it was not separatist indeed the separatists were at this stage in a very small minority. The chief work of the congress was to elect a sort of permanent parliament or rada, which is the Ukrainian for Soviet or council. At first this Rada had no place in the Russian administrative system. It was a purely private institution. The representative of the provisional government in Kiev, as in other parts of Russia, was a commissary, in place of the former governor-general, who took counsel with the local committee representing all parties and all sections of the population. But the Ukrainian Rada was a very active organizing center and made every effort to enforce its views both on the local commissary and the military authorities, and on the central government. It engaged in agitation among the peasantry and among the troops, and played, in fact, in Kiev the part that in Petrograd was played by the extreme socialists. Its nationalist propaganda was reinforced by demagogic socialist appeals. The primary aim of the Ukrainians was to create a force which would help them to attain their national objects. They urged the government to form Ukrainian regiments out of the southern Russian soldiers in the army. The government, on the advice of the military authorities, refused. Thereupon the Ukrainians formed in Kiev two regiments of their own, consisting chiefly of deserters and seized the necessary arms and ammunition from the military stores. This act of violence led to disorders, ending in concessions and compromise. The Rada had strengthened its position by sheer daring, by the exercise of unlimited bluff. 
as in Petrograd, so in Kiev the provisional government was unwilling to use force to check the process of disintegration, and the Ukrainian leaders, Professor Grushevsky, the literary leader of the movement in Lemberg, the Russian-Ukrainian novelist Vinichinko, the insurance agent Petlura, and other lesser lights were emboldened by their unexpected success. Early in July they formed a scheme for the autonomous administration of the indefinite area called the Ukraine, and flourished it threateningly in the face of the provisional government. The government, instead of giving an immediate reply, decided to delegate two of its members, Zritli and Tereshkenko, to Kiev to investigate the situation and report, but not to take any decision. It so happened that Kierinsky and Nekrasov were in Kiev at the time, and they took part unofficially in the negotiations with the leaders of the Rada. Somehow the Ukrainians succeeded in so impressing the young Russian ministers with the seriousness of the situation that these latter consented to a ready-made scheme for the establishment of a Ukrainian general secretariat or autonomous government for the administration of the Ukraine. The only important alteration in the scheme put forward by the Rada was the limitation of the territory in question from nine provinces to five. The Russian ministers exceeded their powers by signing an agreement, wired that they had done so, and on July 14 returned to Petrograd to report. The cadet members of the government raised strong objections to the whole proceeding. On the strength of independent reports they denied that the situation in the Ukraine was so serious as to necessitate such a far-reaching concession. Further they insisted that Zritli and Tereshkenke had exceeded their instructions in signing an agreement, and they denied the right of the government to predetermine the mutual relations between the various parts of Russia, since such questions could only be decided by the Constituent Assembly. Nekrasov declared that the scheme had the character of an ultimatum, and must be accepted as it stood. After a heated debate the majority of the ministers present accepted Nekrasov's point of view. Thereupon Shingraf and the other cadet ministers resigned on the ground that they could not be parties in a grossly illegal act. That was in the evening of July 14. On the following day this serious ministerial crisis was overshadowed by much graver events. From that time on, the Ukrainian movement gathered strength and became more and more extreme, until after the Bolshevist rising in November the Rada proclaimed the complete independence of the Ukraine, and, after various misadventures, concluded a few months later a separate peace with Germany. The stand made by the cadets against the dismemberment of Russia was severely condemned by the moderate socialists who regarded continual concessions as the only possible form of tranquil and orderly government. They lived to rue their era. The government, after the retirement of the cadets, maintained a feeble and unhappy existence throughout the throes of a violent crisis, which ended in the resignation of Prince Lvov, and the constitution of a third provisional government with Ear and Skiers Premier. From that moment the predominance of the socialists in the government was assured, and therefore they may be considered responsible for all the acts and all the failures to act of the authorities. At the time of this ministerial crisis, and while negotiations were being carried on in regard to the new ministers and their programs, the Germans broke through the Russian line, and the Bolsheviks made an attempt to break through the rear. On the night of the 16th 17th of July they instigated part of the Petrograd garrison to leave their barracks, and led them to the Torida Palace, in order to force the Soviet to proclaim itself their government. The Bolsheviks also summoned two warships from Kronstadt, manned by Bolshevist sailors. Armored cars and motor lorries with machine guns began to rush up and down the streets of the astonished capital. On all sides there was a splutter of random firing. Not only the victims, but even those who were shooting had a very vague idea of what was the matter, or of whom they were fighting against. The firing went on for two days, during which Lenin, Trotsky, Lunakarsky, and other Bolshevist orators made speeches from the balcony of Kkesinska's house, inciting the mob to overthrow the government and take the power into their own hands. The executive committee of the Soviet in session at the Torida Palace was in danger and asked for help, for the exhortations of Genov and Prince Tsritli, who tried to address the mob, nearly led to the arrest of the orators. 
Cossacks were sent to the assistance of the Soviet, and were fired at by workmen with machine guns. The Bolsheviks tried to seize the intelligence department where the information concerning German spies was concentrated. But they were driven off by the disabled soldiers, who in general showed no little steadiness and shrewdness in those days of general confusion and dismay. The other regiments, that is the notorious Petrograd garrison, who were now transformed into a well-fed, lazy, revolutionary Praetorian guard, looked on indifferently at the Bolshevist insurrection. Even then someone found a vindication of the indifference, we don't want to spill the blood of our brothers, that is, to interfere in civil war. The government was at a complete loss. It was only the day before, on Sunday evening, that the cadet ministers had left the cabinet. Kierinsky had gone off to the front. The insurrection of the Bolsheviks took place on Monday night. All Tuesday, Prince Lvov was practically the sole representative of the government, and his only guard were the disabled soldiers. So little did the revolutionary democracy realize what was happening, so little was it inclined to regard the Bolsheviks as enemies of the people, that at the time when the Bolshevist machine guns were shooting down the peaceful crowds in the streets, the social revolutionary G.R. Schreider, mayor of the Petrograd City Council, which had been already re-elected under the new universal suffrage law, announced that he had opened soup kitchens for the Kronstadt sailors. And the socialist majority of the council were indignant when the cadet members announced that they saw no necessity to feed the sailors who had come to Petrograd to shoot peaceful citizens and overthrow the government. But however weak Prince Lvov's government might be, it still was firm enough to crush the insurrection by armed force. It still had at its disposal some disciplined troops, capable of carrying out orders. Troops were called out, and surrounded Kesinska's house and the barracks of the machine gun regiment, the principal stronghold of Bolshevism. Seeing that matters were taking an unpleasant turn, the sailors made haste to go back to Kronstadt. Three days after the insurrection was put down, almost without bloodshed. Public opinion expressed its indignation. On all sides were heard demands that decisive measures should be taken against the insurgents, who had tried to bring about a civil war. The Central Committee of the Cadet Party passed a resolution demanding the immediate arrest of Lenin and his accomplices, and the protection of the freedom of Russia from any fresh attempts of this kind. The government ordered the ringleaders to be tried. Measures were taken to disarm the principal supporters of Bolshevism the machine gun regiments and the Red Army, the formation of which had at one time been advocated by the Izvestia. Searches and arrests were ordered. It seemed as if at last the government were going to fight for the establishment of a firm authority. The Soviet seemed as though it were ready to support the government. In one of its appeals it said that these street manifestations amounted to treachery. Whoever makes an attempt in the rear to coerce the will of the plenipotentiaries of democracy, is plunging a dagger into the back of the revolutionary army now fighting against the Kaiser's troops, and is stirring up civil war in its ranks. But here again the revolutionary democracy stopped halfway, and could not muster enough courage or good sense to draw the logical conclusions from the behavior of its left wing. On the 20th July, three days after the insurrection, Alexinsky, a social democrat of the Pelekanov group, and the social revolutionary Pankratov, an old revolutionary, wrote to the papers saying that they had documentary proofs that the Bolsheviks had received money from Berlin, through Stockholm. Even the banks were named, the Diskontogeselschaft, Naya Bank, the Siberian Bank. The names of the intermediaries were also given, Parvis, Gnetsky, Sumanson, and Kozlovsky. The first result of this disclosure was that Aleksinsky was not admitted to the Soviet. The papers raised a cry that the Bolsheviks had received money from the Germans, and the Soviet promised to make a strict inquiry into the matter, but begged that there might be no expression of opinion with regard to the events or to Comrade Lenin. One must contrast this careful attitude towards the Bolsheviks who, according to the words of the Soviet itself, had plunged a dagger into the back of the army with the ease with which the Soviet discredited and insulted the Russian officers, generals, and statesmen of the defensist camp, 
in order to understand what were the hopes, and where lay the sympathies, of the revolutionary democracy. Iransky, Minister of War, reported to the government on the ruinous effects the events of Petrograd and Bolshevist propaganda were having on the troops at the front. After some debate, orders were given for the arrest of Lenin, Zinovov, Kamenev, Trotsky, and others. In the wireless message sent by Kierensky to various places it was declared, it has been proved without any doubt that the disorders in Petrograd were organized with the help of the agents of the German government. At the present time the disorders have been completely suppressed. The ringleaders and persons who have been stained by fraternal blood and by crimes against the motherland and the revolution are to be arrested. The telegram ended with an appeal to rally round the government and the organs of democracy, for the sake of security against the foreign foe and his allies in our own camps, 21st July. This sounded all the more impressive as it came from the head of the government. Kierensky undertook to form a new cabinet, and the Soviet Executive Committee promised him its unlimited support. A somewhat complicated and verbose appeal, issued in regard to this, ended as follows. Revolutionary discipline must encase the country like strong armor. The government will, as one man, begin the struggle against the counter-revolution, and for the organization of revolutionary order. Another appeal made by the Soviet declared, the insane attempt, of the Bolsheviks, has caused a great reaction among the masses, causing a tendency to panic which may issue in a counter-revolution. The anxieties in connection with the struggle against this counter-revolution, which was indeed threatening not from the right, but the left, quite hid from the members of the Soviet even the possibility of any military danger. In the meantime, Petrograd had learnt of the shameful behavior of the troops at the front, resulting in the Germans breaking the Russian line. An official communique of the 21st July even stated the reasons of this disaster saying that the 607th Regiment left the trenches of its own accord and retired, in consequence of which neighboring troops likewise retreated, thereby enabling the enemy to develop his successes. Our defeat was due to the now inveterate habit of discussion by the troops in place of obedience, so that elements who did advance were left unsupported, and in some cases positions were abandoned when no enemy pressure was felt. Every day the newspapers gave further particulars. It was clear that the ruin of the army was an accomplished fact, the ruin which had been feared by patriots from the first days of the revolution, and against which the public had been warned by every military authority. On the 23rd July, the telegram of the commissaries of the 11th Army was received. This was the first terrible, public acknowledgement of the state of dissolution in the army. It was issued, not by the cadets not by any generals, but by representatives of the revolutionary democracy, and the impression was therefore all the greater. The German advance against the 11th Army, which began on the 6th July, is becoming calamitous, and is even threatening to ruin revolutionary Russia. There is an abrupt and perilous change in the spirit of the troops, lately advancing by the heroic efforts of the thoughtful minority. The will to advance has rapidly evaporated. The majority of the regiments are in a state of increasing dissolution, there is no authority or subordination whatever, persuasion and protests have lost their force, and those who make them are threatened and sometimes shot. There have been cases when the order to advance at once to the rescue has been discussed for hours at meetings, with the result that the reserves have been 24 hours late in arriving. Not infrequently the troops abandoned their trenches after the first shots of the enemy. Hundreds of versts to the rear streams of fugitives may be seen, with rifles or without, healthy, fit, lost to all shame, feeling themselves quite immune from all punishment. Sometimes whole regiments retreat in this manner. The members of the army and front committees and commissaries are unanimous in acknowledging the necessity for extreme measures. Today the commander-in-chief of the 11th Army, with the consent of the commissaries and committees, has given orders to fire on the fugitives. Let the whole country know the truth about what has taken place, let it shudder, and find the courage to fall ruthlessly on all those who are ruining Russia by their faint-heartedness, and are betraying their country and the revolution. The Germans were driving back the Russian army. 
it became necessary to evacuate Galicia in haste, to leave districts once taken at a great cost. The retreat was accompanied by rioting and crime. And on all sides demands were heard for the reintroduction of capital punishment in the army, as the only means of restoring weakened discipline, of stopping the final decay of the army. The commander-in-chief of the southwestern front, General Kornilov, wired demanding the restoration of discipline and of capital punishment, I, General Kornilov, who have given all my life for my country, declare that our motherland is perishing. An army of ignorant men who have lost their senses, unprotected by authority from systematic corruption and dissolution, lost to all feelings of manly dignity, is in full flight. On fields which cannot even be called fields of battle there is a reign of horror, disgrace, and shame, such as the Russian army has not known since its formation. The mild measures of the government have weakened all discipline. Death from the hands of our own brethren is always hovering over the army. Capital punishment will save many innocent lives at the cost of those of a few traitors, betrayers, and cowards. Even then, General Kornilov was accused of counter revolutionary tendencies, but his views were shared by the commissary of the Southwestern Front, the well known revolutionary, Boris Savinkov. An able writer, who for many years was the chief leader of the militant social revolutionaries. The terrorist who in Tsarist times had organized the assassination of ministers and of the Grand Duke Sergei Alexandrovich, Savinkov was clothed in all the panoply of revolutionary authority, and the Soviet found it more difficult to dispose of him than of General Kornilov. Two days after the first telegram telling of the dissolution of the Eleven Army, Savinkov telegraphed that the Seven Army, which had been prepared to take the offensive, was also running away. The heroes that have fallen in battle inspired the army to fight valiantly, but now that they are dead, the army is running away. How shall I answer for the bloodshed if I do not insist that with an iron resolution such order and discipline shall be immediately introduced into the army as will prevent the cowardly and faint hearted making a breach in the front? Men who of their own accord abandon their trenches bring ruin on whole regiments and on their comrades who are faithfully doing their duty, and these deserters cover both the revolution and Russia with eternal disgrace. There is no choice, the death penalty for those who refuse to risk their lives for their country, for land and liberty. But the reality was even more terrible. The Russian soldiers, who had lately been so self sacrificing and heroic in doing their duty, now seemed to be possessed by devils, and turned into a mob of cowards and criminals. Even Savinkov had not the courage to tell all that took place during the retreat. Only about a month after, when fresh news was daily brought of the shameful behavior of the soldiers, and when the revolutionary democracy listened, sighed, and carried on endless discussions about the advisability of introducing capital punishment. Savinkov's mother published an account of a conversation she had had with her son. She had trembled so often for his life during the Tsar's reign, she herself had sympathized with and assisted her son's revolutionary activity, and she was always against capital punishment, and was convinced that her son shared her views. But he told her the frightful story of a small town called Galush where the retreating Russian army yielded to its most brutal instincts. My heart sank with horror at the tale, when I heard how publicly, in the sight of everybody, in the very street, a savage horde amused itself by violating young and old, when, one after another, in an uninterrupted stream, these savages gratified their brutal instincts on what was already the corpse of a child and with laughter and yells pointed to the mother, lying in hysterical convulsions near the spot, when at one blow they struck off the head of everyone who dared to protest, when they sent treacherous bullets into the backs not of their enemies, but of their own heroes, when, wildly hooting, whistling shrilly, they lifted up on their bayonets the commander who had attempted to stop their shameful flight. Then I understood. I understood. And how easy it seemed to me after all these refined executions, was death by shooting. See the reach, August 9, 1917. This nightmare then seemed incredible. 
since then every day of Russian life has accustomed us to the terrible, has shown what a mob may turn into when deprived of discipline and drunk with unlimited liberty. In the summer of 1917 the papers began to be filled with stories of robberies, oppression, murders, crimes, both wholesale and individual. Not infrequently they were committed under the pretext of land confiscation, the struggle against capitalism, settlement of accounts with the bourgeoisie and the counter-revolutionaries. But, by whatever name it went, it was wicked oppression. These were all forerunners of that bloody whirlwind which was to break over Russia, when the triumphant Bolsheviks began to inaugurate the reign of Marxism and Communism. Of course, neither Prince Lvov's nor Kierinsky's government encouraged oppression, by whomsoever committed. They tried to bring the masses to their senses. But only by words, and not by deeds. The most terrible occurrences, the most disgraceful corruption of the army, and the most shameless dissolution of the Russian state could not tear away these peculiar rulers from academic dogmatism, nor bring them into the path of an actual fight for the right, for order, for the safety of Russia. During the first eight months, individuals, the crowd, and whole organizations grew accustomed to commit those pogroms, insults, oppression, and crimes, which would subsequently be signed by the Soviet authorities in the form of decrees. Sometimes it seemed as if that cry of I understand. I understand. Which burst from? Savinkov would burst likewise from the government from the Soviet. When Kierinsky was informed that the Committee of the Southwestern Front had decided to shoot those who ran away, he approved of that truly revolutionary decision. But later on, in the heat of the dispute about capital punishment, when all the commanders, all sensible people, cried out that capital punishment was necessary, that without it the army could not be saved, the same Kierinsky solemnly declared that he had never as yet signed a single death sentence. The hesitation and indecision of the government only increased the ferment in the army. The best soldiers and officers paid for this weakness. Kornilov was right when, in the summer of 1917, he said that it was necessary to execute the few in order to save the rest who had not lost all conception of honor. The sense of duty, not infrequently attaining the heights of heroism, was at that time still alive in the Russian army. In battle officers went ahead, but often soldiers followed them. And among them, mingling with the heroes, the traitors carried on their base traffic, unpunished and unashamed, overwhelming the simple-minded soldiers with a hail of incomprehensible words, thereby unloosing the hands of scoundrels and cowards. Truly terrible was the position of honest soldiers of all ranks, from general to private, when they saw how the orderly military organization, in which everyone knew his place, was turning into a disorderly mob no longer bound together by the old discipline, and as yet not united by any new moral demands. In private letters from the front, which are always characteristic of the mood of the army, a real cry of despair is becoming more and more insistent. Here, for instance, is a letter written before the July, 1917, Bolshevist mutiny, by a 24-year-old officer who had thrown up the university at the outbreak of the war and volunteered as a private to fight the Germans, had taken part in many a hard battle, and had received several military decorations. He writes, in spite of all the difficulty of creating anything at present, I still think that we shall be able to establish some sort of order. It is very hard at present. At times it seems as if we could manage it, but then again despair overcomes us. The cause of all the trouble is the awful ignorance of the soldiers, they are rough and unusually tactful by turns. Everything must be looked on as an excess. But it is awfully hard to lead these men to battle, intoxicated as they are with some kind of liberty, and thinking so little of fighting. Still more disheartening is the letter of another officer who, before the war, had been a schoolmaster at a factory and in close touch with the workmen. During the first days of the revolution he enjoyed the happiness of freedom, together with the soldiers. Then irresponsible agitators descended upon them, and began to egg on the soldiers to undermine their confidence in their officers. The only comfort now is that they look upon even Kierinsky as a venal bourgeois, a reactionary and imperialist. 
Now I can feel no uplifting of spirit. I go forward with clenched teeth, with all my might trying to stifle the feeling of hopelessness which has overwhelmed me. But don't be anxious about me. Lacking faith and an uplifting of spirit, there is yet a feeling of duty, and I shall have strength enough to do it. The same pessimism in regard to the events at the front is seen in letters of doctors and nurses who were living the same life as the army and saw all that was going on. Their position was as difficult as that of all educated people. The committees, elected by an absurd suffrage system, encouraged by a blind and irresponsible demagogic revolutionary democracy, were completely upsetting the work of the medical and sanitary organizations. Illiterate orderlies conducted the elections, distributed the duties among the doctors, insulted the nurses, discharged them, upset the patients, who, before consenting to be operated upon, would call a meeting of the committee of lower employees and ask for their competent opinion as to whether it was necessary to amputate a gangrened leg or not. The doctors and nurses bore all this. They could not throw up their work, nor leave the sick and wounded entrusted to their care. With clenched teeth, under a hail of insult and humiliation, like the Russian officers they went on doing their duty. Their bitterness was increased by seeing the soldiers turning into a mob of revolted slaves, one of Kierensky's most apt expressions. In my ward I have some wounded of the mutinied regiments. They have already managed to fraternize with our orderlies, on the basis of common ideals, namely, to take care of their own skins, and not to bother about either their comrades or their country. One feels quite powerless before such an obstinate and stupid gang, deaf to all ideas of duty and truth. The above was written in the middle of July by a young nurse, who had worked at the front since the beginning of the war. I had seen her at work. I had seen how cheerfully and devotedly she worked for the Russian army, bringing brightness and cheerfulness into the hard conditions of life at the front by her generous and superabundant youth. But now this energetic, self-sacrificing, merry girl was absolutely disheartened. And how could she help losing heart? The nurses of the Northern Front who had come to the Congress at Minsk asked the soldiers, Our faith is shattered and a bitter question arises whom are we serving? Those who are going forth to die for their country, or those who are sowing anarchy and killing the champions of a brighter future? Many others asked themselves similar bitter questions. Later on, in consequence of the Bolshevist coup d'etat, Russia was fated to drink the cup to the dregs, to know what a destructive force the army of many millions might become after throwing off the last vestiges of authority. Military men had already foreseen this, and had made every effort to stop the process of decay. The commander, in chief, Kornilov, prohibited meetings within the zone of military operations, but could not prevent whole carloads of the Pravda and other Bolshevist literature arriving at the front. The civilians at the head of the Soviet and the government did not believe the generals. The secession of the Ukraine, the evacuation of Galicia, and the gangrene in the army, the insurrection of the Bolsheviks, which had revealed their connection with Germany all this was not enough to remove the scales from the eyes of the revolutionary democracy, to make it understand where the storm came from. Its relations with the Bolsheviks were as friendly as heretofore. After the first few days of panic, when the socialistic press reproached the followers of Lenin for having plunged a dagger into the back of the revolution, it again turned all its attention to the foes on the right. After having skimmed the cream from the pseudo-revolutionary movement let loose by the Bolsheviks, the counter-revolutionaries are hastening to take the necessary repressive measures for their own purposes says the Izvestia for 26th July. We find the same note in the Novaya Zizn. The paper of the influential Russian writer, Maxim Gorky, which, under the guidance of a group of social democratic internationalists, was very persistent in trying to prove that salvation lay only in the creation of strong revolutionary power. No one except the Soviets was able to exert such power. And this power was required to fight the counter revolutionaries. After this, Lenin and Zinovov of course had the right to publish an open letter in order to explain that they had merely disappeared in the name of liberty, and did not wish to give themselves up into the hands of the counter-revolutionaries. 
only the constituent assembly, if it be convened and convened not by the bourgeoisie, will have the right of expressing its views on the order of the provisional government for our arrest. These words regarding the jurisdiction of the constituent assembly have a peculiar flavor at the present time, when the Bolsheviks have shown what they understand by its rights. Of course, even before this they did not hide their theoretical contempt for right and liberty, and, ever since they existed as a party, have given sufficient practical proofs of the perfect shamelessness of their tactics. But so strong were the ties which bound the other socialists to the Bolsheviks that it was beyond the power of the socialist center to break them. This was done later by the Bolsheviks themselves. But in the summer of 1917 they did not want an open rupture. Their object was to detach the Soviets from non-socialistic Russia, so as to be able to carry out the Marxist program more rapidly, and establish the dictatorship of the proletariat. But still revolutionary democracy was not prepared to attack the bourgeoisie. It did not want to drive it away, but merely to force it to adopt the Soviet program. In regard to this a struggle took place which made it very difficult for Kierensky to form a new cabinet. Prince Lvov resigned on 20 July, explaining in a letter in the papers the reasons for his resignation. He could not accept the program proposed by the socialist ministers and accepted by the provisional government. I cannot agree to it, in view of its being an obvious departure from the non-party idea to that of seeking to attain purely socialistic, party aims. He saw this, first of all, in the intention of the government to declare for a republic without waiting for the constituent assembly, which ought to determine the form of government. But the chief difference of opinion between the first premier of the provisional government and the other ministers was in regard to the land question. Though I am an advocate for the transference of the land to the labouring peasantry, says Prince Lvov, nevertheless, I think that the land bills introduced by the Minister of Agriculture are unacceptable. At that time the Minister of Agriculture was Viktor Janov, who was supported by the Social Revolutionary Party. His bill was a true reflection of the program and ideology of that party in the solution of the land problem. They considered that all the land ought to be taken away from the landowners, without any compensation. Every toiler had a right to the land but as soon as he ceased to till it with his own hands, the land was to be taken away. Land must not be either bought or sold, and could not be private property, as the land belonged to God. This was the only time the social revolutionaries used the name of God. In less poetical language this meant that the land ought to belong to the government. These general ideas of agrarian socialism began, with the assistance of V. Genoff and his comrades, to assume the form of legislative projects. On resigning, Prince Lvov thus characterized them, the Ministry of Agriculture is passing laws which undermine the national ideas of right. Not only do these laws fail to combat the tendency to seize property, not only do they fail to bring agricultural relationships into their normal channel, but they justify, as it were, the ruinous arbitrary seizures of land that are going on all over Russia. They confirm the seizures already accomplished, and strive to place before the Constituent Assembly an already determined agrarian question. I consider the land program of the Minister of Agriculture ruinous to Russia, because it will leave Russia bankrupt, ruined both morally and materially. The ensuing anarchy in the villages to a considerable extent confirmed his opinion, but at the same time many attempts to restrict the peasantry in their seizures of land were considered to be manifestations of the counter-revolutionary tendency, so much feared by socialists. When, after the resignation of Prince Lvov and the cadets, Kierensky and the revolutionary Democrats who supported him began to seek for new men and a new platform, at the united meeting of the Central Democratic Organizations on 29 July, a voluminous motion was passed. https colon slash slash www.yamaguchi.com slash library slash tikava slash tikavo underscore 07. html The country and the revolution are in the greatest danger, owing both to the impending military disaster and to the anarchistic and counter revolutionary attempts. In putting on the same level the far from equal dangers, 
the meeting declared that it was necessary to create a firm government, in which the bourgeoisie was to take part. But any agreement between the revolutionary democracy and the bourgeoisie was only possible if the bourgeoisie would acknowledge all the conquests made by the revolution, and, above all, would stand up to the end for the formula of peace without annexation and indemnities, on the basis of self-determination. The Soviet politicians knew that this formula, drawn up by the socialistic minority at Zimmerwald, was objected to, not only by the cadets, but also by their own fellow socialists of the type of Pelekhanov. Men of such different opinions as the cadet Miley Ukov, the social democrat Pelekhanov, and the anarchist Kropotkin, unanimously asserted that peace could only be obtained by victory over the enemy, and not by Soviet negotiations with the international proletariat. Knowing this, and likewise publicly declaring that authority and power should be founded on an agreement with the bourgeoisie, the representatives of the Soviet inserted into their resolution the following threat. The passive opposition shown by certain groups of the bourgeoisie to all the revolutionary measures of the provisional government, the boycotting of authority, the desire to retard agrarian, political, financial, and economic reforms, and to put off the constituent assembly all this is nothing but an attempt to seize power, by taking advantage of the embarrassed state of the country. Such opposition is equivalent to direct assistance to the darkest forces of counter-revolution, and tends to prepare the way for the complete destruction of the country. Later on the same accusations, couched in a cruder form and leading to more sanguinary results, were brought by the Bolsheviks against all their opponents including the revolutionary democracy whom they had defeated. It is one of the strange features of the revolution that the accusations of imperialism, bourgeois, and counter-revolutionary tendencies were gradually shifted from the right to the left parties. First they were brought against Miley Ukov and Lvov, then against Kierensky and Tsretli, and finally against the social revolutionaries. Counter-revolution was likewise spoken of by members of the government in July 1917. The new Minister of the Interior, Prince Tsretli, sent circulars all over Russia, saying, no arbitrary seizures of land and property, no oppression, no incitement to civil war and breaches of military duty are permissible. This would have been all very well had it not been followed by an explanation regarding the source of all these destructive factors. The treacherous blow dealt by anarchy has caused confusion in the country. Hoping to snatch away all that has been obtained by the revolution, counter-revolution has lifted its head. The dissolution and anarchy at the rear have found their way into the army at the front. Prince Zretli's words seem to imply that counter-revolution which by the way had as yet shown no signs of its existence, had rotted the army. He does not say a single word about the Bolsheviks. For they were an influential left group of the Social Democratic Party, whose unity he had lauded and defended. The committee of the Duma, with them, Rodzienko at the head, was considered to be the chief hotbed of counter-revolution. Rodzienko had no influence over the masses, but certain tendencies of state policy found their expression in him. Thus, on the 31st July, when there were endless discussions about the program of the new government, the Provisional Committee of the Duma passed a definite motion which began with a quotation from Kornilov's telegram, an army of ignorant men who have lost their senses, and are not bound by any authority. The national representatives pointed out that the cause of the general calamity lies in the seizure of government power by irresponsible organizations, and the creation by them of a divided central authority, accompanied by a subversion of local authority. In order to save both the army and Russia, it was necessary that authority should be strong. The government must not be guided by the orders of party organizations and separate classes of society. Miley Ukov who spoke at this sitting, pointed out still more clearly that the government ought not to be dependent on the Soviets, that its policy should be united and national, and not the class policy of Zimmerwald. We demand, said he, that measures should be taken to create a strong army by the restoration of strict military discipline, and the resolute prevention of any interference on the part of army committees and questions of military tactics and strategy. 
This was a program directly contrary to that of revolutionary democracy, who wanted both to establish civil government and to organize the army exclusively on the basis of elected committees and organizations. Given such a difference of opinion, it was no easy task for Kierensky, while seeking support from the revolutionary democracy, to form a coalition government. For three weeks Russia was practically without any properly organized central authority. However, the force of its former state inertia was sufficiently great to keep the whole machinery still at work. Notwithstanding the weakness and contradictions which brought discord into the governing parties, the people as a whole were ready to obey and waited patiently, even longed for new laws to be passed, just as the army longed for strict, uniform, and sensible orders. The expectations of the people were not justified. The new government, finally formed on the 6th August, turned out to be as helpless as its predecessor. It included the social revolutionaries Kierensky, Savinkov, Lebedev, Arksentov, Jinov, the Social Democrats Skoplev, Nikitin, and Prokopovich, the socialist populist Beshek Honov, the cadets Kokoshkin, Oldenburg, Yurenev, Kartashov, the radical Efremov, and three independents, Zarodny, Tereshkenko, and Nekrasov. This was the so called Save the Revolution government. As in all cabinets, among the new ministers there were both strong and weak men, able men and those whose capacity was limited. But not one was strong enough to guide the Russian vessel of state from anarchy to order, nor able enough to pull the government out of the mire of dogmatism and inaction. Partly owing to pressure brought to bear by the Soviet circles, who still regarded the Bolsheviks as their comrades, and partly owing to its own inner weakness and heterogeneous composition, the new cabinet was not even able to wage serious warfare with that part of the Social Democratic Party whom the public prosecutor had accused of high treason. Some of the minor Bolsheviks who had received money from the Germans were indeed arrested. But Trotsky and Lenin remained at large, drove about to the various barracks and meetings, and made incendiary speeches against the Allies against the war, against the bourgeoisie. Finally, on the 5th August, they were arrested. And at once in the Petrograd City Council, where all political perturbations and passions were reflected, the internationalists, the closest friends of the Bolsheviks, put a question as to the causes of the arrests. The City Council, two-thirds of whom were socialists and one-third cadets, supported the question or rather the protest against the arrest of men who had opposed the provisional government with arms in their hands. At a Congress of Bolsheviks, 8th August, it was announced that Lenin and Zinovov, for whose arrest orders had been given, were hiding somewhere in Russia, and were in constant touch with their party. Although the public prosecutor had accused them of high treason, no measures whatever were taken for their arrest. Another Bolshevik, came an F. Rosenfeld, came straight from prison to a meeting of the Central Executive Committee, where he met with an ovation. Several days after the Izvestia published a statement that this revolutionary hero used to receive 100 rubles a month from the Tsar's police for his work as an agent provocateur. But even after this he still remained a member of the Executive Committee. At the same meeting where the revolutionary democracy greeted the Bolshevist secret police agent so enthusiastically, members of the government rose to make speeches. But in their speeches there was no bold condemnation of the left traitors. On the contrary, the ministers hastened to point out to the Soviets that the principal foes were of course among the right parties. Prince Tsretli spoke of the bourgeoisie having gone over to the counter-revolutionaries, while Kierensky declared pathetically that he would allow no restoration. These words were already an echo of the conflict which had taken place between the head of the government and experienced army leaders. Chapter V The Moscow State Conference attempts of the government find supporters outside the Soviets, the generals and the committees at the front. Rodzienko's declaration and Chides' declaration to Russia's Kierensky's ambiguous position, difficulty of amalgamation, the Bolsheviks and the Moscow workmen. The position of the premier of the Save the Revolution government was exceeding difficult, first of all because in the Russian Revolution, as probably in all others, the revolutionaries themselves turned out to be the worst friends of liberty and order. Their watchword was, 
save what the revolution has won. But besides the revolution there was Russia also expecting a deliverer. In a country with a population of 175 millions, anarchy and famine reigned far and wide. The war had taken a firmer grip than ever. The government had to fight against these three calamities. But how was that to be done, when the government instead of being supported by powerful political organizations with a proper conception of state affairs was merely trying to find supporters among masses as unstable as molten lava? Any other supporters were considered by Kierensky and his colleagues to be not democratic enough. Kierensky's popularity was very great both in the army and at the rear. When the municipal elections were taking place under the new universal suffrage law, the success of the social revolutionaries was increased by the fact that Kierensky belonged to that party. In almost every town his comrades were in the majority. But the voters did not really know for whom they were voting, as the Social Revolutionary Party consisted of many sections sharply distinct from one another. The left were nearer to the Bolsheviks, and afterwards supported them. The right were nearer to the socialist populists of the Pelekanov and Portrasov type. The right social revolutionaries supported Kierensky. Among them there were able and honest individuals like Lebedev, Breshko Breshkovskaya, Savinkov, and others. The numerous social revolutionary center, where Genov was especially influential, were all against Kierensky. Genov, a writer of influence in socialistic circles, an ideologist of the so called revolutionary populist group, had been a political refugee for ten years. In October 1915, together with other social revolutionaries, he founded, in Geneva, the Committee of Intellectual Assistance to Russian Prisoners of War in Germany, which published a pacifist journal called Away from Home. The Germans and Austrians assiduously disseminated this periodical among Russian prisoners in the camps. In many ways the general ideas voiced by this journal coincided with those of the Bolsheviks. This man, who had taken part in the Zimmerwald Congress, was appointed by the social revolutionaries to the post of Minister of Agriculture. In the cabinet, as in the party, Genov carried on a struggle against Kierensky. This also was not conducive to the establishment of the firm government which was so much spoken of both on the right and on the left. But the left considered it should be based on the will of the people, as expressed by the spontaneously established Soviets and democratic organizations, whereas the right wanted to retain the uninterrupted succession of authority in the form of an independent provisional government, which could hand over its powers only to a constituent assembly properly elected by universal suffrage. This right tendency had the support of the Fourth Duma. But the Duma was attacked furiously on all sides by the revolutionary democracy, beginning with Chides, president of the Soviet, who, like Kierensky, was afraid to avail himself of its support because he did not wish to risk his popularity among the democracy. The suffrage law under which the Duma had been elected was exceedingly incomplete, and even, under the old regime was often severely criticized by the members of the Duma themselves especially those of the cadet party. But still it was a lawful assembly of national representatives, a parliament which all through the war had taken the national and patriotic point of view and had established a party truce for the sake of saving the country. It was only the extreme left, led by Chides and Kierensky, that spoke against such a policy of union for the defense of the country. From the very first days of the war these men spoke in the Duma not of victory over the Germans but of the liquidation of the war. It is therefore easy to understand that the Soviet, where Chides was president, persistently discredited the Duma committee, insisted on its being closed, and tried to assume the ROE of a parliament. But the method of recruiting the Soviet was too haphazard and illegal, and its activity was purely that of a political meeting. Practically even in the first Soviet the influence of the mob was of enormous importance. Even the socialist ministers began to understand the lack of statesmanship in their Soviet colleagues, and pending the election of the Constituent Assembly tried to find some substitute for representation. Notwithstanding solemn promises of support, they and especially Kierensky were met with increasing coolness in the Soviet. For three months, 
From August to November, Kierinsky made various attempts to establish a consultative institution of more authority than the Soviet. On 3 August, before the final formation of the cabinet, Kierinsky hastily convened, in the Winter Palace, representatives of the executive committees of all the parties. After an excited and feverish all-night sitting, the meeting entrusted the formation of a cabinet to Kierinsky. A more serious representative state conference was convened in Moscow on 25 August. A month later, on 29 September, a Democratic Congress met in Petrograd, only socialists being admitted. Finally, on 20 October a fourth and last attempt was made, and a Council of the Republic was convened, but was dispersed by the Bolsheviks. After that the latter were masters of the position. Invitations to the state conference in Moscow https colon slash slash www.yamaguchi.com slash library slash tikova slash tikovo underscore o eight dot html were sent to the representatives of all classes, of all parties, organizations, and corporations. About two thousand five hundred representatives came to the conference. There is no exaggeration in saying that the flower of the Russian population were gathered together in the enormous hall of the Great Theatre on the 25th of August. Professors and workmen, military men and members of cooperative societies, of Zemstvos and municipal corporations, scientists, writers, peasants from the Peasants' Union, generals and privates, monarchists and republicans all had responded to the call of the government. It was a review of the living forces of the country, where the two Russias were to be reconciled. What was then termed the right wing, which included all non-socialists, was called property qualified Russia, although there were not a few proletarians of the educated classes among them. The left wing, which styled itself democratic Russia, included not only workmen but even titled persons and rich men. This arbitrarily given nickname even then included two distinctly divergent groups. The right group was composed of people who acknowledged political liberty and a democratic state as essential to a new Russia. But they considered that it could be founded only on personal initiative and private property. The left group were socialists who considered property to be an institution of the bourgeoisie and one to be abolished as soon as possible. By this time so great was the divergence of views on the methods to be followed and the objects to be attained that, although the invitations had been issued by Kierinsky, to whom the Soviet had promised full support, yet the executive committee had a long discussion as to whether it could with any propriety take part in the state conference. The Bolsheviks argued hotly against it considering the whole affair to be counter-revolutionary. And even the Soviet was afraid of compromising itself, as from information received by the Soviet dark forces wanted to use the conference for the purpose of striking a decisive blow at the revolution. By this time the fear of a counter-revolution had become a sort of mental epidemic among socialists. It had existed before, but now their alarm was more concrete in character for they were frightened by the more and more persistent demands of the military commanders, who proposed a series of measures for the purpose of arresting the ruin of the army by the restoration of discipline. Like the civilians the soldiers divided into two groups. The masses were drawn to the Soviets, while the officers and the better educated private soldiers grouped themselves around the generals headed by Kornilov who had already in a report to Kierinsky expressed his views on the commissaries and the committees. But both of the latter institutions were considered by Soviet politicians as triumphs of the revolution, and any attempt on the counter-revolution. Part of Kornilov's report to the government got into the newspapers. In it the supreme commander and chief pointed out that the drafts sent out to him were not only quite worthless for fighting purposes, but were corrupting the troops already at the front. It is therefore necessary, in cases when soldiers commit crimes in the rear, to have recourse to the same severe measures up to capital punishment, as are in force in the army at the front. This proposal was furiously criticized by the press. The fears of the Soviet circles unfortunately infected the government. Nevertheless, after prolonged debates, the executive committee decided to take part in the state conference and at this time showed great independence of the Bolsheviks, 
depriving them of the right to take part in the conference because of their refusal to submit to the resolutions of the Soviet majority. But even the absence of the Bolsheviks could not close the rift in the conference. Only one watchword at times brought unity into all ranks, and that was when some orator would say, Russia will not permit the conclusion of a shameful peace. Then equally vigorous and united applause came from right and left. But no sooner did the speakers touch on more concrete matters, on the question of how to preserve Russia from a disgraceful peace, or what order was to be introduced in the rear and at the front for this purpose, then the conference would again divide into two camps. The conference was especially sensitive on the question of army organization. During the debates on this question not only were the words significant but there was significance in the applause, for whom, what reason, and from whom it came. And more than once, either when the generals were speaking, or when the representatives of the army committees were addressing the meeting, the terrible presentiment of civil war surged up threateningly, and all words of conciliation sounded weak and unconvincing. When Kierensky proposed to greet Kornilov as the leader of the perishing Russian army, an enormous majority of those present gave this courageous and honest patriot a hearty ovation. Only the soldiers smiled carelessly and retained their seats, when the others rose to applaud their leader and chief. And what else could be expected of these uneducated or half educated men? when those whom they looked upon as their spiritual teachers the civilian members of the Soviet also remained sitting. On the stage, not far from the long table at which the ministers sat, with Kierensky at their head, stood General Kornilov. With an air calm but careworn, he looked at the left section, on whose conscientiousness and good sense depended that which was dearer to him than life itself the fate of Russia and in the front row of the stalls below him sat the Georgian Chides, who, turning his back on the Supreme Commander-in-Chief, deliberately applauded the representatives of the front committees in the boxes on the left. His example was followed by the other members of the Executive Committee. It was only bourgeois Russia that applauded the Supreme Commander-in-Chief of the Russian Army. The Soviet showed plainly and significantly its total inability to understand the meaning of any army and of what its efficiency and discipline must be based on. After such a demonstration all appeals for unity sounded dead and hopeless, and it was in vain that Prince Tsretli spoke of an honest, democratic coalition. It could not be formed until democracy had adopted an honest attitude towards the principal problem of the state the war and the army. The form of government and the establishment of authority, economics, and class warfare all this did not give rise to such outbreaks of political passion as the army did. Kaledin, Alexov, and Kornilov spoke of this decay of the army courageously, not fearing the truth. They demanded the immediate introduction of decisive measures, and not of half measures. Kaledin, the Cossack general, thus formulated these necessary measures, the army is to keep outside politics meetings must be prohibited at the front. All committees and Soviets must be abolished, both in the army and in the rear. Only the economic committees may be left in the regimental units. The soldier's declaration of rights must be amended and supplemented by an indication of his duties. Strict discipline must be restored. A similar view of the need for efficiency of the army was taken in the declaration made by the members of the Fourth Duma, read by Rodzienko. This declaration was the best exposition of the political ideas and desires of the so-called bourgeois Russia, as represented at the Congress. These were as follows, at the present moment the chief object is to save Russia from defeat, dismemberment, and disgrace, and so to carry on the world war to a victorious end, in complete accord with our allies as to guarantee mankind against a repetition of such a war in the future. The declaration begins with this. History has already shown that the Russian politicians who grouped themselves round the Duma were quite correct in their statement of what was required at that time. But power was not on their side and their exhortations fell on heedless ears. Of course such aims demanded order and discipline in the army, as was pointed out in the above declaration. But in carrying on the war the government, in defining the aims of the war waged by Russia and the Allies, must not introduce any tendencies of international socialism, 
but must be guided exclusively by the national interests of Russia. The government must preserve a complete independence as regards motions passed by the International Socialistic Conference. It must likewise keep itself completely independent of the Soviets of workmen's, soldiers and peasants delegates organizations which do not represent the opinions and will of the entire nation. The fourth Duma in its declaration urged that the Russian government should be independent of any party. The government must be one and undivided, and no organizations have any right to interfere in its orders. But neither must the government anticipate in any fundamental measures the decisions of the Constituent Assembly, especially such measures as would affect the unity of the Russian state. The declaration especially emphasized the necessity for the government to prevent all the attempts to aggravate social conditions, and foment class warfare now encouraged by certain socialistic parties. The government must likewise prohibit any arbitrary solution of social questions by interested parties. This refers to the seizure of land by the peasants and of factories by the workmen. The right half of the state conference did not come to any formal agreement, though individual speakers expressed full concurrence with this declaration of the Fourth Duma. The majority of the right orators merely developed its fundamental principles. Shulgin, nationalist, and Matlokov. Cadet, were especially clear in their exposition. The cadets had taken an active part in drawing up the declaration, and, if I am not mistaken, it was written by Miley Ukov, who, in his speech, again emphasized still more clearly all the danger of capitulating to the utopian claims of the working classes, and to the extreme demands of the nationalities composing the empire. Maklikov, while welcoming that part of the government program which promised to carry on the war until the conclusion of an honorable peace, said, but I cannot help drawing attention to the alarm felt by the public conscience, when it sees among the Save the Revolution government some of yesterday's defeatists. These words caused the left wing to cheer Junov lustily, as if for the purpose of letting everyone know which of the ministers was yesterday's defeatist, and there were cries from the left. Long live the Muzik minister Chinov. But Maklikov was listened to in gloomy, inimical silence when he spoke of the necessity of saving Russia, and not the revolution, when he said that the way to salvation lay through the army, and that therefore it is our revolutionary duty to restore discipline in the army. Now Chides in his speech had explained that the aim of commissaries and committees was to be conductors of revolutionary policy. Therefore, said Maklikov, it was not considerations of discipline, not military necessity, but the desire to have their own agents in the army that made the revolutionary democracy stand up for these institutions. Those who introduced them into the army hoped that they would manage to do without battles, that Zimmerwald would lead them to an honorable peace. And the war still went on. Zimmerwald proved a poor defense against the advancing foe. A choice must be made. The army must either take to politics or else obey its leaders. But to restore discipline in the army would mean giving it into the power of the officers to whom at present the government shows no trust. Maklikov prophetically warned the government that in choosing the middle way it was creating such a state of affairs that the army will not be a fighting army, and will not belong to the government. In November Kierensky himself experienced all the hard truth of this prophecy. What was said by Rodzienko, Guchkov, Alexov, Kornilov, Mylyukov, Rybushinsky, Cutler, Shulgin, and many others who stood out for a strong government and a strong army, in many points coincided with the task the government had before it, to save the state, to protect the honor and dignity of the Russian people, as Kierensky put it. In his speeches too there was a ring of patriotism, far nearer to the feelings of the right wing than to those of the left. Nevertheless the socialist majority in the cabinet more than counteracted this tendency of their chief. They spoke of the salvation of Russia, of the necessity of saving it from defeat by the Germans, and yet put their trust, not in the patriots Alexov and Kornilov, but in the defeatists Chides and Chinov. It was obvious what the result would be. Radzienko could not even read his Duma declaration. It was only printed in the newspapers. When his turn to speak came the time allowed each speaker had already been curtailed, 
and Kierinsky either was not able or did not wish to let the most prominent representative of property owning Russia have his say the most prominent representative if not by his personal qualities at least by the position he occupied. It was one of those chance occurrences to which history likes to give a symbolic meaning. Non-socialistic Russia, defending the interests not of a class but of the state, was left unheard all through the state conference. And Chides, speaking for socialistic Russia, was able not only to finish his speech, but even to read the whole of a long manifesto of the revolutionary democracy. This declaration was signed not only by the Central Committee of the Workmen's, soldiers and peasants delegates, but also by the railway, post and telegraph, and teachers unions, by the front organizations, by part of the representatives of the Zemstvo and municipal institutions, the food committees, etc. As there was no voting at the conference it is very difficult to determine the numerical ratio between the non-socialist and socialist parties. But there is no doubt that the number of people on the side of the democratic organizations, in whose name Chides spoke, was enormously greater than that of the people who, speaking generally, supported Rodzienko. The left were correct in saying that they had the masses with them. Numerically they were stronger. But the bulk of the intellectual forces was not on their side. The left had to acknowledge this. M. Breshko Breshkovskaya, justly named the grandmother of the revolution, said, turning to the benches occupied by the present or former members of the Duma, you who, more than others, are rich in talent, knowledge, and experience in statesmanship go to the people, use your spiritual wealth in their service. But the left would not or could not understand that intellectual power used to carry out alien ideas ceases to be a power. And the ideas of the right and the left wing of the conference in regard to state matters were almost diametrically opposed. It is true Chides's declaration, subsequently known as the Declaration of the 27th of August, constituted a withdrawal from the old position held by the revolutionary democracy. In the spring of 1917 the socialist ministers promised on entering the cabinet to intensify class warfare. The declaration announced, the revolutionary democracy, as represented by its Soviet of workmen's, soldiers and peasants delegates, is striving in everything to place the interests of the whole of the country and the revolution above those of separate classes and groups of the population. This was already a great advance. But it could be of no significance unless the Soviets drew practical conclusions from it in fundamental questions of government and the war and in social and national problems. On none of these points, however, could they leave their former positions. The word victory was still not to be found in their vocabulary, the spirit of Zimmerwald still determined their relations to the war. The government must bear in mind that the energetic continuation of a foreign policy embracing a refusal of all imperialistic aims, at that time the Germans had occupied an enormous tract of Western Russia, and the desire for the speedy conclusion of universal peace on democratic principles, will be a mighty weapon for increasing the efficiency of the army. Https colon slash slash www.yamaguchi.com slash library slash tikava slash tikava underscore 08. Html The government must act with the support of democratic organizations in the rear and at the front. It must demand that the military authorities shall be unconditionally obedient to it, as the representative of the supreme power of the state. But there was not a word about democratic organizations also being obliged to obey this authority. Thus double authority was, so to speak, decreed by this declaration. The declaration very justly points out that the proprietary and privileged classes must sacrifice their interests for the good of the country. But it most inaccurately asserts that democracy is prepared to make any sacrifices to save the country and the revolution. The misfortunes of the country and the revolution arose from the fact that no one knew how to inspire the masses with a readiness to make sacrifices or even to submit to discipline. The declaration proceeded to set forth a long economic, agrarian, and financial program. Perhaps the most important points in it were the demand that agricultural land should be handed over to land committees without any infringement of the present form of land tenure. 
how land can be taken away from private owners without infringing these forms of land tenure does not appear. The Soviet lawyers themselves would perhaps not be able to answer this. As regards commerce and industry, there are clauses in the declaration which actually clear the way for the subsequent work of the Bolsheviks, such as, in order to increase productivity, it is first of all necessary to establish control over production and an active share in the management of undertakings, even going so far as the formation of syndicates and trusts by the state, and the introduction of monopolies. The food trade must also be under the especially strict supervision of food control institutions. https colon slash slash www.yamaguchi.com slash library slash tikava slash tikavo underscore 08. html No less dangerous was the war program of the revolutionary democracy based on the support of the committees, who were to be the leaders of the social and political life of the soldiery while the commissaries were to carry on a propaganda of the revolutionary policy of the government. The commanders were to be completely independent in all military operations, but they were not to undertake extraordinary measures of revolutionary action without the commissaries. The extravagant use or abuse of the system of coercion and repression ruins the fighting spirit and efficiency of the army. Therefore discipline must not be restored by the sole authority of the commanding officers. Even after flight en masse, crimes, and desertions, which had become so common in the army, the democracy was afraid of repression as ruinous to the fighting spirit. It was clear that neither patriots nor generals could take this point of view, that no compromise was possible, and that, sooner or later, the government would have to make, a definite choice between two divergent courses. Unfortunately for Russia, when the fateful hour arrived, the government, in the person of Kerensky, made the choice that was ruinous to Russia. But in August at the Moscow State Conference, Kerensky was still seeking for what he thought was a central position uniting both camps. He was neither able nor steadfast enough for this hard task. In his speeches, especially in his perorations, with hysterical nervousness he would threaten right and left, call for sacrifices, and talk of the perilous position of Russia. Yet when dealing with concrete problems, with the organization of government and of the army in the struggle against anarchy and economic ruin, he hesitated, made many a slip, and could not see his way. That part of Kerensky's speech which dealt with the army was positively dangerous. The old army was, unfortunately, bound by the hateful fetters of mechanical coercion and the senseless subordination of man to iron, and often to a brainless will placed above him. Thus spoke the Premier, who had retained the post of Minister of War, in the presence of the representatives of those very army committees which for five months had done nothing but throw off the chains of all coercion and all subordination. But what was still more dangerous was that in his speech Kierensky divided the officers into two classes. To one he took off his hat, the ordinary fighting officers who were not trying to make a career. These had on their side the whole intelligent portion of the army, including those new army committees and representatives of the central revolutionary authorities who formed such a necessary and integral part of the army, that is the commissaries. In the other class, disapproved of by the premier, were those officers who considered the committees and commissaries harmful, that is practically all the independent officers who were not seeking for cheap demagogic popularity with the Supreme Commander-in-Chief, General Kornilov, at their head. The disapproval hinted at by Kierensky was at once understood by the soldiers present and by their civilian leaders. It widened the rift between the officers and soldiers, and made the desperate position of the officers still worse. One thing can be placed to the credit of Kierensky and his colleagues in the cabinet, in connection with the Moscow conference, and that is that they were not afraid of the truth and used the conference to show Russia the dangerous position she was in. Disorder Ruin, anarchy, which later, under the Bolshevist regime, acquired a complete and obvious character, existed practically even then. I should like to find new, not human words, in order to describe to you all the horror which overwhelms us, when we see this danger. The state is in mortal danger. 
all of us are in mortal fear, Kierenski kept repeating in his speech. The ministers of the interior, of finance, of commerce, and especially the supreme commander-in-chief, who all spoke after him, brought a series of ruthless and terrible proofs that Russia was on the brink of utter ruin. The sole task that the government has before it is to save the country, to protect the honor and dignity of the whole Russian people and the Russian state, said the Prime Minister of the Provisional Government. It would seem as if all who were present, without distinction of party or class, must unite in one common impulse, and come to the aid of the government. There is no doubt that sincere pain and alarm for their perishing country were heard in the speeches of even the socialist orators, who had lately considered patriotism as treachery to the workmen's international. They likewise felt the sobering influence, but the process was too slow, far slower than was required by the complex and perturbed condition of an enormous nation. For it was not only the workmen, peasants, and soldiers whose minds were disturbed by the struggle between excited class appetites and the gnawing of their civic conscience. The minds of the leaders were likewise divided between the ingrained dogmas of their international and class catechism and the anxiety for what was, after all, their own native Russia. And perhaps, in his weakness of will and logic, the most tragic incarnation of this duality was Kierensky, the chief and the nominee of the democracy. First he would call for sacrifices, for a non-party spirit, for unity, then he would threaten, I will put a limit to the tendency to use the great calamity of Russia as a weapon against the interests of the nation as a whole, and whatever ultimatums may be presented to me, I will manage to subdue them to the supreme authority, and to myself, its supreme head. As the majority of the members of the state conference knew that Kornilov was becoming more and more persistent in his demands for the reorganization of the army, everyone understood these hints, and knew that the Premier's threats were directed against the Supreme Commander-in-Chief, and so the hearers, instead of uniting in one general burst of patriotism, as Kierensky himself demanded were divided between him and Kornilov. Hesitating between the bitter consciousness of the perilous situation and the obstinate prejudices of the revolutionary democracy, Kierensky could not bring the various tendencies of Russian public forces to anything like a united effort. The theatrical handshake which the representative of large industries gave in answer to Tsrikli's appeal to the bourgeoisie to make the same sacrifices as laboring democracy hardly deceived anyone. All knew that industry was ruined owing to the complete loss of discipline among the workmen, and that if industry could indeed be re-established, it was not by fine speeches, but by strong and wise measures. And, however strange it may be, yet in spite of the socialistic character of the noisy left-wing, political passions were aggravated not so much by social disputes, as by differences in the conceptions of victory, discipline, and liberty. It was in vain that the veterans of the revolution, Polekhanov, M. Breshko Breshkovskaya, and Kropotkin, called for good sense and unity. Polekhanov, the founder of Russian social democracy, protested against the isolation of the bourgeoisie, and tried to convince the proletariat that they should come to an agreement with the other classes, and not fight against them, as otherwise nothing will be left of Russia to the great delight of German capitalists. Kropotkin, the philosopher of anarchism, at once displeased the Soviet leaders by beginning his speech as follows, I join with those who have called upon the Russian people to cast loose from Zimwaldism once for all, and as one man, to stand up in defense of their country and the revolution. In my opinion Russia and the revolution are inseparable. If the Germans defeat us, the consequences of their victory will be so terrible, that even to mention it fills the mind with horror. In the speeches of the socialists of such groups socialistic ideology was united to sober statesmanship and warm patriotism. Their words met with no sympathy in that left wing which had practically already taken the power into its own hands. For appearance sake, both speakers were applauded, as a former revolutionary workers. Kropotkin was furiously applauded only when he proposed the immediate establishment of a republic. In spite of the general tension and excitement, the undoubted general desire not only to elucidate the position, 
but also to find some outlet, in spite of the readiness of many to lose their own souls, but at least to save their country, Kierinsky's words, the state conference, which sat three days, 25 th 28 th August, was to all thoughtful people an additional proof that the provisional government, and with it the whole of Russia, was at an impasse. It was time, not to deepen the revolution, but to check with a firm hand, to demand from the revolutionary democracy and the masses excited by its sacrifices in deeds, and not merely in words, to cast loose from socialistic romanticism, or else to drink the bitter cup of revolutionary experiment to the dregs. At this conference, it became clear that it was the Soviet, that is the socialist center, that was driving Russia to choose the second alternative. The Bolsheviks, who were already preparing the draft of Hemlock for Russia, were not present at the conference. The Socialist Center was acting independently of the Bolsheviks, even were in conflict with them. But the Bolsheviks, though absent from the conference, were carrying on a widespread agitation against it among the Moscow proletariat, especially among the town workmen, who threatened to stop the trams and cut off the electric light. The waiters in the refreshment bar of the opera house where the conference was held struck on the third day, and it was some other organization, if I mistake not, the Zemstvo Union, which hastily established a sort of soup kitchen in the theater. This ferment in the town among the masses, to whose support the Soviet politicians were always referring, naturally not only kept up their nervousness, but their aggressive attitude towards the proprietary elements of the conference. Striving to retain their waning popularity, they emphasized their differences both with the bourgeoisie and with the extremists. But this did not save their authority, nor did it save the masses from subsequent suffering. Nevertheless, a small group of Bolsheviks did come forward at the Moscow conference with a separate declaration, in which it was stated that the provisional government convened the Moscow conference in order to get new strength for a new campaign against all that had been won by the revolution. The Moscow Conference is a convenient opportunity for the counter-revolutionary executioners to come to an understanding about the organization of an all-Russian counter-revolutionary conspiracy. The proletariat will not allow the bourgeois oppressors to triumph. The proletariat will carry on the revolution to the end, will secure land for the peasants, and peace, bread, and liberty for the people. History has shown the real meaning of such promises as it has shown how many real executioners, savage and ruthless, were hidden among the ranks of the Bolsheviks themselves, only waiting for the moment when the people's want of organization and its trustfulness would enable them to wreak their fury on the unfortunate population of Russia. Chapter X Psychology of the Masses Industrial Anarchy https colon slash slash www.yamaguchi.com slash library slash tikava slash tikava underscore o nine dot html a Konovlev's resignation an appeal to the people's sense of duty deserves and demands intelligentsia and workman class war propaganda municipal elections and the new rulers the leaders and the crowd. The Moscow State Conference brought no relief to Russia. It only laid bare the conflict between the high command of the army and the government, and the awful state of the country whose destiny was linked with that of Kierinsky's weak and ambiguous cabinet. Of course these were only partial ties, for by the time the domination of the masses, dreamed of and proclaimed by the socialists, became ever more apparent. From the very first days of the revolution agitators and propagandists of the left invaded villages, factories, and the army disseminating the abstract arguments of programs ratified at socialistic congresses whose members stood more often than not remote from real life. This propaganda was founded upon two principles, class war and the transfer of power to the laboring masses, that is the proletariat, to whom were often added the peasants a class who in Russia are landowners with a variety of forms of tenure. Russia being essentially an agricultural country, the principal motto became all land to the people. All liberty to the people was added, but the second part of the sacred formula had far less effect upon the masses. Even factory workers in Russia had not completely severed their ties with their native village, and now they dreamed of a return to the land promised to them by the new authorities. There was, 
However, no need for them to hasten back to the country. They were prospering in town. Shortly after the March Revolution an eight hours day was summarily introduced in all industries, the workmen refusing to admit either piecework or a minimum of output. Factories engaged in war work, municipal works, railway workshops, transport the whole apparatus of national economics seemed paralyzed. The workmen's demands rose to fabulous proportions, while the efficiency of labor steadily declined. At the same time, the latent mistrust of workmen towards their employers and the entire skilled staff, from managers down to engineers and even doctors, was being artificially fostered. The industrial commanding staff was passing through the same humiliations and even the same dangers as the commanding staff of the army. It could not now be affirmed that all talk of the inefficiency of labor at munition factories, of a terrible decline in the productivity of national labor, were but the calumnious attacks of the bourgeoisie according to Zretli's oft repeated assertions in the Soviet. When called to the ministry, the socialists realized the stern truth of the bourgeois warnings. How could it be otherwise, when the industrial centers of Moscow and Petrograd, as well as the Donitz coal region the sole purveyor of fuel for factories, railways, and cities were becoming a prey to anarchy, furious, at times bloody, slaying all industrial output. Long before the enthronement of the Bolsheviks the productivity of mines and factories had been impaired, transport disorganized, the food supply dislocated. Workmen, unaccustomed to intelligent discipline and lacking strong moral or professional traditions, destroyed all industry with childish blindness. In vain did the bourgeois and the right socialistic press warn the worker that by ruining industry they in the long run ruined themselves. The Moscow factory owners, members of the Union of Commerce and Industry, presented reports to the government, pointing out Russia's rapid economic ruin. The same was more than once repeated by engineering and technical unions. The Minister of Commerce and Industry, A. Konovlev, in his speech at a meeting of factory owners in Moscow, pointed out the dangerous forms assumed by class war, if the leaders of the Soviet fail to control the movement and direct it into the channel of legal class struggle, we shall witness a complete paralysis of the country's economic life and scores of years must elapse before these ruins can be rebuilt. Moscow labor organizations responded to his speech with angry protests and the customary epithet of bourgeois. A. Konovlev was indeed a big owner of cotton mills. Able and ambitious, he was alert to realize the claims of the present moment, and not only met the demands of his employees, but often forestalled them. As member of the Duma, he was a leader of the Progressive Party. He entered the government as a member of the left, and at first was in close friendship with Kierensky. Much later, towards the autumn of 1917, A. Konovlev joined the Cadet Party. But his leanings to the left did not protect him from furious attacks on the part of the socialistic press, which explained his activity by his bourgeois origin, although the Minister of Labor, M. Skoplev, against whom A. Konovlev was obliged to struggle, was, like the latter, also a millionaire. All this ended in a uh, Konovlev's resigning his post on 2nd June, in spite of all Prince Lvov's and the other ministers' attempts to retain him. He was the third minister to resign from the first government created by the revolution. According to the papers, A. Konovlev proffered very definite motives for his resignation. He did not consider it possible to remain at the post of Minister of Commerce and Industry when industry was being destroyed. A. Konovlev completely approved of the government's financial measures, the raising of the income tax, and the direct taxation of excess profits, etc. He also supported arbitration, collective tariffs, and a whole series of the measures that constituted the minimum program of the Social Democratic Party but he disapproved of the proposed system of government control and regulation of production, considering this a device for getting rid of experienced men and disorganizing industry. According to A. Konovlev the government was powerless to re-establish broken discipline owing to its lack of authority. Therefore, he had lost all faith in the government's work and held that he no longer had any right to participate in it. 
his step was severely criticized by the left and by the center of the revolutionary democracy, the Soviet. They considered it an indication of mere bourgeois willingness to deepen the revolution, a favorite catchword which expressed the ever-growing craving for a general upheaval. But economics cannot be built upon phraseology, however revolutionary. They take their own implacable course. A month after Konovlev's resignation the Minister of Labor, M. Skoplev, he who at the beginning of his career as a statesman had sent a wireless declaration to the world at large announcing the intention of the socialist ministers to deepen class war, who in one of his first ministerial speeches had promised to place factory owners under a press, now spoke a language entirely different. Using other words, and seasoning his remarks with flattering addresses to the comrades, he was actually compelled to endorse the opinion of his antagonist, the bourgeois Konovlev. In July, Skoplev found himself obliged to issue an appeal to all Russian workmen, beginning with the stern warning Workmen, comrades, I appeal to you at a critical period of the revolution. Industrial output is rapidly declining, the quantity of necessary manufactured articles is diminishing. The peasants are deprived of industrial supplies, we are threatened with fresh food complications and increasing national destitution. He points out further that the revolutionary authority of the provisional government submits national economics to state regulation and control. It has created the chief economic committee, which must resolutely direct all branches of national economics. However, this committee can only accomplish its task with the assistance of the workmen themselves. The success of the struggle against economic devastation depends upon the productivity of labor. During the Tsarist regime the workmen's situation was one of intolerable oppression. The new government had issued laws providing for stern taxation of large incomes and war profits. Still the people's money thus garnered ought to be carefully spent. The revolution has swept away the oppression of the police regime, which stifled the labor movement, and the liberated working class is enabled to defend its economic interests by the mere force of its class solidarity and unity. They possess the freedom of strikes, they have professional unions, which can adapt the tactics of a mass economic movement, according to the conditions of the present economic crisis. However, at present purely elemental tendencies are gaining the upper hand over organized movement, and without regard to the limited resources of the state, and without any reckoning as to the state of the industry in which you are employed, and to the detriment of the proletarian class movement, you sometimes obtain an increase of wages which disorganizes the enterprise and drains the exchequer. Frequently the workmen refuse all negotiations and by menace of violence force the gratification of their demands. They use violence against officials and managers, dismiss them of their own accord, interfere arbitrarily with the technical management and even attempt to take the whole enterprise into their own hands. The Ministry of Labor insisted that all conflicts should be solved not arbitrarily, but in arbitration courts and conciliation councils. Workmen. Comrades, our socialistic ideals shall be attained not by the seizure of separate factories, but by a high standard of economic organization, by the intelligence of the masses, and the wide development of the country's productive forces. The appeal ends, workmen, comrades, remember not only your rights, but also your duties, think not only of your wishes, but of the possibilities of granting them, not only of your own good but of the sacrifices necessary for the consolidation of the revolution and the triumph of our ideals, 10th July. Thus, having at last realized at what a pace liberated Russia was sliding down a dangerous incline of licentious appetites and utter negation of all discipline, the socialists, now become ministers, began to remind the masses of their duties, if not to their country, then at least to the revolution. But, like the soldier who openly declared to Kierensky that he would rather be a living deserter than a dead hero, the workmen remained deaf to this new and disagreeable exigency of their leaders. The transition from limitless praise of the laboring masses, of their intelligence, maturity, and so on, to any kind of criticism proved extremely difficult. Moreover, here, as in the task of organizing defense or creating the new government, the policy of the Soviet was full of contradictions, 
reflecting both a variety of sectional vacillations and the struggle between a dogmatic application of socialism and the more opportunist tendencies of the right. For instance, on 3rd August, at the very climax of the military and government crisis, the economic section of the Soviet found it necessary to present an inquiry concerning the government's economic policy and demanding the granting of the rights of state authority to local organizations, formed according to the principles of revolutionary democracy. Replying to this demand, Skoplev acknowledged that local organizing power was in advance of the central authorities, but he insisted that regional organs, whether elected or unelected, should be subordinated to the central authorities. Economic conditions proved themselves to be the sensitive apparatus which most exactly marked the general dislocation of the state organism. How true were the words of those who had said that transport and the entire national economy were a prey to a diseased spirit? Russia possessed grain, possessed food supplies, raw material, even labor was sufficient. But that inner organizing link, which joins separate human lives into a strong and well-ordained human society, had snapped. The old compulsory forms of a community which had created the great Russian Empire had disappeared, having outlived themselves and being incapable of adapting themselves to the new demands of the times, or of resisting the enemy's blows. The ideologists of democracy thought that old forms might at a moment's notice be replaced by new ones. Boundlessly free, erected apart from any ties of succession with old forms of life and custom, upon a bare abstract framework. In their haste to imbue the masses with socialistic doctrines, the orators spoke to them of rights and claims, but forgot to tell them of their duties. Soldiers and soldiers' wives, street sweepers and engine drivers, medical assistants and porters all presented nothing but demands, demands, and demands. The revolutionary democracy encouraged such exigency, viewing it as the expression of human personality freed from oppression, and absolutely forgetting that human dignity consists not so much in receiving life's bounties as in giving one's best to life. Innumerable trade unions, organized in haste and falling at once under Bolshevist influence, also presented the most devastating claims to the state, to municipalities and to private business. At first they scarcely ever met with any refusal. As early as April the Minister of Ways and Communications, Nekrasov, sanctioned such claims of the railwaymen as played an important part in the deterioration of the railways, for they ruined the finances without demanding a fixed output of work, and gave up the management to the mercy of committees. A month after the revolution foremen in various workshops began to receive wages of 700-800 rubles a month, while professional engineers were left with their former salaries of 300-400 rubles. Only the Russian intelligentsia remained silent in the midst of this bacchanalia of demands. School teachers, who received pittances, passed resolutions that new advances of salaries should be extremely moderate in order not to overburden the revolutionary treasury. Officers and government officials were also silent, although the frightful increase in the cost of living placed them in a most precarious material situation. There is no exaggeration in saying that not a single union of intellectual workers ever presented material demands. Later, when this insane lust had borne its bitter fruit, when the socialist ministers had come into touch with the state mechanism and realized that the state and people are inseparable, they attempted to disabuse the masses. But it was too late. The more so, as socialistic programs do not provide for the value of brain work, and everything in them is based upon the priority of manual workers over the rest of the population. Marx spoke only of the rights of proletarian dictatorship while the rest of humanity was placed in interdict under the prejudicial title of bourgeoisie. Faithful followers of Marx's doctrine considered it their duty to discredit all the intelligentsia in the eyes of the Russian masses by confusing it with the bourgeoisie. Tremendous discontent had accumulated amidst the people during the old regime. The implacable Marxist gospel preached by the revolutionaries transformed this legitimate and natural discontent into a veritable exasperation, directed against the propertied and educated classes, 
which had themselves suffered from absolutism and were now condemned by a new ruling class to pay for the sins of its predecessors. Strictly speaking, the Russian Revolution, that is the revolutionary struggle against autocracy for the freedom and rights of the people, had lasted scores of years, and had created thousands of heroes and martyrs, who had given their energy and life for the realization of their ardently desired ideals. A vast majority of the revolutionaries belonged to the nobility and the bourgeoisie merely because there were more educated people among those classes. But when the longed for days of freedom came at last, all this was forgotten and the entire superior strata of society were placed under suspicion. At first, indeed, the masses and their soldiers were extremely good natured. The wave of hatred did not sweep over Russia all at once, but burst out sporadically here and there directed by some evil hand. In any case the revolution was not the outcome of class antagonism. It was born of the war, the famine and the debility of the old political regime. This is a fact which ought always to be borne in mind in order to comprehend the influence of the subsequent class war propaganda. A wonderful solidarity among all classes of the community marked the beginning of the revolution. Everyone sided with freedom against Tsarism. Only the police endeavored to defend the old regime. And the policemen were indeed cruelly dealt with. But they were usually seized fully armed, while handling machine guns, and firing at the crowd by order of Protopopov. This shooting lasted in Petrograd for four days. When the last machine gun policemen were removed from the belfry of Street Isaac's Cathedral, a new and highly original order prevailed in the city. There were no police. Only the somewhat comical figures of a hastily organized militia appeared here and there. There were no authorities whatever. Day and night the streets were seething with soldiers. Whole units rolled into the Toraida Palace to save the revolution. External forces which might hold back these crowds no longer existed. And yet, not only during the revolutionary honeymoon, but actually for several months, life in the large cities was almost perfectly safe in spite of the fierce propaganda of class war and the shameless incitement of the masses against the bourgeoisie, which embraced all persons with white hands. This Marxist molding of the masses emanated from the Soviet. The masses seemed to feel that they were being driven to a dangerous course and did not give way at once. Even in the country, where, as in the towns, all the police were immediately arrested and sent to the front, where no new authorities were established to replace the old. The peasants at first assumed an expectant attitude. The expression, we'll just wait for the new law, was a current phrase, which reflected the peasants' habitual wariness. And they actually did wait. They cast longing glances at the landowner's land, cattle and other goods, but abstained from plunder, awaiting the order from the center. Then appeared agitators, sometimes Bolsheviks, but more often social revolutionaries with mandates from the Petrograd or local Soviet, and explained to the peasants that they had nothing to wait for, but must hasten to execute the will of the people and expropriate the expropriators, that is, take everything from the landowners. It was just as difficult for peasants to withstand such arguments as it had been for soldiers to maintain discipline after the order number one. Gradually the Russian countryside was turned into a veritable hell. Landowners' houses, corn stacks, stables, cattle sheds all were set ablaze. Their owners were turned out, sometimes murdered. Already, before the November Revolution, some districts had not a single landowner left. Large landowners who exploited their land by hired labor were not the only ones to suffer, millions of peasant smallholders and merely well-to-do peasants shared the same fate. The deepening of class consciousness, or rather, of class antagonism, went full swing. But the creation of a new life upon such basis proved no easy matter, instead of a new, perfect, Free order there was a return to the old primitive forms of cave dwellers, when homini hominis lupusist, when each strove to snatch the utmost he could get for himself, sacrificing nothing for the community. 
all the moral foundations erected at such hard cost by generations were smashed like brittle glass beneath the blows of the soulless theory of economic materialism. Liberty, unfettered either by law or by a habit of self-discipline, unbridled the masses, while the socialistic intelligentsia seemed to sanction the increasing immorality by decking it out in the attire of class struggle. Whatever were the errors and even crimes of the masses, the responsibility for them rests primarily with their leaders. With passionate conscientiousness the masses endeavored to unravel the chaos of novel ideas which had flooded their obscure brains. For even the words were utterly incomprehensible and un-Russian, republic, contribution, annexation, internationalism, socialism. To what curious misinterpretation were those strange words subjected, which were destined to upset the entire Russian life? But even Russian words expressing general notions, not only political, but even geographical, held absolutely no meaning for the illiterate peasants, workmen, and soldiers gathered at meetings or in the Soviets. They were so willing to repudiate Constantinople and the Straits without the slightest notion of their whereabouts. They adopted the resolution in favor of the self-determination of peoples, with no inkling as to what nationalities inhabited the Russian Empire, and so on. The chaotic mentality of the crowd made itself particularly evident during the elections. Universal suffrage had been adopted both by the cadets and the socialists as an essential basis of democracy but there existed very important divergencies. Shall the army vote? What is to be the qualification of age and residence? The cadets insisted that the age limit should be fixed at 25, and that the vote should be granted to anyone who had lived a year in a given locality. The revolutionary democracy demanded that the vote should be granted to all citizens of both sexes from the age of 18 without any qualification as to term of residence and that full rights should be given to soldiers both at the front and in the rear. In the end the government accepted the socialist formula, only raising the age limit. All citizens of both sexes over 20 years obtained the right of voting in municipal and Zemstvo elections, and subsequently for the constituent assembly. During the summer new municipal councils were elected in almost every town upon the principle of universal suffrage. The government cherished naive hopes of obtaining in this way legally elected local organs, which would relegate the Soviets to the background. The election results were highly instructive. In the towns, where reserve regiments were quartered, the soldiers' vote decided the elections. Whole military units, influenced by this or the other socialistic group, voted for it en bloc. The soldier masses, more and more transformed through loss of discipline into a soldier able, developed a somewhat original understanding of their new civic rights. Liberty of election was encroached upon at every turn. Acts of violence, degenerating ever more frequently into crime, were constantly performed. For instance, at the beginning of August, in the small district town of Igorovsk, after a meeting addressed by a Bolshevik, Cohen, a crowd of soldiers severely handled the mayor and a member of the municipal council for their refusal to give out election forms to 1,000 soldiers who had arrived in town after the publication of the electors register. Side by side with cases of direct violence, the electors were being systematically terrorized, particularly in the factories, where the committees acted despotically and the workmen were compelled to join certain parties for fear of remaining out of work. The profusion of promises, which always forms the negative side of every election campaign, reached its climax in the face of the inexperienced and overconfident Russian electors. The magic words peace, bread, and land were bandied about by all socialist sections. They promised and possibly many believed in it themselves a speedy millennium. Their speeches, though frequently exceedingly abstract, were very realistically interpreted. When the revolutionary socialists carried at the Moscow municipal elections a victory at which they themselves were alarmed, many people jokingly said that it happened owing to the list of social revolutionary candidates being labeled number three. In Russian the figure three and the letter Z are written the same way, and the magic word Zemlya, land, begins with the letter Z.
the more simple-minded electors used to come to the town hall to inquire when the land would be distributed to them, as they had voted for the social revolutionaries, who promised land to all toilers. On the whole, the almost illiterate mass of Russian electors, both men and women devoid of any political experience, exhibited such a gregarious state of mind, such a lack of comprehension, and such a childish desire to obtain the utmost advantage for themselves, that bitter doubt as to whether universal suffrage could benefit a country at Russia's stage of political development, crept into many minds. Under such wholesale infatuation the socialists everywhere obtained the majority, and the social revolutionaries headed the list. Still, the cadets scored an average of one-third of the total votes, and in some places had an absolute majority. The first result of the socialist control of the municipal and Zemstva councils was a complete financial disorganization of these institutions, already impoverished by the war. Of course there could be no question of abuse. On the contrary, the socialists were influenced by a sincere desire to conduct business in the best possible way. Contrary to the Bolsheviks, the revolutionary democracy undoubtedly possessed practical honesty. I say practical because, bound by doctrine, they could not afford the luxury of intellectual honesty, but municipal economy is, primarily, a huge business enterprise. Its stability is based upon a wise distribution and payment of labor, and the discipline of the workers. The socialists, accustomed to consider the state as a principle opposed to their ideals, entered the government and local institutions, not so much as citizens entrusted with the guarding of the entire population's interests, but as conquerors occupying a fallen citadel. They forgot that they represented the population as a whole and not only met all the workmen's demands halfway, but often prompted their exigencies. In their haste to redress the social injustices of the old regime, they upset all existing relations at one stroke, and overwhelmed the workmen with bounties at the expense of a treasury already ruined by war. Just as in the army the soldier was put to the top, while the commanding staff was not only set aside but humiliated, so in the industrial army manual workmen enjoyed all the privileges and became the objects of coarse flattery, whereas brain workers were set aside and placed under suspicion. The economic life of large cities like Petrograd, Moscow, Kiev, Kharkov, and others became disorganized. Trams barely crawled along, because the workmen, while receiving wages for an eight hours day in the repair shops, had nevertheless almost ceased to repair the cars. It is curious to note that the electric power stations, whose staff is by far the most highly trained, remained in perfect order. The municipal councils also adopted an extremely unreasonable food policy. Instead of being ameliorated, the food supply grew worse. This may be primarily explained by the fact that the supply was influenced by the general disorganization of transport and labor output. Loaders at wharves and stations, pointsmen, train linkers, packers in a word, millions of men working at the food supply ceased day by day to perform their duties. The cost of their collective idleness to the state and nation probably never entered their heads. Yet owing to their slackness the arrival of food supplies to the towns and the northern timber regions daily diminished. But neither individual workers nor collective labor organizations took heed of the nation's interests, and merely supported their own professional advantages. At one of the largest Volga ports, Zaritsyn, where corn was shipped for the whole of northern Russia, enormous supplies of grain lay rotting, because Russian loaders had struck, continually raising prices. 50 rubles a day were already insufficient. In the meantime they opposed by armed force a company of Persian loaders, who were willing to work at more moderate terms. At the same time, the new food supply committees, organized throughout the country, followed a policy of arbitrary interference in the industrial and economic life of the country, placing fatal obstacles in the way of private initiative and private commerce. The Tsar's government had also acted in the same manner in some branches, such as the purchase and distribution of grain. Such measures were called for by war circumstances, 
but they demanded strong government authority and national discipline. The provisional government, apparently expecting such self discipline from a people liberated from an autocratic regime, augmented state intervention in all sections of the supply of primary necessities. The socialists, who always advocated the centralization of all economic functions in government hands, particularly insisted upon such measures. But the cadet ministers also followed the same course in spite of protests from a section of the party. Already towards midsummer of 1917, bread, sugar, meat, eggs, and butter were controlled by the government, although, strictly speaking, it did not even possess the proper apparatus for effecting such a monopoly. Both producers and consumers suffered equally, particularly in the large towns. Petrograd and Moscow were even then short of food. The privations endured by the population at the present moment are but a painful protraction of a long agony. In 1917 the advanced section of the Russian intelligentsia, which found itself playing the part of municipal rulers, was firmly convinced that the organization of food supply would be impossible without replacing private commercial interchange by that of state monopoly. The results were deplorable. Ironical tongues said that it was an organization of famine, not of food supply. But here, as elsewhere, the power of doctrine proved stronger than the voice of reality. The Russian Revolution will provide the social psychologist with extremely interesting studies of the psychology of the masses and their leaders, while it must serve as a clear warning to the politician. It is a cruel object lesson, demonstrating that a life of complete liberty, unfettered by any compulsory system, may only be possible to man after he attains the highest degree of culture. Does there exist anywhere in the world a nation which as a whole has attained such a standard? When this compulsion does not exist, then the evil charms of the dark instincts of hatred, lust, and cruelty arise from the depths. Yet at the same time the very state of impunity creates a kind of oppressive irritation among the masses as though the consciousness of wrong lay hidden in the people's soul and begat exasperation. And in Russia this exasperation did not diminish, but grew in proportion to the satisfaction of the demands of the masses. Evidently their inner equilibrium was broken by degrees, as the habits of effort, compulsion, and obedience to duty gave way. Like children, they longed for someone, wiser and stronger than they, to say, this cannot be, you dare not do it. But no authoritative voice spoke out to them, and, like children, they fell a prey to blind rage. Two principles seemed to be at war with each other in the soul of the Russian people, as they listened to the voices of their new leaders the lust of usurpation and the consciousness that there is no truth in violence. One may boldly assert that, despite all the crimes committed by the mob, the masses were more innocent and better than their leaders particularly the peasant masses, in whose midst the deep, partly religious, partly moral conceptions of good and evil were still alive, whose balance had not been overstrained by the deadening roar of the factory wheel, nor their conscience stunned by the still more deadening Marxist doctrine. In the midst of the working classes themselves, the voices of separate individuals or organized groups sometimes made themselves heard reminding men of the interests of the whole, of the existence of Russia, whom everyone was bound to serve. But the revolutionary democracy was incapable either of hearkening to these voices or, still less, of uniting all such patriots in common service for the country. For the Soviet leaders had so long considered themselves as the servants, not of Russia but of the revolution and the proletariat. A resolution passed by the staff of one of the railway workshops in the province of Saratov may be pointed out as an example of workmen's honest adherence to their duty. Early in September Moscow Bolsheviks endeavored to provoke a strike. The workmen passed a resolution to the effect that they considered a strike of the engine staff as inadmissible, criminal, treasonable, and contradictory to civic duty. Officials and workmen adjure comrades to refuse to strike and summon them to self-restraint. This was not the only case, but those who preached self-restraint were by no means popular. Not even the unembellished picture, honestly drawn by the government at the Moscow conference, 
could change the mentality of the leaders or the representatives of the popular masses present at the conference as delegates of the Soviet. They were simply incapable of realizing how far their behavior, their immature ideas, their support of this or the other group, reacted upon the destiny of the state. And this, although all that the members of the government said was ruthless in its absolute clearness. The new Minister of Commerce and Industry, a well known economist of the Marxist school, S. Prokopovich, in a warning speech delivered at the state conference, spoke of the disorganization of transport and trade. He said that the Dunitz coal mines were producing only 50% of their normal output, that the disorderly seizure of land was ruining agriculture and threatening the towns and northern provinces with famine. He reminded the workmen that all classes of the population were interested in industrial developments consumers and producers businessmen and workmen, and therefore it behoved them to safeguard industry, not to ruin it. He was applauded both from right and left, perchance by the very same men who drove out engineers in wheelbarrows or threw them into blazing furnaces. In the same way they applauded the Minister of Finance, Nekrasov, although the picture drawn by him of the state of Russian finances was of the gloomiest. The new revolutionary regime costs the state far more than did the old, was the minister's frank statement. Nekrasov started his career as an octobrist, then remained for a long time in the cadet party, which he left in connection with the Ukraine problem, as he supported the policy of Ukraine independence. Already before the revolution he had entered into close relations with circles of the left. In the provisional government he sided with Kierinsky and had great influence with him. Combined with Nekrasov's skill and inclination for upholding good relations with sections of the left, his statement concerning the cost of the democratic regime carried a special weight. Using the language of figures, the Minister of Finance proved that the cost of democracy to the people was beyond comparison heavier than that of autocracy. The new food supply committees alone, organized after the revolution, will demand from the Treasury 500 millions a year. Whereas during the Tsarist regime the upkeep of all the ministries cost 48 millions. In some regions the payment of state revenues had decreased by 60 to 70 percent. Meantime, the Soviet Commission dealing with separation allowances for soldiers' wives had drawn up a scheme for such a liberal increase of allowances that instead of the former 700 millions a year, the expenditure would reach 11 milliards. And yet, when after such a speech, Kierinsky summoned everyone to make sacrifices for the motherland, disdainful smiles of mistrust flitted over the countenances of the members of the Soviet, the workmen, and the soldiers who filled the left sector of the theater. The right the bourgeoisie section applauded far more lustily. Certainly not because the Russian bourgeoisie as such proved more altruistic, and the Russian democracy more selfish, but simply because proprietary Russia had accumulated far more knowledge and understanding of statesmanship than the masses of the people. Men who have passed through a university or secondary school training can more easily realize the necessity of a strict state system and general submission to laws, however irksome, than those who have never learned to lift their eyes from the narrow groove into which they were born. Instead of adopting a firm statesmanlike standing and endeavoring to explain to the people the active possibilities and claims of real life, those who assumed the part of inspirers and spiritual leaders of these illiterate masses, unused to thinking, were themselves tossed between Marxism and flashes of common sense. The state conference exhibited the results of such duality. The question of the formation in one way or another of a strong power, a power which not only gives but claims, and if necessary chastises, arose in all its tragic inevitableness. This was realized by both sides. The main point of the divergency lay in the question as to who should be the mainstay of this power the Soviets or a disciplined military force. The dispute was settled, settled irrevocably, by the sharp rupture between Kornilov and Kierinsky. Chapter Kskrinsky's swan song Soviet strength towards Bolshevism a fall of Riga Lav Kornilov and the Kornilov affair arrest of generals and chaos in the army Trotsky's appearance the democratic conference the Soviets opposed to the coalition government the council of the republic the Bolsheviks organize an insurrection. Beginning from March and ending with November, 
the revolutionary democracy grouped in the Soviet was all the time sliding towards the left, like a sand hill washed away by the waves. Already in Moscow, the motion passed by the left majority, and their persecution of proprietary Russia and the army commanders, their cowardly disinclination to acknowledge the real requirements of life, especially in questions of food supply and labor their friendship with their brethren in ideas the Bolsheviks all this showed that the Soviet circles were prepared to make concessions only to the left. They were likewise driven in the same direction by their former trend of thought, and especially by the success of Bolshevist propaganda among the masses, the ground for which had been prepared by the socialistic center itself. During the Moscow conference the Bolsheviks stirred up disorders in that city, taking the form of a series of strikes which were partly successful, though some were quickly suppressed. The influence of the Bolsheviks over the Soviets was likewise growing, as the bulk of the latter consisted of persons of indefinite and unstable political opinions. In the Petrograd Soviet and the Executive Committee the former leaders Skoplev, Tsretli, Shides no longer exercised their former influence. On the 11th of September Prince Tsretli had a battle royal with the Petrograd Soviet before he succeeded in securing the adoption of the resolution on the necessity for the introduction of capital punishment in the army, his opponents stigmatizing this as a counter-revolutionary measure. The furious debate showed the acute divergence of opinions in the Soviet. Prince Tsretli bitterly emphasized the fact that the Bolsheviks, who were chiefly to blame for the decay of the army, listened to communications concerning military disorders with the proud air of victors. The resolution concerning capital punishment was passed with great difficulty. But, as if to conciliate the Bolsheviks, at the next meeting of the Soviet a motion was passed by a great majority, protesting against the Bolshevist comrades who had been arrested for the July revolt or their German associations being still detained in prison. Pelekhanov, in drawing attention to the increasing influence of the Bolsheviks in the Soviet, wrote, Tzretli has come to such measures as are an abjuration of Zimmerwald. Therefore his admirers are turning against him, are voting against his motion, and are ready to follow another leader, Yedinstvo, 8th September. This was written a few days before the Kornilov affair. Independently of this, after the Moscow conference, the Soviet policy took a decided turn to the left. And this in spite of the fact or perhaps because of it that the anarchistic ferment in the masses stirred up by the Bolsheviks began to assume such a dangerous character that Kerensky was obliged to concert with Kornilov decided measures against the expected insurrection. But when Kornilov began to make preparations for carrying out this plan, the government had not the courage to steer the ship of state in the right course or to strengthen their position with the help of the troops who were still loyal. The actual Bolshevist danger, which was already in sight, seemed less terrible to the government than the imagined danger of Kornilov's military dictatorship. Fears of the same imaginary danger left the socialists of the center quite oblivious of the fact that German troops were occupying the whole of the western borderland of Russia, and were threatening at any time to strike at its heart. Surely it is not necessary that Riga should fall in order that the need for discipline in the army should be understood? This was said by Kornilov, five days before the fall of Riga, when the commander-in-chief already knew that he was not able to hold the town, the capture of which, greatly increasing the difficulty of defending the Gulf of Finland, opened for the Germans the way to Petrograd both by land and sea but it turned out that even the capture of Riga did not knock any wholesome sense of the necessity of national self-defense into revolutionary democracy. The official communique mentioned that the regiments left the battlefield of their own accord, that the disorganized masses are retreating in an irresistible torrent, and are filling all the roads. The Soviet replied by long speeches of protest against the enemies of the revolution who never fail to take advantage of the misfortune at the front in order to play a great political game. The Izvestia accused the authors of the official communique of a malicious distortion of actual events. The general headquarters notice only the reckless gallantry of the officers, while their silence as regards the soldiers, the emphasizing of exceptional cases of treachery and cowardice among them, acquires a very definite and very dangerous meaning.
It is evident that while the army is fighting gallantly and is dying for the cause of the revolution, a clique of shady persons, unusually near to the higher commanding circles, is carrying on a hideous provocation, and by means of systematic lies and a perversion of facts is setting Russia against her army, and is taking advantage of the misfortune which has befallen the country for sinister purposes with the design of throwing discredit on the revolutionary order in the army of setting the masses of the population, both at home and abroad, against the Russian Revolution, is Vestia, 4th September. With the Soviet majority in such a mood, vain were Prince Zretli's belated demands for the reintroduction of capital punishment into the army, and vain was the still more belated order issued by Kierensky in which he at last declared that it was necessary to support the authority of the officers, who made no demands, who never made any representations of their needs. The flower of the army, its officers, had lived through the bloodless revolution in fraternal unity with the soldiers, consolidating the work of those who had thrown off the shameful fetters of slavery. The officers have shown that they are one flesh with the people. Then followed a short enumeration of all the undeserved trials which had fallen to the lot of the officers, distrust, curtailment of rights, insults, mockery. In spite of all, the officers had remained at their posts, had shown the greatest heroism, manifested by the fact that in some units almost all the officers had been killed off. No less courage had been shown by those officers who, hand in hand with the committees and the more intelligent soldiers, had struggled against those who understood liberty to mean freedom from moral obligations, who had fallen under the evil influence of the conscious or unconscious agents of the Kaiser, and, hiding their cowardice under ideal watchwords, were bringing ruin and treachery into the ranks of the army. 4th September. Had Kierensky used such language in addressing the representatives of the whole of organized Russia, gathered together at the state conference in Moscow in August? Perhaps it might have arrested the ruin of the army, it might have healed the breach between the government and the army commanders. Only by joint action could they have saved Russia from Bolshevist anarchy and the ruin of the army. Such an agreement seems all the more possible, as the Supreme Commander in Chief, Kornilov, round whom the most experienced generals had gathered, was, of course, no counter revolutionary, that is to say, was in no wise striving to restore the old regime. The son of a Transbaikal Cossack, Lav Kornilov was a real Democrat by birth. At the age of 13, he was still herding cows in the sleepy hollow of a Siberian village. Thanks to his exceptional abilities, he made his way, finishing his course of studies in the high school and entering the army as an officer. In Russia, officers did not form a caste open only to the gentry, as in Prussia but anyone with a certain amount of education might get a commission. On finishing at the military academy of the general staff, Kornilov went to Turkestan and wrote some interesting works on this picturesque and remote region, and secured a great influence over the natives, having learned the Turkoman language. This acquaintanceship proved to be of great service to him later, after he was arrested. The Tech Turkoman regiment treated him less as a prisoner to be guarded than as a chief to be protected. During the war, Kornilov commanded a division. In Galicia, in the Carpathians, his division had to cover the retreat of the whole Russian army. For three days, they withstood the pressure of greatly superior forces, and it was only thanks to their steadiness and heroism that the army escaped with its artillery, munitions, and material. Almost the whole division perished. Kornilov was wounded and taken prisoner. He managed to escape from prison, disguised as a beggar. In this he was aided by his knowledge of languages, and probably also by his exceedingly democratic appearance, for he had nothing of the general about him. After the revolution Kornilov was appointed commander-in-chief of the troops of the Petrograd district, but he did not occupy this post for long as he could not permit the Petrograd Soviet to interfere in his military orders. He was then appointed to command an army, and after Alexov's resignation he was made supreme commander-in-chief of the whole army. Kornilov was a brave soldier, well-educated, honest, and upright. 
As a fervent patriot he knew and perceived all the defects of the Tsarist regime, and understood that a return to the old order was not only impossible but even undesirable for Russia. Kornilov was not opposed to the democratization of the army, but he said that an army which had lost its discipline was more dangerous than any wild beast, and strove to reorganize the army in such a way that respect for the soldier's person should be compatible with the demands of discipline. At the Moscow State Conference, Kornilov declared, I am not against army committees. In his scheme of army reforms he again said plainly that the committees must not interfere in matters of strategy or discipline, but must still be retained for purely economic questions. It is surprising how little these new elective institutions have diverged from the straight path, and how often they have lived up to the ideal, sealing their gallant work with blood. These words are the best refutation of the accusations and suspicions of the left who were alarmed at Kornilov's growing popularity. Patriots had great hopes of his influence for Russia, hopes doomed, alas, to a tragic disappointment. The fear of a counter-revolution, which reigned not only in the Smolny Institute, whither the Soviet had migrated, but also in the Winter Palace, where Kierensky had taken up his abode prevented the possibility of any agreement between the premier and the military commanders. The strained relations, so full of mutual distrust, ended in a catastrophe the details of which await the historian. In order to sift this matter calmly and impartially it is necessary to know all the preliminary negotiations, to re-establish that chaos of conflicting influences, intrigues, and chance occurrences, which, like a net, enveloped the inexperienced ministers, who could nowhere find serious support. The general position was as follows, on the 9th of September there was a rumor all over Petrograd that General Kornilov was marching on the city in order to arrest the Soviet, and declare himself dictator. On the 10th of September the newspapers announced that Vladimir Lvov https colon slash slash www.yamaguchi.com slash library slash tikova slash tikova underscore ten dot html had come to Kierensky and, in the name of General Kornilov, the headquarters in Mohilev, had demanded that all civil and military authority should be placed in the hands of the general and a new cabinet be formed. This is how subsequent events are described by Boris Savinkov, the revolutionary then acting as Minister of War. According to his account, among the members of the officers' union there was a group of men who were conspiring to overthrow the government, and to make General Kornilov dictator. This was being done without Kornilov's knowledge. General Kornilov, who was considered to be a loyal citizen, was at the same time dissatisfied with the weakness of the government policy, and insisted on the necessity of an exceedingly powerful, revolutionary authority, in which I also agreed with him. When, on the 5th 6th of September, at headquarters I again told him that in the near future the provisional government would examine the bill which was being prepared by the order of the Prime Minister, for the measures to be taken at the base, he believed that the government was no longer hesitating, and when bidding me farewell on the 6th September at headquarters he declared that he would give his full support to the Prime Minister, for the good of the country. On my return to Petrograd I reported my conversations with General Kornilov to the Prime Minister, and on the evening of the 8th September the bill for legalizing measures at the base, that is severe penalties for breaches of discipline, was to have been examined by the provisional government. But on the 8th September I was summoned to the Winter Palace, and the Prime Minister told me something that was a complete surprise to me. He told me that Vien Lvov had come to him with an ultimatum from General Kornilov, who demanded that the supreme authority should be given over to the commander-in-chief with all military and civil power over the country, and that he, the commander-in-chief, was to form a cabinet in which I was to be minister of war and the prime minister was to be minister of justice. The ultimatum was in writing, but was signed, not by General Kornilov, but by Vienlvov himself. Then the premier called Kornilov up on the Hughes apparatus, and asked him without reading out to him the text of the declaration signed by Vienlvov whether he was ready to sign the ultimatum presented by Vienlvov. General Kornilov replied, Yes, I am ready to sign. On the same day, 
8th of September, the Prime Minister sent a telegram to General Kornilov at headquarters, demanding that Kornilov should immediately give up his post and leave the army. Https colon slash slash www.yamaguchi.com slash library slash tikiva slash tikiva underscore ten. Html thus a great deal of suspicion and this conversation over the telephone, perhaps based on a misunderstanding was sufficient for all communication between the Premier and the Commander-in-Chief of the Army to be broken off at once. Then followed a series of repressive measures against headquarters. An order was sent to all the railways not to obey the orders of the Commander-in-Chief, and above all, not to transport any troops by his orders. It was in vain that efforts were made by General Alexov, Mylyukov, Maklukov, and other public men, to act as intermediaries, to persuade the government first of all to inquire into the matter, and only then to decide the fate not only of a talented Russian general, but perhaps of the army itself. The government at once took decisive measures against Kornilov and other generals, who were defending Russia against Germany, such stern measures as it had not ventured to take against the Kronstadt sailors who in July had shot down peaceful inhabitants in the streets of Petrograd. On the 11th of September an order was given for the arrest of the insurgent general, who wanted to start a fratricidal war. This order was carried out. General Kornilov offered no resistance, and allowed himself to be arrested. Before his arrest, General Kornilov issued an order from headquarters, also dated 11th September, in which he declared that he never had any idea of becoming dictator, nor planned any insurrection or revolution, but had marched his cavalry on Petrograd in accordance with a preliminary agreement with Kierensky himself, who had wanted to have trustworthy troops at his disposal, as the Bolsheviks were again preparing for action. This was likewise corroborated by B. Savinkov's evidence, the movement of the cavalry corps towards Petrograd had been undertaken by order of the provisional government for the protection both of the government and of the Soviet, the representatives of which had in July been in no less danger than the ministers, reach. 29th of September 1917. In his last army order, issued at Mohilev on the 11th of September, General Kornilov explained the march of events to commanders, commissaries and elected organizations, and concluded the order with the following words, I pledge you my word of honor, as an officer and a soldier, and assure you once more that I, General Kornilov, the son of a simple Cossack peasant, have by my whole life and not in words only shown my unfailing devotion to my country and to freedom, that I am alien to any counter-revolutionary schemes whatever, that I stand on guard over the liberties we have, one, desiring only that the great Russian nation should continue to enjoy its independent existence. Kornilov's order did not get into the newspapers, which obtained their information and explanations only from government circles. The true meaning of this conflict, so fatal to Russia, was understood by the population only later, after the November catastrophe. After the lesson given by the Bolsheviks, many officers rushed to the Don territory, to enter Kornilov's volunteer army though in August they had believed him to be an enemy of the people. But for the higher officers the idea of Kornilov's being deprived of the supreme command was unthinkable. From the generals commanding the western, southwestern, and Romanian fronts came telegrams requesting Irinsky not to dismiss the supreme commander-in-chief, and expressing their complete solidarity with him. The most decisive opinion was formulated by the commander of the Southwestern Front, General Denikin, I am a soldier, and am not accustomed to beat about the bush. On the 29th of July at a conference with the members of the provisional government I declared that by a series of measures the government had destroyed and corrupted the army and trampled our martial banners in the mud. I interpreted the fact of my having been allowed to remain in the position of commander-in-chief as the avowal by the provisional government of its heavy sin before the motherland and its desire to amend the evil it had wrought. Today I have received the communication that General Kornilov, who has presented certain demands which may yet save the country and the army, is to be dismissed from the post of supreme commander-in-chief. Accepting this as a return of the authorities to the course of a deliberate destruction of the army, 
and therefore that of the country, I hold it my duty to announce to the provisional government that I will not follow the same course. Such were the thoughts and words of one of the most gifted of Russian military leaders. But Kierensky, having completely lost his head, was no longer capable of hearkening to the voice of wisdom and honor. By Kierensky's orders, Generals Kornilov, Denikin, Lukomsky, and others were arrested and tried as rebels, counter revolutionaries, and enemies of the people. They were in great danger, surrounded by soldiers whose minds had been inflamed by false rumors. Fortunately, However, when Kornilov was put into the Bikhov prison, he was surrounded by his faithful Turkomans, who protected not only him but also his fellow prisoners, officers who were members of the officers' union. Incomparably harder was the position of Generals Denikin, Markov, Erdli, and others, who had been arrested at Berdichev, headquarters of the Southwestern Front. They were in constant danger of being lynched. In order to save their lives, they were transferred to the same prison in which Kornilov was incarcerated. On the wavy, as they were being taken along, scenes occurred which were a foretaste of the subsequent Bolshevist massacres of officers. Neither Kierensky, who had appointed himself supreme commander in chief, nor the committees even attempted to protect the generals from insult by the soldiers. A mob of soldiers met the arrested generals and accompanied them to the railway station. They were not allowed to be taken in motor cars, but were forced to walk. On the way there were cries of take them through the mud. Let them churn it up with their general's feet. There was a shower of insults and coarse jokes. The soldiers shouted, Denikin, head up. Bring down your foot firmer. Look lively. Stones were thrown. General Orloff was wounded in the head. It was only the self-sacrifice of the military cadets who formed the escort that saved the arrested generals from being mishandled, although no one had any definite idea of what they were guilty. People merely repeated the accusations made by Kierensky enemies of the people and counter-revolutionaries. This took place much later, 16th of October. Before this, during the whole month, arrests were made among the military. An order was issued for the arrest of General K. Ledin, the Ataman, or chief, of the Don Cossacks. He was at Novokokosk, the capital of the Don territory, and the Cossacks refused to give him up. The arrest of Kornilov and other generals was the final step that led to the long impending breach between the whole of the army commanders and the leaders of Soviet circles. They spoke different languages, thought in different ways of the future of Russia and sooner or later a breach between these two parties was inevitable. The military, with Kornilov at their head, found themselves incapable of taking the power into their own hands. Patriotic people, both national socialists and large non-socialistic organizations, with the cadets at their head, were likewise unable to give headquarters the requisite political support. At the critical moment Kornilov found himself in the company of such petty political adventurers as Zavoyko and Aladin. Responsible politicians tried to mitigate the catastrophe when all was practically lost. As a result, the two Russias who had met so inimically at the Moscow conference, parted in a long and tragic divorce. Kierensky, who shared the fears of the Soviet as regards counter-revolution, Having branded Kornilov and Denikin as rebels and traitors, then got rid of all non-socialistic Russia, and became wholly dependent on Soviet circles. Again frail authority began to crumble away. The cadet ministers Kokoshkin, Yurnyev, and Oldenburg who disapproved of Kierensky's action against Kornilov, left the cabinet. A sort of directory, under the name of the Five, was formed of the remaining ministers. They were Kierensky, Nekrasov, Tereshkenko, Admiral Verdiarevsky, and General Verhovsky. On the same day Russia was proclaimed a republic. This was really an infringement of the rights of the Constituent Assembly, where the elected representatives of the people were to determine the form of government themselves. But the left wing thought fit to establish a republic beforehand. Kierensky lost his head so far as to take upon himself the supreme command of the army. When Nicholas II, after removing the Grand Duke Nikolai Nikolaevich, declared himself the supreme commander-in-chief of the enormous Russian army, people smiled. 
but everyone knew that he had a wise and talented leader, General Alexov, at his back. By the bitter irony of fate, Kierensky was walking in the footsteps of the autocrat who had been overthrown by the revolution, and with the self assurance of a madman took upon his shoulders that awful military responsibility for which he had neither the knowledge, the talents, nor even the force of character. And again, General Alexov was beside him, ready, as before, to give up all his strength all his patriotism, to the service of Russia. But just as before the decaying routine of despotism and the Tsar's prejudices had rendered impotent the heroism of the Russian soldier and the talents and energy of Russian army leaders, so now General Alexov found himself before a new obstacle revolutionary prejudices and the anarchy created thereby. Like Nicholas II, Kierensky thought, perhaps sincerely, that he was necessary to Russia and that in the army he would be of more use than General Kornilov, with all his military experience. Having risen to the very height of military authority, the new supreme commander-in-chief tried to bring the army to its senses the very army which he himself had completely thrown off its balance. In agreement with General Alexov, Kierensky drew up and issued an order to the army and navy, 14th of September, demanding the cessation of arrests and deposition of commanders and the transportation of troops in accordance with the orders of the authorities. This order, signed by Kierensky and General Alexov, contained a part of the demands on which Kornilov had insisted in vain. I order that the political struggle among the troops shall cease, and that all efforts should be directed towards strengthening our fighting power, was the very first clause. But how could it be expected that this order would be obeyed when, before clearing up the Kornilov affair? The government itself had already sent round a telegram directing the non-fulfillment of orders, when, in view of everybody, the higher circles were seething with political struggles. Contrary tendencies clashed and chaos reigned, affecting all spheres of military and civil life. Under such conditions it was useless to speak of strong authority, of severe penalties, of duty. The order of the 14th of September remained a dead letter. Kierensky was powerless to put it into force. The more so as the government commissaries who should have carried out the ideas of the government and revolutionary democracy in the army listened principally to the Soviet, and not to the ministers. Any real support of the ideas of a firm and sole authority could not be expected from the Soviet. To the latter this seemed a counter-revolutionary idea, coming chiefly from the cadets, right socialists and counter-revolutionary generals. After the Kornilov affair the Soviet politicians, alarmed at the bare glimpse of the terrible spectre of strong authority, threw themselves in terror to the left for support. This was merely an intensification of their former radical leaning to the left. In spite of the fact that General Kornilov, in his evidence, had categorically denied the accusation of wishing to establish a military dictatorship, the revolutionary democracy was in a state of panic. At meetings, political and other, speeches were made on the growth of counter-revolution. At a meeting of the executive committee a member of the government, the minister Avksentov, also proclaimed the danger which threatened the conquests of the revolution. From the leaders the panic spread to the soldiery. These rushed off to catch the Kalidinists and Kornilovists. In Helsingfors, Viborg, Dvinsk, Reveal, awful brutal massacres of officers took place. The poisonous seeds of class suspicion and civil war were cast in greater and greater abundance among the masses. Their mentality grew distorted, full of hate, goading them to crime. Under the Bolsheviks this hatred was to form the basis of government in the Soviet Republic. But the first Soviets must also share the responsibility of having darkened the minds of the people, since their preaching laid the foundation of the evil work. The military chaos, dyed red with the blood of defenseless officers, was spreading in consequence of the interference of the Soviet in the affairs of the government. Avksentov, the minister, spoke in the Soviet of the threatening advance of Kaledin's counter revolutionary troops from the south, which turned out to be entirely wrong, as Kaledin had not moved anywhere nor undertaken any operations against the provisional government. To counter this, the military commission of the Central Committee of the Soviet of Workmen's Delegates according to Avksentov himself without consulting the War Office, 
had called out a division of soldiers and destroyers from Finland to Petrograd. Such actions increase the danger and cause a panic, the minister very truly reproached them. While the Soviet was trying, timidly and undecidedly, to take the command into its own hands, the Germans were preparing to land troops in Finland. This was public knowledge and discussed in the press. But neither the plans of the Germans nor the war in general troubled the Soviet very much. The members were occupied with the question of creating a new authority. On the 13th of September, at a meeting of the Soviet Executive Committee, came a Neff, the same who had been in the service of the Tsar's police, introduced a resolution in the name of the Bolsheviks for the formation of a government composed of representatives of the revolutionary proletariat and the peasantry. He proposed to establish a democratic republic, to abolish private property in land for the gentry, to annul secret treaties, and immediately to propose a democratic peace. In the name of the Mensheviks, Prince Tsretli brought in another resolution, with an appeal to forget class interests for the sake of national and support the coalition government. It is curious that for the purpose of keeping order, Prince Tsretli proposed to act in close union with the Committee of the National Struggle Against Counter Revolution attached to the All-Russian Central Committee. Thus by the Mensheviks themselves was approved that inquisitorial tribunal, hastily organized under the stimulus of fear, which later on, under the name of the Extraordinary Commission for the Struggle Against Counter-Revolution, Speculation, and Sabotage, became a terrible instrument against all Russian citizens, not excepting the Mensheviks. It was Kamenev who won, and not Prince Tsretli. His resolution was passed with the hearty support of the social revolutionaries, led by Chinov. The Bolsheviks got a majority of 279 against 115. The presiding officials, who had supported Prince Zretli's resolution, resigned. Thus came about the retirement of the center socialists, with chides at their head, who had tried to infuse Zimmer wild class principles into the execution of the national tasks of the defense and reconstruction of the Russian state. For six months they had been the most influential political group, on whom, to a considerable extent, depended the direction of state affairs. They were replaced by pure Zimmerwaldists, irreconcilable socialists who demanded that the doctrines of Karl Marx should be put into practice without delay and without reservation. The revolutionary democracy was totally at a loss, and the position was made worse by the Bolsheviks, who had been released from prison without any trial and who immediately began a furious campaign against the provisional government. When Trotsky appeared after his release from prison he had an ovation. It was becoming evident that the executive committee, which had been the guiding organ of the Soviet, no longer satisfied the Soviet which had elected it. The hero of the day was Trotsky. His speeches in the Soviet were warmly supported. Trotsky demanded a purely socialistic government, and reproached the Soviet for supporting Irinsky, who had introduced capital punishment. At the same time Trotsky reminded them that the Jacobins had known how to defend the revolution and fight the bourgeoisie, by establishing the guillotine for the latter. The Mensheviks called out, the guillotine led to Napoleon. I prefer Napoleon to Irinsky, replied Trotsky frankly. Thus on the 22nd of September 1917 one of the future leaders of Soviet Russia on the one hand condemned capital punishment and on the other pointed to terror as the mainstay of socialistic authority. Practically, terror was rearing its head in various places. Whole districts were pogromed. Landlords were being murdered. Officers were murdered. Engineers were murdered. The cost of human life began to depreciate as rapidly as the rate of exchange of the Russian ruble. The masses, with increasing greediness, tried to take from the new regime only profits and privileges, while their leaders clung to abstract watchwords which bore the high-flown name of the conquests of the revolution. This hazy term was acquiring a more and more maximalistic interpretation, and, as a consequence, both the power of the provisional government and the influence of the first executive committee with which Kierensky and the socialist ministers were closely connected began to totter before finally laying down its authority. 
the Central Executive Committee made one more attempt to find support in those democratic masses who had formerly upheld it. A so-called democratic conference was held in Petrograd. Besides delegates from provincial Soviets, there were representatives of cooperative societies, trade unions, national organizations, etc. No representatives of the so-called proprietary Russia were invited to the conference, only those of the revolutionary democracy. The political chaos which reigned in the latter once more showed itself at this conference, the chief object of which was to determine what kind of government must be set up. It was resolved that the conference was not to be dismissed until the conditions for the formation and functioning of government were drawn up, in a form acceptable to the democracy. But what form was the government to take, in order to become really powerful, to preserve unlimited freedom, which was considered one of the conquests of the revolution? The democracy at the conference was powerless to solve this problem. The conference sat from the 27th of September till the 6th of October. Speeches were made by Kierensky, ministers, soldiers anyone and everyone made speeches. There was a moment when the government almost succeeded in convincing the members of the conference of the necessity for a coalition. The motion supporting a coalition government had already been passed by a majority of 766 votes against 688. But the victory was uncertain. Amendments began to be made. One was to the effect that no cadets or Cornelovists were to take part in the government. Then later, the whole motion was put to the vote a second time, and was rejected. There were 813 votes against it, 183 for it, and 80 non-voters. This muddle in the settlement of the question which they themselves considered fundamental clearly shows what an unstable mass, unaccustomed to examine questions seriously, or seriously to support definite opinions, was the revolutionary democracy at that time. Ideas were so confused that in answer to the demand that no cadets should be admitted, as implicated in the Kornilov affair, M. Ekaterina Kuskova, a representative of cooperative societies, a talented writer, and a social democrat of the Pelekanov group, said, such an amendment is unworthy of a democratic conference because it implies the supposition that someone in this hall might enter into a coalition with the accomplices of the Kornilov insurrection. Several months later, in February 1918, when Bolshevist tyranny was at its height, Ekaterina Kuskova courageously announced in the Vlast Naroda, People's Power, a Moscow paper, that practically every honest patriot must accept Kaledin's program. No one used such language at the Democratic Conference. The revolution had overshadowed the motherland. And Chinkley, the Georgian Social Democrat, was right when he said bitterly, I hear speeches about social, political, and other problems, but I do not hear the most important thing I do not hear of any alarm for Russia's fate. And how could this show itself in an assembly of people, the majority of whom considered themselves bound to stand up for the interests of a class and not of the state? of the international and not the nation, persons among whom internationalists like Trotsky were growing more and more important. Trotsky demanded that the Soviets should take the government into their own hands. On becoming a government, the Soviets would appeal to the democracies of the whole world, demanding peace. If this peace is not attained, then the proletariat will know what to fight for and the Germans advancing on Petrograd will meet with such a repulse as they have never had before. Of course, none of the audience could then guess what a future awaited the clever demagogue and eloquent orator Trotsky, that before them stood the future author of the most shameful piece of Brest-Litovsk, and the future commander-in-chief of the Red Army. Even then, however, many acknowledged that in the person of Trotsky there had appeared a dangerous political opponent of the socialist center while people with more penetration felt that he was a dangerous enemy of the Russian state and the Russian people. Just as the Moscow State Conference did not strengthen but rather weakened the provisional government by whom it had been convened, so the Petrograd Democratic Conference did not strengthen but weakened the Central Executive Committee which had convened it. Two days after the termination of the conference the Petrograd Soviet had its election. Chides who had been the president of the Soviet from the first day of the revolution, was not re-elected. 
Trotsky was chosen to fill his place. And, as if with the object of removing any suspicion as to the meaning of this selection, a motion was immediately passed refusing any support whatever to a government of power and privilege and counter-revolutionary oppression. In regard to Kierensky and his companions this sounded like bitter irony, as not only had they no privilege, but they had no power at all. Just a week before, Kierensky had published an order dispersing the center of flot, that is the elective naval committee, which was a plaything of the Bolsheviks and their Germans. From the moment of its formation the Centro Flot never obeyed anyone. In the middle of September it issued a special order to the Baltic fleet, protesting against the government delaying the inauguration of a federal democratic republic. As the Germans were already advancing on the Gulf of Finland this was a dangerous game to play, and it was extremely necessary to take energetic measures against the impudence of the sailors. But the government proved powerless to exact obedience and was obliged simply to cancel its order. It was likewise powerless against Finnish separatism, already seeking for a way of throwing off the anarchistic yoke of the Russian soldiers and workmen's Soviets and other territorial committees and Soviets, which were issuing orders not to obey the Finnish government so long as the bourgeois took part in it. Day by day the machinery of government grew worse and worse. In the provinces and distant borderlands, and in the center of Russia, the voice of state authority was no longer heard, and orders were given arbitrarily by one committee or another, which troubled themselves not at all about the interest of Russia as a whole. Workmen's organizations also showed complete oblivion of national interests. The railwaymen raised their demands, threatening to strike, although the transport of corn was in danger of failing. At the Donetsk coal fields anarchy was on the increase. Some collieries were taken away from the owners by the miners. At others the latter not only demanded an enormous increase of wages, but the payment of arrears of all such rises for 1915 to 1916 as well. It must be mentioned that the extravagant economic demands of the miners were to a great extent justified by the fact that during the war the mine owners had been specially barefaced in their exploitation of this laborious kind of work taking advantage of the workmen being unable to leave. The shareholders got enormous dividends, up to 200%, while wages were raised at a most parsimonious rate. The workmen's anger was growing. But this does not of course justify the brutal attacks and lynching of directors, engineers, and, in general, all the educated employees. Requisitions, robberies and murders were common not only in the coal fields they had spread all over Russia. And, moreover, though the law courts continued to operate, they found no one to carry out the sentences passed. The mob released criminals and prisoners, and the judges lived under perpetual threat of mob law. Under such circumstances, on the 8th of October Kierensky managed with great difficulty to form a new coalition government, as it was necessary to fill up the directory. The Social Democrats Prokopovich, Gvozdv, Nikitin, the cadets Kartashov, Kishkin, Konovolov, Smirnov, Tretyakov, joined the cabinet. The rest belonged to no particular party. These parties, whom the experiences and disappointments of the revolution had not brought any nearer each other, but rather still further separated, who were neither welded together inwardly nor supported from outside by homogeneous and cordial assistance these people were called upon to solve more and more complicated problems of state, both in home and foreign politics. The government had to wage war with an enemy who had even formally excelled the Russian army in technical matters and in discipline. Meanwhile the army had almost ceased to exist. It was not an army, but merely a crowd of millions of men who disregarded not only their officers, but even their committees, and who thought only of how to get home quickly. Neither could that be called a navy where warships were ruled by committees which passed resolutions like the following, we do not acknowledge the provisional government, which is an alliance between open corny livists and leaders of the democracy. This was the ironical name of Kierensky and his supporters, such a motion was passed by the Soviet in Kronstadt, a few days after the formation of the new cabinet. Those were the September days when the Germans advanced from the sea and occupied the islands of Dago and Issel.
The next stage is after Riga on the road to Petrograd. The left press again began to speak of the struggle for peace, as the only condition of successful defense. The common watchword of all the socialist papers, except the Volynaroda, the organ of the right social revolutionaries, was, the revolution is in danger both from the Germans and from the Cornelivists. Gorky's half Bolshevist Novayazism, which considered itself the organ of the Social Democratic Internationalists, a small group standing between the Bolsheviks and the Mensheviks, expresses very clearly the point of view held both by the left press and the Kronstadt sailors. The group of usurpers of power in the Winter Palace has undertaken to carry out the amended and supplemented program of the 14th of August, that is the program of the left portion of the Moscow Conference. In reality it cannot and will not give us anything but war to the end instead of peace, lead instead of land, and a bayonet instead of bread. Until this government of disgrace to the revolution is liquidated it is of no use to think of the termination of the general crisis in the country, or of the cessation of anarchy. Only a democratic authority can end the counter-revolution, and not the present fictitious government, which is the direct source of counter-revolution and cornelivism, Novaeus is, October 19, 1917. These were no chance opinions of separate groups, but the systematic enunciation of watchwords elaborated in the center, that is the Committee of the Social Democratic Party, and in the Petrograd Soviet, where the Bolsheviks were already playing the leading part. They made no secret of their work, but boldly prepared for battle, not only against the bourgeoisie but against the socialist center likewise. On the 20th of October the Council of the Republic was opened in Petrograd. This was the name given to the consultative assembly of representatives of all parties and large public organizations, convened by the provisional government. This was something like a parliament where, in expectation of the constituent assembly, the public opinion of the country might find expression. The Bolsheviks demonstratively left the council on the first day without even waiting to see what course affairs would take. Trotsky read a declaration, in which it was said that the Bolsheviks did not wish to have anything in common with a government of treachery against the people, nor with a council of counter-revolutionary collusion. The foreign policy of the bourgeoisie and its government is criminal. After forty months of war the metropolis is threatened with mortal danger. In answer to this there is a plan of removing the government to Moscow. The idea of surrendering the revolutionary capital to the German troops in no way rouses the indignation of the bourgeois classes. The inhabitants of Petrograd remembered these words with some irony several months after, when Trotsky and his colleagues themselves ran away from the Germans to Moscow. But in the Council of the Republic the Bolsheviks spoke for the last time as an irresponsible opposition, and repeated all their war cries, all power to the Soviets all the land for the people. An immediate democratic peace. Hail to the Constituent Assembly. Their declaration and departure, their speeches at meetings, the tone of their press, the extent of their secret and open agitation all clearly showed that Lenin was again preparing for battle. Lenin himself, in spite of the fact that the arrested Bolsheviks had been liberated, very cautiously kept in hiding but his hand was felt in the well-planned and aggressive activity of the whole left socialist wing. The push was visible to all, and especially to the government and those guiding circles which sat in the Council of the Republic. All felt the approaching danger, but no one knew how to avert it, nor how to formulate it clearly, and, still less, how to rally and organize against it, in order in consort to repel the approaching foe. Each group, each party continued to live and think, shut in by party walls, repeating the same formulae, which had not only been worn threadbare during the revolution, but had also shown their utter futility. The revolutionary democracy, in the person of the Mensheviks and social revolutionaries, kept speaking of the inviolability of the army committees, of the repeal of capital punishment, of democratic peace without annexations and indemnities, of fighting the counter revolution. Vainly did General Alexov try to convince the members of the council not to slacken discipline, as without a firm military force it was impossible either to fight or to restore order at the base, demoralized by lawlessness and by the want of proper authority. 
the council listened to his speeches in a very unfriendly spirit. Almost the same animosity was called forth by the speeches of the populist socialists. E. Kuskova, in a powerful speech, full of bitter patriotism, called upon her audience to battle against anarchy, to form a block of defensists, as it was necessary to take measures that we should really come out of the war without annexations and indemnities, which will not be paid to the Russian people, but by the Russian people. Her speech was interrupted by applause from the right and criticism from the left. The public men, gathered together in the Council of the Republic, could not come to any agreement even on the question of defending Russia. They disputed for several days, and when on the 1st of November they at last began to vote, it turned out that there were as many as five different motions 1. The Menshevik, 2. Menshevik Internationalist, 3. Social Democrat, 4 left social revolutionary, and, five, cooperative societies, together with cadets, Cossacks, Polekanovists, and several national groups. Notwithstanding the anarchy at home and the military menace abroad, the same differences of opinion concerning words still continued, but the radical divergence in the points of view on the war, defense, and army grew greater and greater. The left wing still continued to fear everything that gave grounds for suspicion of the desire for victory over the Germans. The aim of the socialists was not victory, but the liquidation of the war. The Polekanovists and populist socialists alone supported the motion of the cooperative societies and the cadets, who had moved that only an active defense of the country can protect the integrity of our country's independence. But the socialists desired, by means of a democratic peace, to protect the interests of the proletariat of the whole world. It is obvious that both the aims and methods were totally different. It is not to be wondered at that the debate on the motions was very stormy, and resulted in all the motions being rejected. It turned out that the Council of the Republic, to which Kierensky's government looked for support, had not even a majority desirous of defending Russia against the Germans. The last support was failing the government. It now tried to take up the position of passive defense, and found at the same time that it had wrecked the headquarters staff of the Russian army by discharging or arresting the ablest generals, and appointing to responsible command not those officers who could be of most use in fighting the Germans, but such as knew how to ingratiate themselves with the army committees. The soldiery had been converted into a dangerous mob of embittered, excited, and, moreover, armed men. The prestige of the officers was dead. The officers made desperate attempts to save the army. In spite of the constant danger which threatened them from the soldiers, steeped in suspicion, they remained at their posts and tried to organize themselves. Some days before the Bolshevist coup d'etat, the Soviet of officers' delegates in Moscow passed a resolution, in which they demanded protection for the honor and lives of officers. The officers pointed out that it was necessary to revise the Declaration of Soldiers' Rights, to stop the interference of the committees in the appointment of commanders, to cease political persecution, the committees introduced regular examination of officers, to find out whether they were adherents of Kornilov or not, and, finally, to penalize the murder of officers. This last demand shows plainly what went on in the army at that time. The officers and a part of the soldiers who understood all the horror of the situation were quite powerless, as the government and its army commissaries did not venture to struggle against the storm-tossed sea of soldiery. Kierensky took upon himself the responsibility of the Russian army, without having any idea of what an army may, in general, be founded on. When experienced and honest military specialists tried to explain to him the secret of military psychology and organization, he jealously suspected them of merely trying to get power into their own hands to establish a dictatorship. This overestimation of his own fitness for all forms of statesmanship, and the undervaluation of the experience and knowledge of others, made Kierensky follow a path that led to the ruin of Russia, and also to his own. The resolution of the Soviet of officers ended in the following words, now seen to be prophetic, on the day when the officers fall in the struggle against anarchy. The military power of Russia will be completely wrecked, and, together with it, the Russian Empire. 
The moment has arrived when silence is criminal. But the voices of the people who thought of saving the Russian Empire did not reach the minds of the leaders of the mob, not to speak of the mob itself. They did not think of saving Russia, but only of saving the revolution. And when Vladimir Burtsev, the old socialist, who had passed half his life in prisons, in exile, or as a refugee abroad, who was famous for having unmasked the Tsarist agent provocateur Azef when in his paper Obschidilo, the common cause, he raised a cry that the country was in danger. His former friends on the left shrugged their shoulders contemptuously. Naturally, for did not Vladimir Burtsev demand the release and rehabilitation of Kornilov, whom revolutionary democracy had branded as an enemy of the people? Burtsev said that it was necessary to apply to Kaledin, to place him and Kornilov in power. To appeal to the whole population of Russia, as was done in 1613, and to assemble all, all, all together under one banner to save the country. But where was that strong arm which could do this, when the national flag was torn to rags and thrown in the mud, and the red flag that replaced it was torn by the socialists themselves from each other's hands, when its red had ceased to be a symbol of the crimson dawn and had become the ominous symbol of bloody civil war? The specter of civil war hovered over Russia. Part of the socialists openly called for armed insurrection. In Moscow preparations were being made for a general strike of municipal employees, who wanted to fight the provisional government with the same weapons they had used against Tsarism, that is by stopping the trams, railways, and, if necessary, by cutting off the water and electric light. Socialists of the center went the rounds of the works and barracks, trying to bring the men to their senses, but they met with a very unfriendly reception. Bolshevist speeches were more acceptable to the masses. The government took no measures at all, for what kind of serious measure was the order for Lenin's arrest, given by the Minister of Justice, or the order to close Burtsev's paper, and even sequestrate the printing office, evidently for the two hostile attacks on Kierensky and the passionate defense of Kornilov. The papers published soothing communiques, saying that the necessary measures had been taken against the possibility of a Bolshevist attempt. Many believed this. Indeed, at that time very few people clearly understood the extent of the Bolshevist danger. The government itself was foremost in this non-comprehension. All its actions and declarations bear the stamp of a wonderful, unpardonable, and thoughtless self-assurance. In answer to the British ambassador's inquiry as to whether the provisional government was aware of the military preparations of the Bolsheviks, Kierensky replied that it was, and had every means at its disposal to overcome them finally. In reality there was nothing of the kind. In the Marie Palace, where the Council of the Republic held its meetings, and in the Winter Palace, where Kierensky lived and the members of the government used to assemble, there were only floods of oratory. There was not even a plan of campaign. To make up for this, in the Smolny Institute, where the Petrograd Soviet was sitting, with Trotsky as leader, not only had a plan of campaign been drawn up, but it was being acted upon. The object of the Bolsheviks was to seize power by force of arms, and therefore they, first of all, formed a military revolutionary committee, attached to the Petrograd Soviet. On the 3rd of November the authority of this committee was acknowledged by the Petrograd garrison and fortress. The very next night the representatives of the committee came to the headquarters of the Petrograd district, for the purpose of assuming control over them. Colonel Polkovnikov, the chief of the district, refused to acknowledge their authority. Then the representatives of the garrisons assembled in the Smolny Institute and sent telephonograms saying that the headquarters had become the tool of counter-revolutionary forces. No garrison orders were to be fulfilled, unless signed by the Military Revolutionary Committee. The revolution is in danger. Long live the revolutionary garrison. Kierensky was still premier, but the Soviet had already appointed commissaries to all the military units, and to all especially important points in Petrograd, and informed the population of these appointments announcing that the persons of the commissaries were inviolable, and that any opposition offered to the commissaries would be regarded as opposition to the Soviet. The headquarters of the district, 
instead of arresting the ringleaders and drawing up its forces for the defense of the members of the government and government institutions, issued a counter-proclamation. In the Winter Palace it was resolved to regard the formation of the Military Revolutionary Committee as a criminal act, aggravated by its being committed in the theater of war. On the 6th of November, at a sitting of the Council of the Republic, Kierinsky made a detailed report on the state of affairs, and on the measures which the government intended to take. In a parliamentary country his action would have been quite proper, but it produces an embarrassing, a tragicomical impression if one remembers that at that time there was neither parliament nor government authority in Russia, that while he was speaking the second revolution, so fatal to the country, was taking place. This was Kierinsky's last overt, responsible, political act. And it was the last day of the authority exercised by the revolutionary democracy, as whose favorite Kierinsky had begun his career as statesman. This is how he defined his view of the problems which life had so tragically set before Russia. Of late, the nearer the time approaches for the convening of the Constituent Assembly, which will forever establish in Russia a free democracy, obtained by the Great Russian Revolution thus began Kierinsky's speech the more impudent and brazen become the attempts of the two wings of Russian society to prevent and destroy the possibility of convening the Constituent Assembly. The government considers it a duty to protect the liberty of every person, and therefore remains apparently indifferent in spite of exceedingly violent attacks. The extreme right demands that the government should be replaced by a dictatorship, voices from the right benches correct him, strong government. And then asked him where did these reactionary demands come from? Kierinsky could only name two newspapers, of no political importance whatever, viz. The Novaya Res, New Russia, and Zivo Slovo, Living Word and Bertsev Subschidilo, the common cause. He placed them on a level with the Bolshevist papers sold at and Rebuchi put, the workman's way, which published direct calls to insurrection, and gave their support to avert preparations for the latter. Kierinsky quoted extracts from Lenin's article, Letters to Comrades, in the Rebuchi put where this state criminal Lenin called upon the Petrograd proletariat and troops to repeat the experiment of the 16th-18th July. One of Lenin's articles concluded with the following ironical words, What are you going to wait for? For a miracle? Are you going to wait for the Constituent Assembly? Wait and starve. Kierinsky has promised you to convene the Constituent Assembly. At political meetings the audience was also incited to open rebellion. The campaign was carried on principally by Bronstein Trotsky. But, says Kierinsky, I must point out an exceedingly important thing, namely, the very definite, obvious, and inseparable connection between the attacks made by both wings. The articles in the Rebuchi put in the Soldat are similar in style and turns of phrases with those in Novaris. Thus Kierinsky placed on the same level the Bolsheviks, strong in their nearness to the masses, and the small group of people, without either political power or party to back them, who wrote for the Novaris. Even on the eve of ruin, when the armed Bolsheviks were already advancing against him from the left, Kierinsky was still timidly expecting an attack from the right. He made a further quotation from Lenin's article having scores of newspapers, freedom of meetings, having a majority in the Soviet, we the international proletariat who hold the best position in the world can we refuse to support the German revolutionaries and insurgent organizations. Kierinsky begged his audience to notice, it is of great importance to me that this should be noticed that the organizers of the insurrection themselves acknowledge that the political conditions for the free activity of all parties are at present most advanced in Russia, under the present provisional government. Those who organize an insurrection in such a free country are not assisting the proletariat of Germany, but are aiding the ruling classes of Germany, are opening the front of the Russian state to the mailed fist of the Kaiser and his friends. The action of the party which is doing this either consciously or unconsciously I declare to be treachery and treason to the Russian state. Kierinsky reminds them that there are only three weeks left to the elections to the Constituent Assembly. 
the government is preparing to hand over the land to the land committees temporarily, until the constituent assembly. The government is sending delegates to the Paris conference, in order to draw the attention of the Allies to the question of the necessity for a decided and accurate definition of the aims and objects of the war, and questions in regard to the measures for bringing the war to an end, that is the question of peace. Having enumerated all these proposals of the government, Irinsky returns to the Bolsheviks. They have already begun to carry out the insurrection, they have sent out orders to the troops not to obey the orders from headquarters. The military authorities consider this action of the revolutionary headquarters as clearly criminal, and have demanded that this order should be annulled without any delay. But even here, though there was every reason to take immediate, decisive, and energetic measures, the military authorities, at my instigation, considered it necessary first to give the men an opportunity of becoming aware of their conscious or unconscious mistake, cries from the right, that is what's wrong, apostrophe, and to give time for this mistake if it be a mistake to be rectified by them. We had to do this for another reason also, namely, because during the first 24 hours after this order had been issued, no practical consequences resulting therefrom were observed among the troops. In general, I prefer that the authorities should act more slowly, but, to make up for that, more surely, and, when requisite, more resolutely. The Prime Minister then acknowledged that his expectations of the Bolsheviks showing hearty repentance were not justified. At three o'clock in the morning an announcement was made to us, he did not state by whom, that the ultimatum of the military authorities had been accepted. Thus at 3 a.m. the organizers of the insurrection had been obliged to declare formally that they had committed an unlawful act, which they now repudiated, Miley Ukov, from his seat, that is original. Apostrophe. But as I had expected, and was sure, from the whole preceding tactics of these men this was a case of their usual delay and deliberate deceit, voices from the right, at last you have learned that much. At the present time all periods of grace have expired, and still we do not see the declaration which should have been made in the regiments. On the contrary, there has been an unauthorized distribution of cartridges and arms, and likewise the troops have been called out twice to the assistance of these revolutionary headquarters. Thus, I am obliged to inform the provisional government that the actual attitude of a certain part of the population is that of open insurrection, cries from the right, it has come. Apostrophe. That is from the legal point of view, and I propose that a corresponding judicial investigation should be immediately begun, noise from the left. It is likewise proposed to make the necessary arrests, protests from the left. Yes, yes. Listen. Because at the present time, when the state is being ruined by treason, whether conscious or unconscious, the provisional government, myself included, would rather be killed and destroyed than betray the life, the honor, and independence of the state. These words raised a storm of applause in the whole meeting, with the exception of the left group. Kierensky continued, the provisional government may be reproached for its weakness and excessive patience, but at any rate no one has the right to say that the provisional government, while I have been at its head, I, and even before, has had recourse to any measures of coercion before immediate danger and ruin threatened the state. He reminded his auditors that the government considered it their duty to strengthen the cause of freedom, that they never infringed the complete freedom in the enjoyment of political rights by the citizens of the Russian state. This gives him the right to demand that the country should support our decisive measures. This support had already been promised him from the front. The General Army Committees at headquarters promised to support the authorities in their struggle against the destroyers of the state, and declared that the army demands that the provisional government, in agreement with the Council of the Republic and the All-Russian Central Committee of the Soviets, should immediately and universally stop the wild military pogroms in towns and villages, and calls upon it to suppress all rioting resolutely and energetically. No sooner had Kierensky read this resolution than the minister, A. Konovlev, handed him some kind of document. 
This was an order of the Military Revolutionary Committee to the effect that the Petrograd Soviet was in danger, that the troops must prepare for action, and wait for orders. The order bore two signatures Podvorsky and Antonov. As a lawyer, Kierensky first of all estimated this document from a criminal point of view, and only then drew his political conclusions from it. He read it aloud and said, So, at the present time, the state of affairs in the capital is one which the law and the judicial authorities term a state of insurrection. It is an attempt to raise the rabble against the existing order, to prevent the constituent assembly being convened, and to open out the front to the serried ranks of the mailed fist of the Kaiser. The word rabble raised a storm of protest from the left, but Kierensky repeated it. I say it deliberately rabble because the whole of intelligent democracy and its central executive committee, all army organizations, all that free Russia is proud of, and should be proud of the reason, the conscience, and honor of the great Russian democracy all protest against this. He concluded his speech with the demand that the council should support the government. This was Kierensky's swan song. Into it he put all his wisdom, as a statesman a premier, and commander-in-chief, or rather, he betrayed all his blindness. One great excuse for him is that he was not the only one who did not understand the interdependence of political forces and the psychology of the masses. At the same sitting another member of the cabinet, Gvozdf, Minister of Labor and Social Democrat, declared, I have been a workman for twenty years, and I think I have some right to speak in the name of revolutionary democracy. I assert that the Petrograd workmen are incapable of organizing a pogrom, and an insurrection leads to nothing else. In what has been said here, to wit, that the government does not possess the confidence of the people, this was said by Kamkov, the social revolutionary, I see a libel on the intelligence of the people. I have never carried favor with anyone. I only speak of what is true and am convinced that intelligent workmen will take no part in the present movement. Gvozdf demands that the question should be put squarely, either you are with Trotsky, or against him. But he did not manage to get this clearly stated, neither by his comrades the Social Democrats, nor the Social Revolutionaries. The left motion is so characteristic that I quote it in extenso, the more so as it was the last political act of revolutionary democracy. The attempt at insurrection, for which preparations have lately been made, and which has for its object the seizure of power, threatens to cause civil war, creates conditions favorable to pogroms and the mobilization of black gang counter revolutionary forces, and will inevitably lead to the Constituent Assembly not being convened, to a new military catastrophe and the fall of the revolution accompanied by economic paralysis and the complete ruin of the country. The ground for the success of this agitation has been prepared not only by the objective conditions of war and disorganization, but likewise by the delay in carrying out urgent measures, and therefore it is first of all necessary that a decree should immediately be passed for the transference of the land to the jurisdiction of the land committees, and that decisive action be taken in our foreign policy with a proposal to the Allies to announce the conditions on which peace might be concluded, and to start peace negotiations. In order to fight against active outbursts of anarchy and pogroms it is necessary, to take immediate measures to liquidate them, and for this purpose a committee of public safety should be formed in Petrograd, consisting of representatives of the municipal corporation and of revolutionary democratic institutions acting in concert with the provisional government. In this left motion there was no repudiation of Trotsky, but only an indirect condemnation of the Bolsheviks, and the liquidation of the insurrection was to be entrusted, not to the government, but to a new committee, which was yet to be formed. The second motion was proposed by the cadets, cooperators, and the right center in general. The Provisional Council of the Russian Republic, having heard the communication of the Prime Minister, declares that in the struggle against the traitors to the country and the cause of the revolution, who, before the face of the enemy, and on the eve of the Constituent Assembly, have had recourse to the organization of open rebellion in the capital, the Council will give its full support to the government, and demands that the most resolute measures be taken for the suppression of the rebellion. The Cossacks likewise seconded this motion. But, before voting, 
They made a separate declaration, full of harsh accusations both against all open and secret Zimmerwaldists, those criminals and traitors, and against the government. The provisional government, having proved its failure to act in regard to the events of the 3RD5TH of July, and shown its utter weakness of authority after these events, and an action in the face of events that are now about to take place, is thereby guilty of collusion with the Bolsheviks. In view of the aforesaid, and not wishing to shed Cossack blood, as was the case on the 3RD5TH of July, and not being assured that the provisional government has really decided to finish with the Bolshevist movement and to free its policy from the influence of the Zimmerwaldists, the Cossack section announces that the Cossacks are ready to do their duty to their country and to liberty, but demand guarantees from the government that no favor will be shown to the Bolsheviks. This sounded like a threat, as all were aware that Irinsky reckoned very much on the Cossack forces which nevertheless did not prevent him a few days before the rebellion from prohibiting an intended Cossack church procession. The Cossacks paid no attention to the prohibition, but the irritation among them was growing, and Irinsky paid dearly for it. When the motions were put to the vote, the socialist motion was supported by 123 votes, while the cadets only got 102, 26 members having abstained from voting. Irinsky did not retain the confidence of the majority. Even this stake he lost. Among those who had abstained from voting were the populist socialists, some of the cooperators, Vera Finna, and Den. Che Ikovsky. At that decisive moment, these old revolutionaries could not muster up their courage to take either one side or another definitely but silently stepped aside. While the Council of the Republic was engrossed in passing motions, Firing had already commenced in the streets, and ominous motor cars with machine guns and rifles had begun to appear. Chaptic I The November Revolution the General Staff and the Winter Palace arrest of members of the Provisional Government Adventure or Coup d'etat? No defenders. Irinsky disappears. The Petrograd Municipal Council as the center of opposition. The military cadets. The Moscow fighting strike of officials. Seizure of the State Bank Union of Unions. Impotence of the intelligentsia. The Bolsheviks opened military operations on the 6th of November. On the night of the 6th 7th, the Military Revolutionary Committee occupied the railway stations. The orders of the district staff were with great difficulty transmitted as the exchanges were seized by Bolshevist soldiers, and even when transmitted, were not obeyed. The cruisers Aurora and Zarius Fobody with two torpedo boats had come up from Kronstadt. Several Bolsheviks still remaining in prison were liberated by order of the Military Revolutionary Committee. The governor of the prison had some doubts as to whether he should obey the order, but the soldiers of the Volensky Regiment, who were on guard, rang up their regimental committee and received the command to obey the military revolutionary committee. The revolt, of which the true dimensions were realized by very few comma https colon slash slash www.yamaguchi.com slash library slash tikiva slash tikiva underscore eleven. HTML was beginning to develop into an actual revolution. The Bolsheviks were distributing to these workmen arms which had not been confiscated after the July revolt. A Red Guard, advocated long ago by the very first executive committee, was being organized. On the 7th November, Petrograd was already in the hands of the rebels. In the afternoon soldiers and sailors surrounded the Marie Palace, armored cars drove up. An officer transmitted the order of the Military Revolutionary Committee that the members of the Council of the Republic should quit the palace. The President of the Council of the Republic, Avksentov, communicated the order to the assembled members. There were very few of them barely a hundred, out of eight hundred yet even here was discord. The right wing, headed by the cadets, was of opinion that they ought not to submit to the demand, but the majority decided to withdraw under protest, and yield to force. Upon the same day the Military Revolutionary Committee declared in a special proclamation, the provisional government is deposed. All state power has passed into the hands of the Petrograd Soviet of Workmen's and Soldiers' Deputies, that is to a military revolutionary committee placed at the head of the Petrograd garrison and proletariat. The goal for which the people fought, the immediate proposal of a democratic peace, 
the abolition of private landed property, labor control of industry, the establishment of a Soviet government all this is guaranteed. Thus seven months after his arrival in Russia did Lenin once again repeat his long-standing program, but it was no longer the abstract speech of a propagandist. It was the program of a government in formation. Only a small band of men, bearing this onerous and dangerous title of ministers of the provisional government, stood between him and power. But the man who had been able to enlist the sympathies of the workers and soldier masses found no difficulty in dispatching them once for all. In the afternoon of the 7th of November, Kierensky, with his assistant Kuzminsky, left Petrograd in a motor car, as was generally thought for the front. Https colon slash slash www.yamaguchi.com slash library slash tikava slash tikava underscore eleven. Html Konovlev remained as his substitute, while N. M. Kishkin was invested with extraordinary power for re establishing order in the capital. In other words, he was made dictator. But he lacked the main attribute of a dictator military force. A company of cadets from the artillery school marched to the Winter Palace and went away again. Later came a small detachment of cadets from other military schools. A company of 135 women soldiers of the women's battalion was also quartered in the palace. None of the other military units came to defend the government. P. Arzubov gives the following narrative of what was going on at the staff and in the Winter Palace during the night of 6th 7th November. This talented and trustworthy journalist had spent a long time at the front, and had known the meaning of war, had known the Russian army in the days of its brave fighting. As a correspondent he had accompanied Kierensky in his visits to the front, and was a witness of his frantic efforts to substitute eloquence for compulsion. Arzubov's career as a military correspondent ended with the last hours of the old Russian army's existence. According to Arzubov, on the eve of the rising the intelligence department of the general staff had been receiving the most contradictory reports. Some said that government troops formed an overwhelming majority. Those who were more observant pointed out that there was unrest in the barracks, that various obscure persons were persuading the soldiers that if they held aloof and did not come out to fight against the ministers they would suffer for it later on. Next day, it was the 7th of November, the day of Kierensky's departure, the magic words flew throughout bourgeois Petrograd, it has come. It was the beginning of that long expected something, whose coming was awaited with fear or hope by the inmates of Petrograd, by soldiers, by workmen in the factories, by women in the queues, by all, in fact, with the exception of the plenipotentiary leaders of the revolutionary democracy and the members of the provisional government. Neither of them apparently believed in the Bolshevist peril, and now that it had at last burst upon them they completely lost their heads. Bolshevist patrols occupied the state bank and the telephone exchange. The Peter and Paul fortress was also in their hands. The Council of the Republic was dispersed. Patrols of the Pavlovsky regiment appeared in the afternoon upon the Nevsky prospect and began to verify the officers' passports. A feeling of unconcealed fear and the consciousness of pitiful helplessness pervaded the intelligence department. I resolved to go to the Winter Palace. Had not Kierensky, in the name of the provisional government, declared their decision to die at their post? The Winter Palace was empty. Scared couriers huddled together in corners, fearfully awaiting the coming of new masters. Journalists, the chorus of all contemporary historical tragedies were chatting volubly in one of the apartments. A short distance away, in the large hall, ministers roamed about in solitary state. No one paid any attention to the ministers, no one came to take their orders. Everyone abandoned them in the moment of danger, just as eight months before everyone had abandoned Nicholas II. Had the troops of the Military Revolutionary Committee appeared at once, they might have arrested the entire United Cabinet without firing a single shot. Delegates of the 14th Don Cossack Regiment appeared at last. Apparently this regiment could be relied upon. Therefore the government could dispose of the cadets, the women's shock battalion, and several hundreds of Cossacks. They also possessed six guns, and two or three armored cars also remained. 
not a bad beginning. The suppression of the revolt of the 17th July had been undertaken with, perhaps, fewer forces. But some kind of authority for giving orders was needed even over six guns. Yet upon that fatal day the attentive observer could trace no authority either in the palace or at the staff, whither he again retraced his steps. N. Kishkin, seeing the inactivity of the military authorities, dismissed a colonel and at once named General Bagratani as his successor. Bagratani never dreamed of giving orders or of organizing a defense were it only with the troops at his disposal. What was the meaning of it? Was it a premeditated strike or a paralysis of will to act in the face of danger? It was the fatal consequence of the system established in the army by Kierensky, which resulted in all posts of the higher command being occupied by men of weak character, devoid of firm principles and moral courage, ready to bow down to force whatever its origin. Yet surely we had strong men among our soldiers, men of another caste, whose character had been steeled amid the hardships of war and in the stern school of former military service. Where were they? One of these men arrived at the staff. It was General Alexeyev. Officers, privates, even the brazen staff clerks, stood at attention before him. For one lightning moment the fascination of glory and authority, the old half-forgotten hypnotism of military discipline, pervaded that distracted, timid crowd. Alexeyev passed rapidly into Kishkin's apartment, stayed there for a quarter of an hour, went out again, addressed a few kindly, encouraging words to the officers who clustered round him, and walked downstairs. I do not know the reason of Alexeyev's visit. Forgetting all former offences, deceits and injustice, did he wish to offer his assistance to the perishing government? If such was the case his offer was apparently rejected and the man who alone might perhaps have saved a cause obviously doomed to perdition, once more departed rejected and misunderstood. His departure served as a signal for a general stampede. Officers who had presented themselves at the staff of their own free will, dispersed. Clerks began to disappear, and so did even some of the officers occupying permanent posts at the staff. The vast reception rooms became empty four armored cars drove up to the palace square. The staff headquarters occupied one side of it, and the winter palace the other, these were already Bolshevist armored cars. The enemy was preparing for assault, yet no one seemed to be thinking of defense. Not a shot was fired. After standing for a while before the palace, the armored cars turned back. In one of the streets leading to the palace, Azubov overheard a conversation between a small platoon of a shock battalion, which defended the government, and two soldiers delegated from the fortress with an ultimatum to the ministers to surrender within a space of twenty minutes, as otherwise the fortress guns would open fire. The journalist offered to take these messengers to the staff, and on the way began to test the firmness of the delegate comrades. Do you imagine there are no guns in the palace? They have mine throwers and bomb throwers, and all kinds of machines. You will be smashed to smithereens. We ourselves know that we can't hold out, but what could we do? They've sent us, and so we went. It's the majority that decides. We only follow suit. Well, thought I, what sort of people are in the fortress I do not know but the delegates are no good. Yet General Bagratani to whom they presented their ultimatum, was equally useless. The cadets, the shock troops, the officers who were ready to fight for the government, received no orders and could not even make out whether the government intended to defend itself or to surrender. General, said N. Kishkin, in a loud voice, I command you to resist the rebels. The general smiled. But the smile was not a merry one. He answered gently. I have been accustomed, sir, as a soldier, to weigh the circumstances. To my mind the actual circumstances present no data for offering resistance. As a soldier it is your duty to die when ordered to do so. Yes, of course, still the actual circumstances. Kishkin decided that there was nothing to hope from the staff, and returned to the Winter Palace, where all the other ministers were also assembled. 
they were all able to escape, but regarded such an act as unworthy of members of the provisional government, and confronted the peril bravely. A. Konovlev, N. Kishkin, M. Tereshenko, N. Smirnov, Tretyakov, Palchinsky, Rutenberg, Gvozdov, Nikotin, Liverovsky, Maslov, M. Bernatsky, A. Kartashev all assembled in the palace, now transformed into a besieged fortress, only without defenders. A few hundred cadets, who had no cartridges for their rifles, and the women's company could not be counted as a serious defensive force. The women soldiers found themselves in the palace by accident. On the 5th of November, the day before the Bolshevist rising, Kierinsky had held a review of the women's battalion. The women were certain that after the review they would be immediately sent to the front. They were full of burning zeal to fight the Germans, and did not in the least realize what was going on around them. Great was their disappointment when they were ordered to return to their barracks. After the review was over someone proposed to Kierinsky to keep the battalion at the palace. The commander of the battalion refused but told off one company of 135 women privates to guard the motor cars which fetched benzene from the stores where the workmen were on strike. So that when the Reds commenced the siege of the palace, the women's company, to its amazement and indignation, found itself drawn into the civil war. They had trained themselves to fight the Germans, but had not the slightest desire to be mixed up in political conflicts. The story of the women's company furnished another proof of the childish inefficiency of Generalissimo Kierinsky, incapable even of organizing the defense of the palace, much less of Russia. As a member of the Petrograd Municipal Council I made an inquiry concerning the position of the women's battalion after the coup d'etat, and both officers and women privates spoke to me with equal indignation of how they had been drawn into a struggle the meaning of which they did not even understand. The Winter Palace was quite unprepared for defense. There was no trace of those mine and bomb throwers with which Arzubov had tried to intimidate the delegates from the fortress. There were no arms, no cartridges, not even bread for the defenders. The members of the government assembled in the palace had not the slightest possibility of defending themselves. No one came to their assistance neither workmen nor soldiers. Only civilians in the town hall listened excitedly to the speeches of the deposed leaders of the first Soviet, who had come to seek aid for Kierinsky and his adherents and called upon the members to die for the provisional government. Members of the municipal council answered with enthusiastic promises and even marched demonstratively towards the palace, naively believing that having been elected by universal suffrage, their authority would be recognized by the people. But the mob had no respect whatever for any lawful authorities, albeit it had formerly voted for them. The members of the municipal council soon realized this. The first sentinels they came across barred the way. They tried to persuade them, but the soldiers did not give in. Whereupon the whole procession returned to the town hall, where, in accordance with a receipt prescribed by the socialistic wing of the Council of the Republic, a committee of public safety was organized, whose first act consisted in a declaration that the question regarding the situation of the government remains an open one. These words concealed an ambiguous expectation of a new master. His coming was at hand. Petrograd did not sleep that night listening to the firing to the rattle of machine guns, to the boom of the fortress guns. The capital was transformed into a battlefield whose center lay around the former palace of the Tsars. The streets swarmed with excited crowds, armored cars rushed up and down, horsemen galloped past, armed patrols warmed themselves round bonfires. One might have thought that the Russian capital was preparing for a battle against the Germans. In reality it was but the beginning of a class war which was destined to last for months. The crowd of soldiers, workmen, women, and common street rabble, which surged around the Winter Palace, stormed in, meeting with scarcely any resistance. The assailants possessed artillery, machine guns, shells, and cartridges. The defenders were not only few in numbers, but almost unarmed. In spite of the deafening firing, there were not many victims. The women's battalion suffered no casualties. 
the women soldiers said to me afterwards with a contemptuous smile, as if the Red Guards are soldiers. They do not know how to hold a rifle, they can't even handle a machine gun. Most of the bullets did indeed fly high over the people's heads. Although in the square soldiers joined the Red Guards, perhaps they took no pains to shoot properly. Soldiers of the Kexham Regiment, which was supposed to be a special bulwark of Bolshevism, said afterwards that they had been ordered to leave the barracks in the morning without being told where and for what purpose they were led out. https colon slash slash www.yamaguchi.com slash library slash tikiva slash tikiva underscore eleven dot html only upon finding themselves in front of the winter palace at nightfall did they realize the true state of affairs. But even soldiers who were out of sympathy with the movement had no means of escape for they were intermixed with the Red Guards, who, although they did not know the use of firearms, were full of neophyte zeal. The consciousness of their own wrongdoing still felt by some of the soldiers may, perhaps, explain the reason why the ministers were not mishandled by the mob. Fortunately for them, Kierensky, against whom the Bolsheviks had aroused the blind hatred of the masses, was not present when the furious mob stormed the Winter Palace. Everything was plundered, broken, and destroyed even the hospital occupied by wounded soldiers. What could not be taken away was smashed to atoms. It seemed as if a horde of savages had swept the vast palace which since the March Revolution had belonged to the nation. The crowd was so dense that not all could join in the delight of taking part in the plunder and destruction. Numbers remained outside. Furious. Savage shouts greeted the appearance of the arrested ministers. A. V. Kartashev, the Minister of Public Worship, told me later that when they were being led from the Winter Palace to the fortress of SS. Peter and Paul, he could feel the dark waves of hatred rising on all sides from the howling, infuriated mob. Every moment he expected these waves to break the thin chain of the convoy which closely encircled the arrested ministers. Each time, when these waves dashed too closely, they were saved by the presence of mind of the soldiers, who, lowering their bayonets, started almost at a run to escape the infuriated mob ready to seize its victims. I heard the same story from the cadets and women soldiers who were taken prisoners at the palace. They were all saved from lynching by the Bolshevist soldiers themselves that is by soldiers who considered themselves Bolsheviks although probably realizing neither the meaning of Bolshevism nor its consequences. When, after having been set at liberty, A. V. Kartashev, an idealist, a man of great spiritual power and full of the moral courage inseparable from true religious sentiment, lived over again those dark hours, he frankly admitted to me, I felt the agony of a man dying slowly at the stake. Another chance incident helped to save them. On their way to the fortress they had to cross the Neva Bridge. Suddenly, as they were crossing the bridge, arrested ministers, military convoy, the frenzied crowd all came under a volley of rifle fire. No one knew where the shots came from, but in trying to escape from this common deadly peril, everyone flung themselves prone on the road, and lay there for several minutes while the bullets whizzed over their heads. This cooled down the victors. The soldiers were the first to jump up, and together with the ministers reached the fortress at a brisk trot. When the gates closed upon them, both the prisoners and the convoy heaved a sigh of relief. The people had proved more terrible than the jailers. Here is a description of Petrograd's state of mind on the morrow of the coup d'etat, 8th November, given by a capable journalist, a non party socialist, S. Kondorushkin. This morning Petrograd is almost empty. The people, terrified by the all-night bombardment, are afraid to venture into the street. All government offices are closed. The Winter Palace is occupied by the rebels. The Tsar's garden is strewn with the bodies of those who were killed in the night. The treasures of the Winter Palace have been plundered. The ministers are arrested and imprisoned in the fortress. How Matlokov Vostov, Sukhamalinov, the Tsarist ministers imprisoned in the fortress, must laugh. Welcome, the fresh party of traitors to the state. Even socialism has failed to save the ministers. 
guns are placed on the Nevsky Prospect. Patrols occupy street corners, bonfires are made of bourgeois papers, confiscated from newsboys, and soldiers and street urchins are warming themselves around them. Lorries, bristling with machine guns and crowded with soldiers and sailors, steer along the empty streets towards the railway stations. Those are the rebels hastening to meet the government troops. Their faces are radiant, they are convinced that they are making the revolution and saving their country. Towards evening the streets are filled with silent people. At first sight these seem to be the same as in March, but look at their faces it is as if there was death in their homes. Those other days had been full of enthusiasm, many believed in the speedy coming of a new era. Now all faces are sullen and melancholy. Only men with rifles are enthusiastic, what strong and well-fed fellows they are, these Petrograd soldiers and sailors. I might even add, what blockheads. These were already the new masters. The power of the revolutionary democracy and of the provisional government which leaned upon it was at an end. They had been animated by a sincere desire to serve the people, but they were too weak, too dogmatical and paid for their weakness, not only with the cruel price of humiliation and suffering, but maybe by losing faith in the very people whose servants the ministers considered themselves to be. The political march revolution, which deposed autocracy, avoided all violent measures even against the most hated representatives of the old regime, beginning with Nicholas II. Himself. In the early days of the March Revolution each time that evil sparks of hatred and revenge flamed up among the mob Kierensky boldly quenched them. He would not suffer the ministers, not even Sukhomolinov, to be lynched. The November Revolution, which overthrew the democratic government, followed another course the course of violence and bloodshed. The short era of Russian political liberty was over. In its stead came the gloomy period of enforced communism and step by step Russia began to relapse into the most terrible experiences of the Middle Ages. This catastrophic change did not become immediately apparent. Although the provisional government was under arrest, and Lenin and Trotsky, surrounded at Smolny with machine guns and with artillery, issued one decree after another in the name of the new government of workmen and peasants, no one believed such a state of affairs would last. Their orders were so absurd the Red Guards and Bolshevist committee men were so unlike ordinary government agents that public opinion was certain all this was not a coup d'etat, but merely a passing adventure. The Bolsheviks themselves frankly admitted that they would not hold out for more than a fortnight. Besides, where was the possibility of judging the situation, when neither the Bolsheviks nor their opponents had any idea of what was going on, not only in Russia, but even in Petrograd itself? In his diary, dated the 9th November, S. Kondorushkin gave an interesting description of Smolny the Bolshevist citadel. It would be curious to have a look at what is going on at Bolshevist headquarters at the Smolny Institute. The vast court of the old Elizabethan building is crowded with dozens of motor cars. For seven months Tsretli, Chides, Skoplev, Gotts, Lieber, Dan, have driven in those motor cars. Now they are taken up by Lenin, Trotsky, Bronstein, Kolontai, Kamen Efrazenfeld, Zinova Fuppfelbaum. What a pliad! Will the motherland shortly witness a new constellation rising in our political spheres? Between the entrance pillars a large machine gun points its muzzle at the doorway. Several groups of armed guards all is enthusiasm and bayonets. On the ground floor I receive a pass for going upstairs. I mount. I roam over the marble stairs, along the wide corridors. For a century and a half this had been women's intimate domain. Gentle maidens, in snow-white pinafores and modest gowns, had paced the polished floors of these halls and corridors. Now they are crowded with soldiers and sailors, trampling the refuse and mud with their heavy boots. Party girls are seated at tables selling papers and pamphlets. Smoke, dust, evil smells, cigarette ends. The authorities occupy the apartments. Long queues of soldiers with papers and letters await their turn at the door, dark complexioned, nimble little men run in and out, the crowd winds up around them. All right. Very good. Yes, yes. 
Oh, do leave me in peace, I've not slept three nights. Kierinsky's troops are approaching Petrograd. Smolny is agitated. Motor horns sound at the gates, soldiers and sailors are hastily running up and down stairs. I glance over the piles of books lying on the table and buy a few. At home in the evening I look through them. Surely these are the ravings of a madman, but not literature. Excitement, frenzy, torrents of meaningless words, threats, and delirious visions of some new unknown life. But not a trace of consciousness of the actual Russia. A madman's ravings are also consecutive and full of fiery vividness, but because of their absence of connection with reality they are nevertheless only ravings. We, in Petrograd, are cut off from all the world. Of what is happening in Russia or abroad we know nothing. Perhaps we in Petrograd have all gone mad already. Such an idea occurred to many of us in those days, so difficult was it to obtain a clear understanding of what was really happening in this world of events and rumors. Authentic news was also hard to obtain. Bolshevist papers lied as usual, all others were suppressed. Sailors and Red Guards broke into printing offices and, with leveled bayonets, dispersed both printers and members of the staff. Wild rumors spread over the city. The town hall became the only center of anti-Bolshevist political life and public defense. Every evening meetings were held, which received often contradictory and confused reports of all that had taken place in the city, of the shooting of the cadets, of arrests and looting of negotiations with Smolny, of some obscure political vacillations at headquarters. All this sounded feverish, uncertain, distracted. Kierinsky was expected to bring over troops and overthrow the Bolsheviks. Small bands of cadets, acting without plan or unity, fought against the Bolsheviks, who dealt with them as cruelly as only men who are a prey to the frenzy of civil war can deal. Hundreds of young men were flung into the fortress or into prison. Relatives in despair rushed from place to place searching for their near and dear among corpses in the mortuaries, among the drowned cast up by the Neva and its adjacent canals, among the prisoners whose lists no one knew. And still the troops of the provisional government did not arrive. Only later it became known that no such troops actually existed. The few units which might perhaps have been persuaded to advance against the Bolsheviks could not be moved to Petrograd owing to the extremely ambiguous, half-Bolshevist attitude taken up by the Central Executive Committee of the Railway Union, the so-called Vixel. Under pretext of putting an end to the civil war the Vixel forbade the transit of anti-Bolshevist units, while allowing Bolshevist troops to travel. The Bolsheviks themselves, after proclaiming themselves a government, did not know what forces were at Kierinsky's disposal. Trotsky, then merely president of the Petrograd Soviet, ordered trenches to be dug around the city against Kierinsky's Kornilov bands. Skirmishes were taking place around Petrograd at Krasnu Silo, Gatchina, and Zarsku. No one knew their results. In Petrograd itself there was no organized military resistance. The youthful heroism of the cadets was of no importance whatever. The military situation became clear five days after the occupation of the Winter Palace. The Pravda published on the 14th of November a statement of General Krasnov, signed by him, in which he reported his last conversation with the Commander-in-Chief. Kierinsky was very nervous and excited. General, you have betrayed me, said Kierinsky. Your Cossacks say that they will arrest and deliver me to the sailors. Yes, replied Krasnov, such talk is current, I know there is no sympathy for you anywhere. But the officers also say the same. The officers are also dissatisfied with you. What am I to do? Am I to commit suicide? General Krasnov proposed that Kierinsky should go to Petrograd carrying a white flag and enter into negotiations with the military revolutionary staff. Kierinsky apparently acquiesced and asked for a guard, but while the general was assembling the convoy the commander-in-chief disappeared. In such terms did the Cossack general, clearly ill-disposed towards Kierinsky, describe the last moments spent by the ill-starred commander-in-chief in the midst of his handful of supporters.
It is difficult to define precisely what had taken place at Gachina, but it is certain that Gierinsky had no military supporters and found himself obliged to cling to a few hundred Cossacks, of whom there were not more than 1,500. Moreover, the Cossacks had for a long time been antagonistic towards him, while Gierinsky himself mistrusted them, suspecting them of counter revolutionary leanings. Besides this, the Cossacks had no desire to fight against superior forces of Red Guards. They began to fraternize and ended the battle, or rather the slight skirmish, by a peace treaty which guaranteed them a safe return to their homes. Under such conditions Kierensky's sojourn among them became very dangerous, because he was confronted by a foe who did not even spare peaceful citizens. When the Cossacks retreated from Zarko Silo the Red Guards raided the dainty little town and proceeded to lay down the law. The priests in the churches were at that time offering prayers for the cessation of fratricidal war. One of them, Father John Kosharov, was dragged out of the church for that prayer and shot before the eyes of his schoolboy son. With the disappearance of Kierensky the Petrograd military operations came to an end. No aid was forthcoming from headquarters, for the two no one knew what to do. The chief of the staff, Duklin, assumed the post of Supreme Commander-in-Chief on the 14th November in view of General Krasnov's report that Commander-in-Chief Kierensky had abandoned the detachment and his present abode was unknown. General Duklin ordered no more troops to be sent to Petrograd, more especially as negotiations are in progress between political parties concerning the formation of a provisional government. In anticipation of the solution of the crisis, I summon the troops calmly to fulfill their duty in order to prevent any further German advance. Such was the end of Kierensky's military career. He did not even risk going to headquarters to seek support from there. Who, indeed, could have given it. After the arrest of Kornilov and other generals, the authority of headquarters was already broken. Negotiations concerning the formation of a government were actually taking place. Part of the Socialistic Center dreamed of creating a coalition ministry of members of all socialistic parties, including the Bolsheviks. But the parties, themselves split up into numerous factions, could arrive at no agreement upon the subject. One faction of the Mensheviks desired an agreement. Another was opposed to it. A sharp cleavage took place in the Social Revolutionary Party. Social revolutionaries of the left were acting in accord with the Bolsheviks. Those of the right supported Kierensky and were consequently antagonists of the Bolsheviks. The center, led by Genov, denounced the Military Revolutionary Committee, but sought for an understanding with Smolny. The Bolsheviks put an end to both vacillations and hopes, by adopting the resolution that the Central Executive Committee, which was entirely in their hands, was the only source of authority. This resolution finally set aside all those very socialists who had persisted with such enduring and touching fidelity in treating the Bolsheviks as their comrades in ideas. Even the internationalists, that intermediate faction of the Social Democrats which from the first days of the revolution had professed the same ideas as the Bolsheviks, expressed their indignation. They withdrew from the Central Executive Committee, declaring as their motive that the Bolshevist resolution was a challenge to all parties. Responsibility for the prolongation of the civil war falls upon the Bolsheviks. The breach was soon healed. They became reconciled and remained in the Soviets occasionally allowing themselves the luxury of criticism. In acute opposition to the Bolsheviks stood all the state socialists, Polekhanov's group, the populist socialists, a faction of the social revolutionaries. In this they were at one with the cadets, who adopted an irreconcilable attitude. Notwithstanding the firing in the streets, the constant domiciliary visits, arrests, and menaces, the Cadet Party never ceased openly and determinedly to denounce the Bolsheviks at various meetings and in the Municipal Council. The leader of the party, P. Myliukov, was absent from Petrograd. The central figure of the conflict became A. Y. Shingarf, one of the most popular cadet leaders. A doctor by profession, a man of enormous capacity for work and chivalrous devotion to duty, he was respected and admired not only by his numerous adherents, 
but also by opponents. Enemies he had none. Modest, straightforward, gentle, although sternly inexorable in questions of moral principle, he was a typical Russian Democrat, both in private life and in his ideas. His name was familiar to all reading Russia. He was thrice elected to the Duma, was a member of Prince Gilvov's cabinet, first as Minister of Agriculture, later as Minister of Finance. At the same time he remained member of the Petrograd Municipal Council, and after the November Revolution took advantage of his position to lead a daring anti-Bolshevist campaign from the platform of the town hall. His speeches had an enormous influence upon the Municipal Council, and rendered any compromise with Smolny morally impossible to the social revolutionary members. A. Y. Shingraf denied with harsh indignation all possibility of compliance with the Bolsheviks, whom he denounced as usurpers and criminals. There may be fanatics and madmen in their midst, said he, but there seem to be more provocateurs and members of the Okhrana. The Bolsheviks have an undoubted mixture of German spies and in confirmation of his statement he described a domiciliary visit at one of the women's organizations. The Reds looted the premises, carried off clothes, money, valuables. They carried off everything they could lay their hands upon, but they left something behind. After they were gone a German mark was found upon the floor. Any attempt at an agreement with such people would be countenancing a crime. Those among you, he added, turning to the socialists, who think to put an end to bloodshed by peaceful methods of agreement, are greatly mistaken. You will achieve nothing, for they will not stop halfway in their struggle. Shingraf demanded the restoration of the authority of the provisional government and the most energetic struggle against the Bolsheviks. As I have said, during those November days the Petrograd Municipal Council was not only the sole existing political center, besides the Smolny Institute, but also the only lawful body of representatives of the people. In this we could rival the Soviet. Elections to the Soviet were absolutely arbitrary, whereas the Municipal Council had been elected on the arch-democratic principle of universal or proportional representation. Various parties were represented as follows, 75 social revolutionaries, 205,000 votes, 67 Bolsheviks, 183,000 votes, 42 cadets, 115,000 votes. The remaining 15 members represented various small socialistic groups, which altogether obtained only 35,000 votes out of the total of 530,000. The Bolsheviks were in an absolute minority. For this reason the socialist members of the municipal council attempted to influence the population against the Bolsheviks. They motored to the factories, made speeches, put up posters, appealing to the reason, conscience, or even to the mere instinct of self-preservation of their electors. All was in vain. Popularity had flown from the social revolutionaries. Their followers of yesterday now ran after the chariot of the conqueror, believing that Lenin and Trotsky would give them peace and bread, liberty and happiness. The Bolsheviks did not at once realize the full scope of their influence. They thought themselves obliged at first to reckon with the municipal council, and did not risk employing those physical methods of compulsion which had enabled them to seize and retain power. After the coup d'etat the Bolshevist members issued an appeal to the population, declaring the municipal council to be a bourgeois institution. Instead of fulfilling their plain duties, the social revolutionaries of the right and the cadets have transformed the municipal council into an arena of political strife against the Soviets, against the revolutionary government of peace, bread, and liberty. Then the Bolsheviks demonstratively left the town hall. Their seats remained empty. Only one or two Bolsheviks, obviously delegated for obtaining information, remained gloomily listening to the orators whose speeches usually denounced Bolshevist crimes. The opposition of the Petrograd Municipal Council acted as a stimulant to the irreconcilable attitude adopted by the majority of the intelligentsia towards the Bolsheviks. 
but the municipal council was unable to engage in any active conflict against the armed usurpers. On the night of the coup d'etat, a committee of public safety had been organized in connection with the municipal council, comprising, besides members of the council, representatives of various democratic organizations, such as the Central Executive Committee of Workmen's Deputies, the Peasants' Deputies, the Centre of Flot, the Army Committees, etc. Amid the turmoil of civil war this committee acted as a kind of Red Cross unit. Owing to its mixed composition, and partly thanks to the social revolutionary and internationalist members, the Municipal Council was able to render assistance, not only to the Women's Battalion, which found itself under the surveillance of the Red Guard, but also to the military cadets. The Municipal Council obtained the release of hundreds of arrested cadets, provided them with money, and helped them to leave Petrograd. The cadets were the last organized unit of the Russian army. Being reliable soldiers, after the March Revolution they were chiefly employed to mount guard. At the time of the November Revolution they found themselves in respect of Kierinsky in the position of the Swiss Guards of Versailles in the reign of Louis XVI. The officers were unorganized, whereas after all the cadet schools constituted armed and disciplined military units. Their composition, as regards class and political sympathies, was extremely varied. Before the war the cadet schools, which trained the future officers, were more or less caste institutions where free education was given to officers' sons. But after the terrible losses sustained by the officers' staff in the war the cadet schools began to admit young men of very low educational standard as well as privates who had distinguished themselves in active service. Just before the revolution these schools were filled with sons of peasants, artisans, small shopkeepers, clerks, and had generally become absolutely democratic. This, however, did not prevent the Bolsheviks from declaring that all the cadets were the sons of landowners and capitalists. This untruth was necessary to them for deepening class consciousness, or rather class war. Even Gorky, who in many respects was very sympathetic to extreme Marxian tendencies, wrote an indignant protest in his paper. It is, of course, an impudent lie to say that all the cadets are landowners' sons, and as such are subject to extermination. It is a falsehood perpetrated by adventurers and frantic demagogues. Yet this conscious falsehood, so persistently and variously repeated by the Bolsheviks, rendered the very name of cadet odious to the masses. The Red Guards, and especially the soldiers who had joined them, were persuaded that they were fighting not against Kierinsky or the provisional government, but against the cadets. In Bolshevist language, the very word cadet became a word of abuse, whereas people who clung to any hope of saving Russia from anarchy saw in these very cadets the last mainstay of the crumbling state. The cadets, who had been training for war with Germany, were drawn by the force of events into the vortex of a far more terrible civil war. Among them were young men of various political convictions. Many were probably simply indifferent to politics but being educated soldiers they remained more loyal to duty and their oath of allegiance. When the Bolsheviks set up the frenzied persecution of the cadets they, too, naturally began to feel a fierce resentment against those who incited the mob against them. After the fighting at Petrograd and Moscow, numbers of cadets, together with the officers, fled to the south to join General Alexeyev. They preferred enlisting in the ranks of an army even a volunteer army, to living under the constant menace of being lynched by soldiers or Red Guards. At Moscow, the resistance to the Military Revolutionary Committee was infinitely better organized than the attempts at self-defense made by the provisional government at Petrograd. The Moscow regional commander, Colonel Ryabov, shut himself up in the Kremlin with a detachment of officers, students, and cadets. They possessed arms and even guns. The Municipal Council organized a committee of public safety, which found itself in the very center of the fighting, as the town hall is situated by the Kremlin. The social revolutionaries, beginning with the mayor, Mr. Rudnev, felt very uncertain. By force of habit they were on the side of the Reds, 
but were defended by the whites, as the Bolsheviks had contemptuously nicknamed their opponents. The number of fighting men was extremely insignificant on both sides. The majority of the workmen and the soldiers remained neutral and waited to see who would carry the day. Once more, as in Petrograd, the democratic elector, who had so largely voted for the social revolutionaries and also given them an absolute majority in the Moscow Municipal Council, proffered no support to the men of his choice at the moment of real peril. The battle lasted seven days. Shells rained over Moscow, setting fire to the houses, whose inhabitants dared not leave them, for rifle and machine gun bullets whizzed along the streets. The city was transformed into a battlefield over which peaceful citizens still found themselves obliged to wander, as no one had sufficient food supplies to last so long. No one knew exactly the whereabouts of the government or of Bolshevist forces. Everyone expected the arrival of troops from the front. When it became obvious that no troops were forthcoming, the Committee of Public Safety concluded a treaty with the Military Revolutionary Committee which guaranteed the personal inviolability and liberty of the vanquished that is of the whites. On the 15th of November Moscow was handed over to the Bolsheviks. Thus was all armed resistance practically ended in the cities, where the Soviets had at their disposal stores of ammunition and a considerable, although disorderly, contingent of manpower. On the contrary, in the south, in Cossack lands, the nucleus of a volunteer army was formed in November. General Alexov, disguised as a workman, with only a few rubles in his pocket, fled to the Don. Officers, who did not wish to acknowledge the Bolshevist authority, and dreamed of continuing the struggle against Germany, soon began to flock around him. The socialist revolutionary democracy eyed this new movement with disfavor, as concealing a possibility of the regeneration of a strong and disciplined Russian army. Generals always excited suspicion among the first Soviet's members. What if they are plotting a counter revolution? When it became known that Kornilov, Denikin, and other generals arrested by Kierensky had escaped from the Bikhov prison and joined Alexov and Kaledin at Novokokask, this suspicious attitude towards the Southern Volunteer Army became still more pronounced. The paper edited by the Social Revolutionary Leader, V. Genov, while demanding a purely socialistic ministry with the exclusion of Bolsheviks, said, Bolsheviks are victorious in the north, Kaledin in the south. They join hands for the destruction of the revolution. Our task is to knock both counter-revolutions on the head. We must fight the Bolsheviks by force of organization, and Kaledin by force of arms, Dilo Naroda, 16th of December 1917. Far greater sympathy was manifested in socialist circles towards another effort of resistance to Bolshevist usurpation organized by civilians, namely, the strike of the government officials. Like the rest of the population, Russian officials welcomed the March Revolution, which brought the Russian people their longed for political liberty. They expressed their readiness to serve under the provisional government, and all remained at their posts. But when the Bolsheviks seized power the officials at one with all the Russian intelligentsia received them with indignant protest, and not only did not wish to work with them, but flatly refused to recognize the Soviet rule. It might have seemed that the modest, downtrodden officials, stifled by office routine, unaccustomed to political struggle, would be the last men capable or desirous of struggling against the new club law, proclaimed as it was in the name of socialism. But the Russian bureaucracy so constantly, and frequently with such good cause, denounced and rebuked by the intelligentsia opposition had proved itself capable of imbuing its servants with a sense of responsibility towards Russia as a whole which was lacking in many representatives of the liberal professions, and in the dark hour of misfortune which beset the Russian state created by the strenuous efforts of generations of Russian men and women. These inconspicuous workers who had built and supported it all rose up to defend it. It goes without saying that the officials were incapable of offering any armed resistance when even the officers were unable to do so. But the entire state machine was in the hands of the officials, and they resolved to prevent the Bolsheviks from assuming its control. After the March Revolution, 
numerous officials employed in various government offices and institutions had organized themselves in unions. After the November coup d'etat these separate unions became associated in a union of unions, which comprised both senior and junior officials. During the Kierensky regime, besides the sittings of the provisional government where ministers mainly discussed and decided problems of general policy, there also met the so-called Minor Council of Ministers, comprised of all the assistant ministers, which settled questions relating to administration. After the arrest of the provisional government the Minor Council of Ministers continued its sittings, striving to preserve the succession of authority and, if possible, to reinstate the power of the provisional government. They met secretly, like conspirators, constantly changing their quarters, as the Bolsheviks might appear at any moment and arrest them. These remnants of the provisional government were certainly devoid of any physical force, but the entire mechanism of the state, insofar as it is regulated by office work, was under their control. The officials indignantly refused to recognize the commissaries and offered them every possible resistance. The minor council met this patriotic state of mind halfway. A strike of government officials was decided upon. When Bolshevist commissaries came to the government offices and institutions they found either closed doors, or were met by officials who refused even to speak to the Soviet representatives. If the latter insisted, bureaus would be locked up before their very faces and keys carried away. An important part in the organization of the Union of Unions and of the official strike was played by Countess Sophia Painin. She was a member of the Minor Council as Assistant Minister of Education. An aristocrat by birth, the sole heiress of one of the largest fortunes in Russia, she devoted all her mind and rare energy, to say nothing of means, to public education. Countess Sophia Painin had erected in one of the Petrograd working class districts a model people's palace, which she managed herself, thereby winning the workmen's sympathy and approval. The Tsarist regime was no lover of such hobbies, and placed obstacles in the way of all cultural enterprises. But owing to her close ties with court circles, Countess Painan contrived to safeguard her people's palace from police aggression. She was what is known in Russia as a cultural worker, and took no part in politics. The war broke out. Countess Painan devoted herself to the complicated home war work without which no army could have endured the strain of the war. The revolution compelled her to take up politics. She joined the Cadets Party, was elected to the Central Committee https colon slash slash www.yamaguchi.com slash library slash tikova slash tikova underscore eleven dot html and afterwards successively occupied the posts of Assistant Minister of Public Welfare and Assistant Minister of Education. A woman of indomitable courage and resolution, Countess Painan lent not only moral, but also important material support to the strike of officials. Every strike primarily demands funds. As this strike was organized for the defense not of any class interests, but of those of the entire state, it naturally had to be supported by state funds. Countess S. Painan provided the officials with means to continue the strike for two months by advancing certain sums to their leaders. The strike of the officials gradually developed, arousing the vexation of one part of the population and the sympathy of the other. The state bank became the object of the most bitter contest. The Bolsheviks made their appearance at the bank, demanding that 10 million rubles should be placed to the current account of the Soviet of People's Commissaries. The Council of the State Bank refused upon the plea that the Soviet of People's Commissaries is an institution which does not possess legal rights. The Bolsheviks arrested several officials. The commissary reappeared at the State Bank and announced that the ten millions were wanted for the Red Guard, which would disperse if not paid. This was for the director of the bank a most unconvincing argument. He would have been only too pleased if all the Reds dispersed. The soldiers of the Semenovsky regiment who mounted guard at the bank, apparently realizing that the whole nation's wealth stored in the bank's cellars could not be handed over for plunder to a band of usurpers, ignored the commissary and obeyed the director of the bank. The building was several times surrounded by troops. The officials would not yield. 
Then the Bolsheviks changed the sentry and arrested the council of the bank. All the clerks struck work and withdrew, carrying away books and keys, and informing the population of their action in the following proclamation, the state bank is closed. The acts of violence performed by the Bolsheviks at the state bank have rendered work impossible. The very first act of the people's commissaries took the form of a demand for 10 million rubles, while on the 14th of November they already demanded 25 millions without stating the ultimate allocation of these sums. Even during the Tsarist regime the state bank did not pay out money without receiving an account. We, the officials of the state bank, cannot take part in the plunder of the nation's inheritance. We have struck work. Citizens, if you safeguard the nation's wealth from plunder, and defend us from violence, we shall immediately resume our work. Some attempts were made to support the strikers by collections, but unfortunately, mostly by resolutions passed in various political parties and organizations, such as the Municipal Council, the unions of professors and representatives of other liberal professions, the Committee for Saving the Country and the Revolution organized to fight the Bolsheviks, etc. The latter committee issued a proclamation of protest against the seizure of the state bank, this must be put a stop to. We call upon all Petrograd citizens to protest. Workmen, you are menaced with unemployment. Soldiers, the Bolsheviks make robbers of you. Protest. Down with the rule of the usurpers. Neither the soldiers nor the workmen responded to the call. They believed the Bolshevist leaders, who incited them against the officials, accusing them of sabotage, counter-revolutionary plots and branding them as enemies of the people. The Military Revolutionary Committee issued a threatening order, the wealthy classes and their menials will forfeit the right of obtaining victuals. All the food supplies in their possession will be requisitioned and the property of the chief offenders confiscated, 20th November. In vain did the intelligentsia strive to prove both in the press and at extempore street meetings, which was still possible, that the Bolsheviks were the real enemies of the people, that on the contrary the officials were safeguarding the nation's interests by preventing the Bolsheviks from ruining the state. In vain did the officials themselves attempt to refute the Bolsheviks' slanderous accusations by publishing a special appeal to the population, it is not true that the officials are not giving money for the army and bread for the population, and are stopping railway communication, ran the declaration of the Union of Unions. On the contrary, all institutions administering these branches are unceasingly and unsparingly working by order of the Union of Unions. It is not true that the officials are hand in glove with the rich. The salary of most of the officials does not exceed a workman's wages. We ourselves are part of that oiling democracy, we uphold not the rich, but the rights of the whole nation, the rights of an all national authority, the rights of the constituent assembly. Lenin's Soviet of People's Commissaries is not a government of workmen and soldiers, but a group of men who have usurped power despite the will of a vast majority of the population. They threaten to disperse the Constituent Assembly if it does not submit to their will. They are preparing a new civil war, to drown in the blood of the people the cause of national liberty. We should be traitors to our motherland if we offered our knowledge and labor to the usurpers, if we assisted them in organizing their power over the country, strengthening them for the struggle against the Constituent Assembly, and seizing millions of money belonging to the nation for the continuation and spreading of civil war. But we are not traitors, and we declare that we will not work with those who are plotting against the Constituent Assembly. This proclamation was posted up secretly in the night in the streets of Petrograd. Several young men, caught upon the spot with proclamations, were arrested by the Bolsheviks. But the masses, whom the strikers were attempting to convince, read their bitterly truthful declaration with a contemptuous sneer. Workmen, soldiers, women, had but one answer to all the speeches of their opponents We don't believe you. You are bourgeois, Kornilov minions. You've drunk enough of our blood. There was little sense in those words but they were repeated with the immutable accuracy of a sacred formula responding to some vague long-concealed sentiments, which now stirred the people. 
an impenetrable veil seemed to be drawn between the crowd possessed by Bolshevist frenzy and all those who attempted to struggle, at least by word if not by deed, against this wholesale class madness. Every act of opposition to Bolshevism aroused the acute anger of the crowds. The people's commissaries very cleverly fanned it into flames in the press by their speeches and their decrees. Spite against the officers and officials, against the entire intelligentsia, which had from the very beginning refused to submit to the Soviet of people's commissaries, grew apace. Amid the helpless protests of the more cultured classes, both among the intelligentsia and workmen, and to the loud applause of the ignorant misled populace, the Bolsheviks took drastic action against the unsubmissive officials. The great majority of the strikers were modest toilers living from hand to mouth upon small salaries. Some of them occupied government lodgings, the Bolsheviks turned them out into the street in the cold with their wives and children. But neither material privations nor arrests, perquisitions nor menace of court-martial could prevail upon the strikers to surrender. True, at the time the Bolsheviks had only proclaimed the terror, but had not yet introduced it as a system of government. Still shots were always heard round Smolny. No one knew who might be shot at any time. But all did know that for sabotage people were taken to Smolny. And yet, in spite of danger and threats, the little clerks, whose names never were and never will be known, staunchly defended the Russian state, parts of which were being, one by one, smashed to atoms by the Bolsheviks. This strike of government officials in which all, from assistant ministers down to the last junior clerk, took part, presented one of the most interesting episodes of the Russian Revolution. It demonstrated that Russian statehood had created not only submissive executors of the master's will, but had also imbued those insignificant executors with a deep, self-sacrificing national sense of duty, which in the moment of peril developed into heroism. If that heroism came to nothing and ended in victory for the Bolsheviks, the fault lay least of all with the officials themselves. Like most Russians, they believed that Lenin's power could not last, that after a certain lapse of time the Constituent Assembly would come into being and the Provisional Government would be reinstated. History, however, decreed otherwise. In a month's time it became necessary to prepare for what was called a liquidation of the strike. It was drawn out until the opening of the Constituent Assembly. When it became obvious that no Constituent Assembly was possible, it was decided to end the strike. By that time the Bolsheviks had already decided they could manage everything themselves and were not in need of experienced and expert officials. They appointed porters as head clerks, charwomen as headmistresses of girls' schools, etc. Numbers of officials remain literally in the street doomed to a lingering death. Like all the rest of the Russian intelligentsia, the officials were confronted with the hard dilemma of either surrendering to the mercy of the victors, whom they looked upon as criminals and enemies of Russia, or of taking up physical labor, which could not be easily obtained, or as a last resource of starting on a pilgrimage across the vast country weltering in anarchy until they might reach some border state unconquered by the Soviets. The meritorious service rendered by the officials to the Russian state was emphasized in the farewell decree issued on 1 December by the late members of the provisional government. It was signed by several assistant ministers and by the socialist ministers, S. Prokopovich, A. Nikitin, K. Gvosdv, A. Livarovsky, S. Maslov. The non-socialist ministers were unable to sign it, as they had not been liberated, but were still held as hostages in the Peter and Paul fortress. Most valuable service has been rendered by the personnel of officials and clerks working in government institutions in safeguarding the institutions from attempts at encroachment on the part of irresponsible and illegal usurpers. Thus ran the declaration, fearing neither threats, nor violence, neither shrinking from personal sacrifice, fully conscious of their right and their duty to the motherland, the officials and employees unfalteringly carried out their trust, protested bravely and decisively against the seizure of the institutions by rebels and prevented individuals, styling themselves the people's commissaries, from taking possession of the national inheritance. 
the members of the late provisional government, calling upon the people to struggle against the Bolsheviks, pointed out the perils of their rule, the negotiations for an armistice started by the rebels in the name of the Russian state can only lead to a separate peace shameful and ruinous for Russia. Unless powerfully opposed by the army and the people, these insane actions will reduce Russia to a state of political and economic slavery, provoke a rupture with the Entente powers, eliminate Russia from among the great powers, and doom her to the fate of a vanquished nation surrendering to the mercy of the conquerors. Such unprecedented temerity of action by the rebels obliges the provisional government of the Russian Republic to declare that these actions can in no wise be recognized as acts of government or as expressing the will of the people. Admitting that the usurpers will not refrain from laying their hands even upon the Constituent Assembly. If the latter does not submit to their will, the provisional government appeals to all citizens in the army and the homeland for a united defense of the constituent assembly as a guarantee of the possibility of its powerful and firm declaration of the will of the people. While acknowledging the merits and courage of the government officials in safeguarding the interests of the state, the representatives of the provisional government give a far from favorable estimate of the activities of other organizations the committees for saving the motherland and the revolution and committees of public safety organized at the outbreak of the rebellion offered no support to the legal supreme authority, but aimed at the creation of a uniform socialistic cabinet. The provisional government has throughout firmly adhered to the principle of an all-national power. Acting upon such a basis, the provisional government could not recognize the authority of the rebels and would not participate in the attempt to create a new power upon the eve of the constituent assembly. This was an allusion to the attempt to entice the socialist ministers to compromise with the Bolsheviks. After the coup d'etat various public forces grouped around the first Soviet endeavored in their own way to oppose the Bolsheviks. They first organized the Committee for Saving the Motherland and the Revolution. Later, they formed the Committee for the Defense of the Constituent Assembly. As the leaders of the Socialist Center might at any moment be arrested or even shot, they were obliged to act in secrecy and return to their former mode of living with false passports and under disguise, hiding in other people's flats as in the days of Tsarism. It is extremely difficult to trace their underhand activity particularly as it brought no results. It was naturally difficult for representatives of parties which for so long had been in friendly intercourse with the Bolsheviks to find a psychological standpoint justifying a change of attitude on their part. Upon a certain November day the Bolsheviks suddenly arrested the Lord Mayor and several members of the Municipal Council, both socialists and cadets. The Lord Mayor, G.R. Schreider was one of the superior representatives of the Social Revolutionary Party, an honest, fairly able man, and a capable journalist. When he was brought to the Smolny and led into the room occupied by the previously arrested members of the Municipal Council, the arrested Lord Mayor made a tour of the Red Guard sentries and shook hands with them all. What are you doing? indignantly asked one of the Municipal members, a cadet. What's the matter? I look upon them as comrades. And I look upon them as jail birds, replied the cadet brusquely. When at a meeting of the Petrograd Municipal Corporation, another social revolutionary, the mayor of Moscow, Rudnev, was telling the tragic story of the capture of Moscow by the Bolsheviks. He was always trying to emphasize the fact that he had not sought nor desired an armed struggle against them. Even after the Bolsheviks had openly renounced their former friendship, after the social revolutionary Kierensky and many others had been denounced as counter-revolutionaries, the socialists of the center still found it hard to understand that now they could no longer sit between two stools, that they would either have to declare war against the Bolsheviks or submissively don the Bolshevist uniform. For the Bolsheviks were socialists, and socialists must stand shoulder to shoulder against the rest of non-socialistic mankind lumped together as the bourgeoisie. The attempt of the socialistic parties to come to an agreement with the Bolsheviks, referred to by the ministers, is thus comprehensible. It was a childish scheme, 
as neither the former ministers nor the people's commissaries desired such an agreement. The socialistic group that had seized power had no intention of sharing it with anyone. On the contrary, the Bolsheviks were getting a firmer grip of everything, abolishing all organizations, all institutions which, in one way or another, were incarnations and expressions of the people's will. The first stage of the armed struggle between the Bolsheviks and the adherents of the provisional government was rapidly brought to a close. Hardly had Petrograd been encircled by trenches against the Kronilevist gangs of Gierinsky, by Trotsky's orders, than there were no longer any anti Bolshevist gangs either in Petrograd or in the environs. Gierinsky himself disappeared on the 14th of November and it was only in the summer of 1918 that he again turned up, not in Russia, but abroad. Moscow resisted from the 8th to the 15th of November. Then the Bolsheviks were victorious. In both Moscow and Petrograd armed resistance was at an end. True, it was necessary to conquer the rest of Russia, but the Bolsheviks held the arsenals and munition works, the state bank, and the government printing works. They declared Petrograd to be in a state of siege, and treated the population as conquerors treat a conquered country. In the Council of the Republic, that last organ of state where the various currents of Russian political life could still find expression, the Bolsheviks, on demonstratively leaving that bourgeois institution, repeated their war cry All power to the Soviets! All the land to the people! Hail to an immediate, honest, democratic peace! hailed to the Constituent Assembly. Now they were in a position to fulfill these promises, but the Bolsheviks were consistent only in the fulfillment of the first two clauses of that short, but tempting program power to the Soviets, and land to all. Chaptics at consolidation of the Bolshevist power Bolsheviks and Germans whence came the money? A morality of Lenin Trotsky and other heroes decrees about land and peace and some crown code the separate armistice the march against the Stavka brutal murder of Dukin in the Brest Litovsk negotiations Soviet rule decrees about the press raiding of newspaper offices. A. I. Shingarf, in his diary for December 1917, thus defines the elements involved in the Bolshevist movement 1. A. The laboring classes, ignorant, politically uneducated, and embittered by social inequality and the economic ruin of the country entailed by the war, b, a mass of unbridled and licentious soldiery, averse from fighting, young, undrilled, and idle, taken away from healthy agricultural labor, at an age when their energies are still seeking an outlet, when they are easily carried away by the most extreme theories. Masses politically as ignorant, or even more so, than the workmen, and still more inclined to violence and robbery. Two criminals from prison. Three former Zarist secret police employees who have attached themselves to Bolshevism. Four German spies and Germanophiles. Five idealists of the dictatorship of the proletariat, fanatics of social revolution, mudmen, and adepts at internal class war. This is a broad and exhaustive analysis of their composition. Its value is increased by the fact that Shingar wrote his diary while imprisoned in the fortress, where he was in constant danger of being lynched by the Reds. Nevertheless, even in prison, he tried to be just in his estimate of them, and to understand the essence of Bolshevism. There is a widespread conviction that the Bolsheviks attained power and influence with the help of the Germans. The officers and cadets who had remained loyal to the provisional government, related afterwards that the Red Guard in Moscow was commanded by German officers, that German talk was frequently overheard among the soldiers besieging the Kremlin. Krasnov's Cossacks also said that the Germans had assisted the Reds in the fighting near Gachina. In proportion to the gradual development of Bolshevism, the Soviets made ever more frequent use of German and Magyar prisoners of war for the conquest of Russian territories. Sometimes these prisoners were disguised as Russian soldiers. In January 1918, I met on the Navo embankment at Petrograd two soldiers wearing Russian military overcoats. I was struck by their soldierly bearing, for by this time soldiers had lost all trace of military discipline. As these two smart looking Russian soldiers approached, 
I overheard them talking in the purest Berlin dialect of what they would do upon their return to Germany. It is by no means easy to ascertain how far the Bolsheviks employed German aid in their plot to take hold of the Russian state. Kierensky's government had not concluded the investigation of the July revolt. The veil had only partially been withdrawn by the data published by the procurator on the 3rd of August. It certified that Lenin and Zinoviev were arrested in Austria in 1914, then liberated under certain conditions. That large sums of money were transferred to Petrograd by a Russian Jew Helephant, commonly known among international socialists by his literary pseudonym of Parvus. This obscure international speculator, who acquired an enormous fortune, styled himself as the ideal inspirer of Bolshevism. The German Social Democrat Hayes revealed the strange connections of Parvis with the Imperial German government. This fact did not prevent Sidman from keeping up friendly relations with Parvis, and from staying with him at Copenhagen in the sumptuous villa of this apostle of the dictatorship of the proletariat. The Russian intelligence department possessed data proving the connection between the Bolsheviks and the German general staff. But Kierensky's government fell apart, without having published its information, and without arriving at any definite conclusion upon the subject. At the time of the November coup d'etat all the documents of the intelligence department, which was immediately seized by the Bolsheviks, apparently fell into the hands of the victors. Possibly we shall never learn the whole truth of how the Bolsheviks sold and betrayed Russia. Perhaps only if revolutionary Germany consents to publish the documents of imperial secret diplomacy, when many curious details concerning Bolshevist activities both before and during the revolution may come to light, as well as an explanation as to why Lenin had been so graciously allowed to pass through Germany. At times the Russian and particularly the foreign press published various documents pointing to the pecuniary and military connections between the Bolsheviks and the German government. However, experts doubt the authenticity of these documents, and logically they contain many contradictions. But some facts are indubitable. Firstly, that Lenin and other Bolsheviks passed through Germany when the war was still at a climax. Secondly, the enormous sums of money at the disposal of the Bolsheviks from the very outset of the revolution. No other party, either socialist or radical possessed the means of subsidizing or planning their propaganda on such a large scale as did the Bolsheviks. Https colon slash slash www.yamaguchi.com slash library slash tikava slash tikavo underscore twelve dot html they printed papers and pamphlets, freely distributing millions of copies to the army at the front and in the rear. Their orators received high day wages. Soldiers, and especially sailors who had joined the Bolshevist party, had their pockets full of hundred ruble notes. When the sailors came to the villages to preach Marxian ideas of universal equalization of property, the peasants were not so much impressed by their words as by the sight of the banknotes, which the orators dangled carelessly before the simple minded village audience. Bolshevist emigres abroad lived in great poverty. Later they received money from the Austrian and German governments and set up publishing Bolshevist papers in Switzerland for socialistic propaganda among Russian prisoners of war. Besides the Bolsheviks, the social revolutionaries, first among whom was their leader Genov, also collaborated in these papers. At the beginning of the revolution in Russia the numbers of adherents to Bolshevism, judging by the elections to the Soviets, were not considerable and they could not provide the enormous sums spent by their leaders. Even the Petrograd Soviet and the Executive Committee at the zenith of their popularity were poor compared with the Bolshevist organizations. One is forced to draw the conclusion that the hundreds of thousands, or rather millions, spent by Lenin and his followers were furnished to them from some exchequer which possessed millions at its disposal. Only banks and state exchequers have the possibility of subsidizing propaganda on such a scale. Bolsheviks were of no advantage to banks, they were rather a menace. Of all states, Germany and Austria were the only ones interested in the destruction of the Russian army and state, in the disintegration of the Russian people through the medium of the Bolsheviks. Therefore we are faced with the only logical solution 
that the millions of rubles spent by the Bolsheviks upon agitation and preparation for the seizure of power could only come from German source. The link uniting the Bolsheviks to the German general staff can also be mainly established by indirect proofs. From the outset of the revolution the propaganda of the Bolsheviks as well as that of other socialists about ending the war, democratizing the army, fraternizing with the enemy, met the unanimous support of German propagandists who scattered leaflets at the Russian front. The text of those pamphlets, printed by order of the Kaiser's government, often literally coincided with that text of the leaflets printed in Russia by order of the central committees of the socialist parties. One cannot omit the fact that Bolshevist propaganda was especially rife and successful in regions of particular strategic importance, or in food supply centers, equally important strategically. Helsingfors, Vyborg, Kronstadt, Riga were all approaches to Petrograd. In Petrograd itself the Vyborgsky side, Vasilvsky Ostrov, the Putilov and Abukhov munition factories. On the Volga, the principal corn wharves, and Rybinsk, Zaritsyn, and Kazan, which contained depots of artillery plant and stores of explosives. During the armed November coup d'etat, the Bolsheviks' dispositions exhibited traces of a military organization whose specialists were not to be found in their ranks. The Cossacks, who fought the Red Guards and sailors near Gatchina, were amazed at seeing the Reds execute a specific German maneuver. As the civil war waxed stronger, the participation of German officers and soldiers became ever plainer. A Magyar division was organized to oppose General Alexa from the Don, and soon became the military backbone of the Bolsheviks. The Brest Litovsk peace was not concluded, when the Germans were already assisting the Bolsheviks in their conquest of Russia. Later on, as for instance in all the outbursts of civil war in Siberia, the Bolsheviks made still broader use of such assistance. Detachments composed of these prisoners of war were sometimes called international socialist detachments. I happened to witness early in 1918 a Petrograd Street demonstration of these internationalists carrying red flags. Their numbers were yet small, their expression surly and sheepish. But certainly, Owing to German discipline then still very strong, they were more to be depended upon for military support than the Red Guards. In any case, in spite of the Bolsheviks' clever capacity for concealing the secrets of their diplomacy, one can boldly assert that the Germans, or rather the Imperial German government, had in every way from the very first days of the revolution, if not before, supported the Bolsheviks, encouraged Bolshevism in Russia and been in close contact with it throughout. Https colon slash slash www.yamaguchi.com slash library slash tikiva slash tikiva underscore 12. Html the former apparatus of military espionage, particularly well organized by the Germans at Petrograd, and in Finland, was transformed by them into an instrument of political propaganda, for they fully realized the advantage of disintegrating Russia's naval and military power from inside, instead of attacking it with armed force from outside. And Bolsheviks aspired to a similar disintegration. It certainly does not follow that Bolshevism as a whole had sold itself to Germany. Certainly not. Bolshevism, both in theory and in practice, is a complex phenomenon. Its ideology is based upon the half-scientific hypothesis of the German Jew, Karl Marx. Thus Germany becomes the motherland of Bolshevism. Practical deductions from the experience of the Paris Communists were later added to this purely Marxian doctrine, and the whole was subjugated to Lenin's ambitious tactics and haughty amorality. Lenin and Sidman, even the late Bebel and Jaws pursued one name, the establishment of a class state with a dictatorship of the proletariat, an annihilation of all personal initiative in production and exchange. Bolshevism differs from the more moderate tendencies of social democracy in method, date, in its attitude towards parliamentarism, and chiefly in morality. They all dreamed of a world revolution, but Lenin aimed at its immediate realization, unhampered by any scruples and unhesitating before any sacrifice. I take the liberty of expressing my conviction that to organize the Russian Revolution he had accepted German money, 
most probably through the intermediary of Parvus, or maybe direct from some high or subordinate German officials. It would be naive to suppose that Lenin could be bought. He does not sell himself, but will accept money from anyone. Is it not one and the same to him whose money he takes, once his entire political activity is founded upon the principle that the end justifies the means? In that respect Lenin was not by far the first among Russian revolutionaries. Perhaps the most genuine representative of the type was the well-known revolutionist of the 70s. Nichef.https colon slash slash www.yamaguchi.com slash library slash tikiva slash tikiva underscore twelve dot html a conspirator with the iron will and merciless hardness of a great inquisitor, he composed the famous catechism of a revolutionary, which bears the same black seal of amorality a religious man would call it the seal of antichrist as do the words and deeds of Lenin. A revolutionary despises public opinion, professed Nietzsche in his catechism. He despises and hates contemporary public morality in all its aspirations and manifestations. For him morality means everything that promotes the triumph for the revolution. A revolutionary is a doomed man. Stern unto himself he must also be stern unto others. All tender, softening ties of relationship, friendship, love, gratitude and even honor itself must be crushed in his heart by the one cold passion of revolution. In conformity with this doctrine human beings, all this polluted society, were divided into several categories according to their usefulness for the revolution. All could be deceived, exploited or even murdered. Doctrinaires, conspirators and revolutionaries idly expounding at meetings or on paper should be drawn into head-splitting activities which will result in their loss of the majority of votes. Even the detail was repeated by Lenin, who knows no mercy neither to bourgeois nor to revolutionary. Certainly revolutionaries of Nietzsche's or Lenin's type suffer from what psychiatrists term as moral insanity. They are particularly dangerous on account of their capacity, frequently to be found in lunatics, of shaping the most fantastic, most criminal dreams into a logical scheme. It is the psychical state which begets fanatics. In former times fanaticism generally assumed religious forms, but in our days it assumes a social coloring. It may be, perhaps, because it seeks the support of the masses, and the contemporary masses fall a far easier prey to a socialistic than to a religious epidemic. To understand Bolshevism, one must bear in mind that the Bolsheviks deny all moral standards. In that respect, Lenin appears not only as the strongest but as the most characteristic figure. He draws no limit between truth and falsehood, and lies with the calm shamelessness of a man who is convinced that a universal, social revolution is an aim in itself and is ready to march towards its realization knee-deep in mire and blood, through crime and deceit. All the moral principles fostered by civilization within the soul of contemporary mankind are simply non-existent in Lenin's soul. This moral disease bears a definite name in psychiatry more instance and is partly transmitted to his adepts as a new supermoral doctrine. His contempt for good and evil holds the door wide open for all criminal elements, members of the Okrina, spies, robbers, criminals, who swarm in the Soviets. But the chief members of the Soviet likewise bear the same stamp, at best of an absence of fastidiousness, and immorality at the worst. After Lenin, the most influential Bolshevik is Trotsky Bronstein. In 1906 he was member of the Soviet of Workmen's Deputies organized during the First Revolution. He was arrested, and with some others deported to Siberia, whence he escaped. For eleven years he led the strenuous life of an emigre, painfully earning his living as a journalist. But he exhibited no particular talent for his career. His articles and books were known only among the restricted circles of socialist intelligentsia. Trotsky is ambitious, adroit, certainly unscrupulous. Those who have met him assert that the national humiliations and police persecutions which he, as a Jew, suffered from in Russia made him detest Russia. In any case his actions as Bolshevist dictator demonstrate if not hatred, then at least a fierce contempt of the Russian people. A pusillanimous and self-centered man, 
Trotsky brought over from England a hatred also of that country, because, being suspected of intercourse with the Germans, he was put into an English prison on his way from America to Russia. Trotsky did not at once become Bolshevik. In a book written in 1906 and entitled Our Evolution, he professed more moderate views and advocated a constituent assembly. Only an all national constituent assembly, holding all the keys and picklocks. https colon slash slash www.yamaguchi.com slash library slash tikiva slash tikiva underscore 12. html of all rights and privileges possessing the right of final decision upon all questions, only such a sovereign constituent assembly can without hindrance create a new democratic law. At the time he still professed Marx's view that socialism could not be introduced in the place of capitalism by means of a few decrees, and uttered the warning that would bring the proletariat to a catastrophe. In this book, Trotsky expressed himself against equal land distribution, as it would lead to a purely formal expropriation of smallholders, and a weakening of revolutionary parties. And in the spring of 1917, Trotsky appeared in Russia as a Marxian Bolshevik. Being ambitious, he knew it would be easier for him to obtain a prominent place among the Bolsheviks, because the Mensheviks mistrusted him. As an adroit adventurer, he realized that the maximum program would more surely attract the masses and give power to their tempters. His calculations proved correct. In April, Trotsky had as yet no influence. In summer he was imprisoned for organizing an armed rising, but already in September was once more at liberty and had ousted chides by occupying his post of president of the Petrograd Soviet. This offered him the possibility of organizing the seizure of power. At the time of the November coup d'etat Trotsky was the leading spirit of the Bolshevist uprising. He has remained since then as one of the Bolshevist leaders. An eloquent orator, capable of hypnotizing the mob, he rules over part of Russia, violating ideas and human beings, committing to reason and crime, realizing Machiavelli's precept, that tyrants must have no fear of bloodshed. Lenin and Trotsky share power and influence. Friendship between them there is none. It is said that they often quarrel. Yet like two convicts, bound by the same chain, together they go from crime to crime. And when they perish they will perish together. There are few Russians among the Bolshevist Twilpullers, that is few men imbued with the all-Russian culture and interests of the Russian people. None of them have in any way been prominent in any stage of former Russian life. Among the Bolshevist commissaries we may meet absolute foreigners, like the Austrian, K. Radk a capable and dishonest young adventurer, formerly expelled from the ranks of Polish and German social democracy for underhand dealing. Another foreigner playing an important part in Bolshevist diplomacy is an internationalist social democrat, C. Rukovsky, a Bulgar by origin and Romanian subject, sufficiently well read, but limited almost to dullness. He was delegated by the Soviet of People's Commissaries to conclude peace with Romania. It is open to doubt whether this Romanian subject exhibited particular energy in the defense of Russia's interests. I met him at Petrograd in the spring of 1917 and asked, as an internationalist adhering to the principles of the Zimmerwald Conference of no annexations and indemnities, you naturally do not seek the annexation of Transylvania to Romania. Rakovsky retorted, What? After all the sacrifices made by Romania, you wish us to refuse compensation in the shape of Romanian Transylvania? Not for worlds. Evidently, like the Swiss, Robert Grimm, this Bulgarian socialist, who invariably attended all international socialist conferences, applied different standards to his own country and to foreign ones, particularly to Russia. Besides obvious foreigners, Bolshevism recruited many adherents from among emigres, who had spent many years abroad. Some of them had never been to Russia before. They especially numbered a great many Jews. They spoke Russian badly. The nation over which they had seized power was a stranger to them, and besides, they behaved as invaders in a conquered country. 
Throughout the revolution generally and Bolshevism in particular the Jews occupied a very influential position. This phenomenon is both curious and complex. But the fact remains that such was the case in the primarily elected Soviet, the famous Rio Lieber, Dan, Gotts, and all the more so in the second one. In the Tsarist government the Jews were excluded from all posts. Schools or government service were closed to them. In the Soviet Republic all the committees and commissaries were filled with Jews. They often changed their Jewish name for a Russian one Trotsky Bronstein, Kamen F. Rosenfeld, Zinova Fepfelbaum, Steklov Nakamks, and so on. But such a masquerade deceived no one, while the very pseudonyms of the commissaries only emphasized the international or rather the alien character of Bolshevist rule. This Jewish predominance among Soviet authorities caused the despair of those Russian Jews who, despite the cruel injustice of the Tsarist regime, looked upon Russia as their motherland, who lived the common life of the Russian intelligentsia and refused in common with them all collaboration with the Bolsheviks. But of course there were also Russians among the Bolsheviks workmen, soldiers, peasants. The originator of Bolshevism, Olyana Flanin, is Russian. Lunakarsky, Bonch Bruvish, M. Kolontai, Chicharin all these influential Bolshevist leaders are Russian by origin. But that predominant class which very rapidly crystallized around the Bolsheviks was mainly composed of individuals alien to the Russian people. This fact is probably useful to them to keep control over the masses, for Bolshevist autocracy is founded upon their absolute contempt of the people whom they rule. The most terrible trait of Bolshevism is its utter unscrupulousness as to ways and means, and the blunt cruelty of its leaders. Deceit, forgery, calumny, murder, violence, treachery all the low, dark, brutal forces which mankind had for centuries endeavored to get rid of have become weapons of governing and suppression at their hands. The intelligentsia turn from them with loathing, but on the other hand criminals small and great, policemen, Ukraina officials. Spies all immediately joined their ranks, frequently occupying important posts and defending the new authorities with the utmost zeal. Any struggle against this compact, rapidly organized band of fanatics, criminals, and traitors became extremely difficult. Before coming out, they had prepared a military organization. Their opponents, the provisional government and various political parties, possessed no armed forces and had no longer any prestige for the masses, bewitched by Bolshevism. The poor wearied by the privations of the war and revolution. The wonderful speeches of the agitators baffled their understanding. The promises made their senses real and augmented the mass psychosis of destruction which accompanies every revolution. The Bolsheviks gave their savage instincts full scope by being the first to set the example. But their principal card was that they promised most. What wonder that they became the masters? Having read the decrees of land and peace, peasants and workmen went over with a rush to the Bolsheviks, thus giving them from the outset the support of the masses. Immediately after the coup d'etat, the Izvestia of November 11 published the following official statement signed by the Military Revolutionary Committee, the late Minister Kierensky, deposed by the people refuses to submit to the decision of the All-Russian Soviet Congress, and criminally attempts to oppose the Soviet of People's Commissaries as the lawful government elected by the All-Russian Congress. It further stated that, acting under the demand of the nobles and landowners, capitalists and speculators, Kierensky is marching against us in order to restore the land to the nobles, and to renew the hated disastrous war. As a contrast to the bourgeois provisional government the government of workmen and peasants, in conformity with the firm will of the army and people, has commenced peace negotiations, and given over the land to the peasants. Thus did the new power mark its very first statements with falsehood and calumny. Certainly neither the social revolutionary Kierensky nor the half-socialistic provisional government had any intention of taking the land from the peasants or of working for capitalists. The Bolsheviks knew it, but this falsehood was useful to them for tactical considerations, that is as a surer means of capturing the masses, of deepening class consciousness, of keeping the mob in a state of constant, 
fierce mistrust towards all other parties, towards the entire Russian intelligentsia. The position of the center socialists, repudiated by the Bolsheviks, was an exceedingly unhappy one. The men who had wrested the power from their hands appealed to the people with the very words of land and peace which had been uttered by the revolutionary democracy after the March Revolution. The difference of grades, theories, dates, was absolutely incomprehensible to the masses. The mob only saw that the leaders of the first revolution promised, but gave nothing, whereas these men no sooner had deposed Kierensky than they issued two decrees, about land and peace. The first decree embodied the realization not only of the Bolshevist but of the social revolutionary agrarian program, and in reality only reaffirmed what had already been accomplished by seizure, merely legalizing it by the term of nationalization. All the land was given over to all the people. All the inventory, whether live or not, became state property. No hired labor can be employed on the land. The agrarian problem must be definitely settled by the constituent assembly representing all the people. But the principles which are to regulate the justice of this decision are exposed beforehand. First of all, the abolition of private landed property forever. However, this Bolshevist decree included a very cautious reserve clause of great demagogic importance, but striking at the very root of the idea of land nationalization. The land belonging to peasants and Cossacks is not confiscated. The second decree about peace declared that the government of workmen and peasants had addressed a proposal to all belligerent states to conclude an immediate armistice upon all fronts. The official government mouthpiece, the Izvestia, accompanied this decree with a commentary in the style of the pacifist articles published in the Izvestia of the First Soviet. An immediate and universal democratic peace can only be achieved by a peasant's and workman's government. While demanding an armistice upon all fronts, the government of workmen and peasants repudiates the mean insinuation that Russian social democracy aspires to a separate peace. It does not aspire to sever its ties with the Allies, but it forms a stronghold whose support will give the decisive vote to the true labor democracy in allied countries. This recalls the speeches of Tsrikli and Skoblev, who also held the view that a democratic peace would be attained not as a result of the military operations of the Allied armies, but as a gift of the international proletariat. At a meeting of the Central Executive Committee, 20th November, Trotsky gave the following estimate of the attitude of the powers in regard to the Soviet peace decree. The Allied powers have adopted an attitude of the utmost antagonism in relation to our decree. As to our enemies, they are mainly interested in how far the coup d'etat in Russia has weakened her. As Germans they in Germany and Austria rejoice, but as bourgeois they fear our victory. Antagonism to the Soviets is displayed above all by England, which plays the leading part in contemporary events, which has the least to lose and perhaps the most to gain in this war. A different estimate is given of America's attitude. America entered this war not for the sake of the ideals proclaimed by Wilson, but under the influence of a sober calculation of the exchange, and at the demand of the representatives of war industry. America aspires not to territorial gains but to the exhaustion of all European countries. That aim is already achieved, therefore it may be expected that America will remain the most tolerant of all towards the Soviet power. Trotsky summed up his views by declaring that all information as to the effect of our decree upon Western Europe tends to demonstrate that our most optimistic expectations are realized. A few days after the coup d'etat, if I am not mistaken it was the 19th of November, Trotsky announced the creation of a Soviet government to the French ambassador, and proposed to the Allies to declare an immediate armistice upon all fronts. No answer was vouchsafed to this letter, nor to any other attempts of the people's commissaries at intercourse with the Allied ambassadors. The Bolshevist government, which repudiated imperialistic diplomacy and published the so-called secret treaties, naturally did not pay the slightest attention to the diplomatist's unfriendly silence. The Soviet was heading direct towards a separate peace. The suffering and humiliation inflicted by such a peace upon Russia could not trouble internationalists, the Russian state which they had seized was to them but a field of social experiments, 
as Lenin openly avowed. General Duklin, who had assumed command at the Stavka after Kerensky's disappearance, received an order signed by Lenin, Trotsky, Kralenko, and Bonchbruevich, announcing the establishment of the Soviet rule. The Stavka was to propose the conclusion of an immediate armistice to the Allied as well as to the enemy countries. The Soviet of People's Commissaries bids you, Citizen Commander in Chief, to present to the military chiefs of the enemy armies the proposal of immediate cessation of hostilities for the purpose of opening peace negotiations. 20th November. Simultaneously Ensign Kralenko, now Commissary of Military Affairs, that is to say, Minister of War, issued an army order inviting every unit to conclude a separate armistice. General Duklin gave no reply to the order of the Soviet of People's Commissaries. Lenin and Kralenko then inquired by telephone whether he had executed their command. The commander-in-chief, in his turn, replied by a series of technical questions, 1, is there an answer from the belligerent powers? 2, what about the Romanian front? 3, is there any intention of opening negotiations for a separate peace, and if so, with whom? 4, what about the Turks? The people's commissaries considered these questions as unimportant, and sent an ultimative order to start immediate and unevasive negotiations for an armistice between all belligerent countries, both allied and such as are in antagonistic relations with us. Ducklin replied, I can but understand that you have no possibility of directly negotiating with the powers. Such negotiations in your name are all the more impossible for me. Only a central government authority, supported by the army and the people, may have sufficient weight with the enemy. I also hold that Russia's interest lies in the conclusion of a speedy general peace. The conversation ended by a telephonic dismissal of General Duklin from the post of Commander-in-Chief, with the order to carry on his duties pending the arrival to the Stavka of his successor, Ensign Kralenko. At the same time the Soviet of People's Commissaries issued a proclamation to the soldiers, which I reproduce in extenso, soldiers, peace is in your hands. You will not let counter-revolutionary generals demolish the great task of peace, you will surround them with a guard to avoid a lynching unworthy of revolutionary army, and to prevent these generals from escaping the judgment which awaits them, you will maintain the strictest revolutionary and military order. Let those who are in the trenches elect plenipotentiaries for opening immediate formal armistice negotiations. The Soviet of People's Commissaries invests you with the right to do so. Inform us by all means in your power of the progress of such negotiations. The Soviet of People's Commissaries is only empowered to sign the final armistice treaty. Soldiers, the task of peace is in your hands. Watchfulness, self-restraint, energy and peace will be won. 22nd November. The above was one of the first state documents composed by the new commander-in-chief. The following series of his numerous orders present the same mixture of demagogy and falsehood, instigation and hypocrisy, and at times, sheer insanity. Ensign Kralenko, known as Comrade Abram, became notorious at the time of the revolution of 1906 at election meetings to the first Duma. He was then a secondary schoolboy, and distinguished himself by his fierce Bolshevist attacks against the cadets, particularly against Miley Ukov. Subsequently he finished a course at Petrograd University, was schoolmaster in Poland, where, it is said, he adhered to the Russification policy. He was an ensign in the army at the outbreak of the revolution and from the spring of 1917 Kralenko made pacifist propaganda in the army committees. Both his actions and speeches are full of hysterics and demagogic psychosis, but obviously he could not fail to realize the bloody sequel to his orders and speeches. The extermination of the commanding staff had been planned by him long ago, for had not Henson Kralenko openly declared in the summer of 1917 at a meeting of the Soviet of Workmen's and Soldiers' Deputies, we purged the officer's staff from below. This cynical avowal made by an officer of the Russian army remained unreproved. Now Kralenko himself had become a member of the government and could proceed from above with the democratization of the army, 
which amounted to the extermination of the officers and the annihilation of the whole army organization. His views upon the subject are best judged by a consideration of those whom he included in this process of purging and extermination and others whom he promoted. At the head of the plenipotentiaries delegated upon the 26th of November to negotiate with the Germans he placed a Hazar lieutenant, Shinra, a swindler, whose services had been rejected even by the Tsarist secret police. The other two delegates were absolutely unknown individuals, a doctor and a volunteer, both with un-Russian names. Upon the 28th of November Krylenko, in a special army order, announced that the Germans had consented to an armistice, and that the meeting of plenipotentiaries was fixed for the 1st of December. Anyone concealing or opposing the propagation of this order shall be delivered to the judgment of local regimental tribunals without the usual formalities. That is to say, it gave the right of murder pure and simple, I propose the immediate cessation of sniping, and fraternization https colon slash slash www.yamaguchi.com slash library slash tikava slash tikavo underscore 12 dot html upon all fronts. Everyone at his post. Only the strong can hold his own. Hurrah for the coming peace. Thus did the Soviet announce the beginning of separate negotiations, the mere possibility of which they had refuted as a bourgeois calumny. But day by day the new masters shed one superstition after another. And in the first place they fell to trampling and destroying the results of the three years heroic military efforts of the Russian people. In reply to Krylenko's armistice order, there appeared in the press a statement of the Don of the Diplomatic Corps. The British ambassador, Sir George Buchanan. Trotsky's letter was received by the Allied diplomatists after the commander in chief had received the armistice order. The Allies were faced by an accomplished fact. The ambassador could not reply to notes sent by a government unrecognized by the British government. Moreover, a government, which like that of Great Britain holds its authority direct from the people, has no right to decide questions of such vital importance without ascertaining whether its impending decision will obtain the approval of its electors. This statement was printed in the Izvestia, 30th of November, with the following official comments the Soviet of People's Commissaries addressed its proposal to the German military authorities quite independently of any consent or disagreement on the part of the Allied governments. The policy of the Soviet is perfectly plain. Considering themselves as not bound by any of the former government's formal obligations, the Soviet authorities in their struggle for peace are influenced solely by principles of democracy and the interests of the world's working class. The Izvestia had by this become the mouthpiece of the new Minister for Foreign Affairs, Trotsky Bronstein. Simultaneously he issued a proclamation to the peoples of the belligerent countries. He pointed out that not only did not the Soviet authorities stand in need of the consent of the capitalist diplomacy, but that generally the Russian army and the Russian people did not wish to wait any longer. We start negotiations on the 1st of December. If the Allied peoples do not send their representatives, we shall begin negotiations by ourselves. We desire a general peace. But if the bourgeoisie of the Allied countries compels us to conclude a separate peace, the responsibility will fall entirely upon them. The Stavka was the last obstacle upon the Bolsheviks' way to this shameful and disastrous separate peace. Not only the commander-in-chief, General Duklin, but the commissary and all the army committee attached to him, and which during the first revolution were considered as the main source of the army's insubordinate state of mind, absolutely refused to recognize Kralnko or to submit to his orders. The All-Army Committee, supported by the resolutions of army and frontal committees, deemed it indispensable by all means to safeguard the Stavka until the creation of a universally acknowledged government, which the Soviet of People's Commissaries cannot be recognized as representing. The All-Army Committee certainly cannot recognize you as a commander-in-chief, therefore your arrival at the Stavka becomes perfectly unnecessary. If, however, you wish to come as a private individual, we have nothing against it. Krylenko replied to this naive document, so full of childlike confidence, by dissolving the All-Army Committee. 
Among other things this document guaranteed Groundgo's personal inviolability in the event of his arrival as a private citizen, only recently he had passionately advocated the sacredness, inviolability, and democratic character of these elected institutions, but then he stood in need of them in order to attain power, whereas now, when the committee made a polite attempt to set aside the uncalled for commander in chief, his reply was quite simple dissolution. A regular offensive was organized against the unsubmissive Stavka, in which, however, Kralnko incurred not the slightest risk. There was no one to defend the Stavka. The frenzied soldier masses already sided with the Bolsheviks. Those of the soldiers who had not yet lost their heads were powerless to counterbalance the general psychosis. As to the generals and officers who had remained at their post, they were quickly disposed of. This was how Ensign Kralnke himself announced his heroic deed to the soldiers of the Revolutionary Army and Navy, comrades, I have this day entered Mohilev at the head of revolutionary troops. The Stavka was surrounded from all sides. The Stavka has surrendered without fighting. The last obstacle to peace has fallen. I cannot pass over in silence the unfortunate fact of the lynching of the late Commander-in-Chief, General Duklin. The hatred of the people has boiled over. Despite all the endeavors to save him, he was dragged out of the railway car and assassinated. General Kornilov's escape on the eve of the fall of the Stavka accounted for this success. Comrades! I cannot tolerate any blemishes upon the banner of the revolution and such deeds should be severely condemned. Be worthy of your newly won liberty. Cast no blemish upon the people's power. The revolutionary people are terrible in war, but should be gentle after victory. Comrades, with the fall of the Stavka the struggle for peace acquires fresh power. 1st December. Thus did the Bolshevik commissary describe the tragic end of the Russian general, whose sole guilt was his loyalty to Russia and the Allies unto the end. And here is a description of the same event given by an eyewitness, the military correspondent of one of the most widespread Russian papers, ruskuslovo.https colon slash slash www.yamaguchi.com slash library slash tikova slash tikovo underscore twelve dot html General Duklin expected to be arrested, possibly judged but as an officer and gallant man believed in his antagonist's nobility, and fell a victim to his trust. He did not wish to abandon the Stavka, deeming it his duty to remain at his post to the end. He organized no armed resistance whatever to the Bolsheviks, on the contrary, took all precautions to avoid bloodshed, and withdrew from the Stavka the shock battalion, the only unit willing to defend this last stronghold of the Russian general staff by force of arms. Everything had been done to pacify the conqueror. But the conqueror marched forward, wrathful and impetuous. No political opponents, but avengers armed to the teeth, with artillery and armored cars, were on their way to defenseless Mohilev. Groundgo arrived accompanied by sailors and red guards. The soldiers eyed their new chief curiously. He was so small, so wiry, so unlike their former commanders. Kralnko drove from the station to headquarters, and during his absence, Duklin was brought to the station in a motor car. The general looked pale and agitated, but his handsome, well groomed head was held erect as of old. The sailors took him straight into Kralnko's railway car. The crowd of soldiers, not yet a large one, became excited. Hand him over to us shouted several voices. The shouts came mainly from the Red Guards. One of them, wearing a wolfskin cap with the fur bristling out, climbed on the carriage step and addressed the crowd, Comrades! Where is Gierinsky? Where is Kornilov? They have not been properly guarded, the same will happen to Duklin. Duklin will also escape. They say he must be judged. What judgment? Who was judged? According to their judgment all traitors are found not guilty. We'll have Duklin! roared the mob. We know how to guard him. It was as if an electric current had run through the crowd. I gazed into their faces and did not recognize them. A moment ago I had seen calm, good-natured, dull faces, chewing sunflower seeds and staring with nothing but curiosity in their eyes. Now the faces were darkened and distorted. 
The men looked like hungry wolves. The mob pressed against the door, thrust itself inside the car. They shouted, Death to Dukhnin! Kill him! Kryonko, who had himself incited the soldiers to lynch law, who encouraged the Red Guard's wolfish ferocity, endeavored to prevent the crime by speech. But by speech only. Dukhnin could have been saved. Ensign Kryonki had a numerous suit. Not all the sailors were inclined to the lynching. Dukhnin might have been locked up in the car and the train started. But apparently Kryonka counted the cost. Passions were excited to such a pitch that any intervention on his part might mean death to him also. He only clutched at his head and sat for a long time with his face buried in his hands. The Red Guards dragged Dukhnin out of the car. He raised his hand signifying his wish to speak. But just then a sailor sprang upon the step and fired at his throat. The mob raised the war cry of victory, hurrah! -ah. Bayonets, swords, rifle butts, heels all were set to work. The savage, frenzied mob tore the general's corpse to pieces, never ceasing its cry of hurrah! 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 With this sacred war cry upon their lips our heroes died for their motherland, while here savages were performing a bestial execution and uttering the same words in blasphemy, forgetting that they were victorious not over the Germans, but over an unarmed and defenseless Russian man. Having committed their hideous task, the mob ebbed away. In place of General Dukhnin I saw only a black and bloody mass. That was not merely the murder of General Dukhnin. With him a final blow was struck at discipline, wounded from the outset of the revolution, and at the whole Russian army. From that moment Russia, dishonored and bound hand and foot, was laid as a booty at Germany's feet. Conditions of surrender, the duration and forms of negotiations all these were but secondary details. The substance of the situation lay in the fact, that owing to the combined efforts of a faction of Russian Marxists calling themselves Bolsheviks, and their allies the Germans Russia was conquered from the interior and brought out of the ranks of the belligerent powers. The subsequent history of the peace negotiations, which lasted from the first peace decree published upon the 14th November to the signing of the Brest-Litovsk peace upon the 3rd of March, is an obscure and disgusting tale of how a gang of men, unauthorized by the country, and the majority of whom were until then unknown to Russia even by name, negotiated with the imperial German government. They camouflaged their treason with pompous socialistic mottos, they diverted the mob by sharpening its lowest instincts of greed and hatred, meanwhile hastily disbanding the army in order that no one could prevent them from selling Russia. Not all the details of the negotiations appeared in the press, far from it. Having repudiated the Tsarist secret diplomacy, the Bolsheviks promptly restored it for their own use. 19. Neither the exact principles of the armistice, nor the full text of the treaty were communicated to the Russian people. It was rather a matter of conjecture than of knowledge. https colon slash slash www.yamaguchi.com slash library slash tikiva slash tikiva underscore twelve. html for three years the Russian people bore the burden of terrible military tension, and sacrificed several million lives for the Allied cause. Now everything was blotted out. Maddened and helpless. It had surrendered to the mercy of its foe. One could not even call him a victorious enemy. In a military sense Russia was not defeated. Towards the spring of 1917 the Russian army, enriched by the war experience of its leaders, was numerically as well as technically far superior to the one with which Russia entered the war in 1914. But the new wine of liberty had intoxicated the Russian soldier and made him unfit for fighting. Socialist speeches has killed his martial spirit, and the Bolsheviks had only to complete the work begun by the preachers of a democratic peace, and to liquidate the remnants of the army. That was a terrible sight. Most terrible of all to thinking Russians was the blindness of the people. It trampled its own innumerable war sacrifices down in the mud. Accepting traitors as the true peacemakers, it raised them upon a shield and executed patriots who resented the shame and madness of the peace negotiations.
the Bolshevist formula peace at any price was taken up by the masses and became their criterion for exalting or degrading various parties and organizations. Officers paid the heaviest penalty. Every soldier, every workman suspected them of opposition to the peaceful aspirations of the Bolsheviks and of secret sympathies for Kornilov. Soldiers' committees subjected officers to humiliating cross-questioning, and ordered them to sign declarations of loyalty to the Soviet of People's Commissaries. In the event of refusal the officers were subjected to derision and blows, and frequently shot. Towards the middle of December the Bolsheviks published the order that the officers' staff should be an elected one. Soldiers' committees were to proceed with the elections. Officers, who were not elected, were to remain in the same units as privates. All ranks and titles as well as decorations were abolished. This order started a veritable orgy of derision. Generals were converted into cooks or grooms, their orderlies and junior clerks became commanders of divisions, almost of armies. In one division a woman commander was elected. Generals, who had been unable to escape from the Stavka were compelled to execute the orders of drunken soldiers elected to high posts in their stead. The army was transformed into a brigand's camp. The soldiers divided and sold horses, wagons, clothes, bread, food, and, lastly, guns and machine guns. The purchasers were frequently Germans. Some of the machine guns and rifles were carried off by the soldiers to their homes. In the face of such conditions the Central Powers could obviously dictate any terms of peace. Yet they did not immediately lose the habit of reckoning with the Russian army or of considering Russia as a dangerous and powerful opponent and therefore they acted with a certain cautiousness. The negotiations lasted for nearly three months. Perhaps the German diplomats and generals experienced some perplexity as to whom they were to conclude a peace with? What weight can there be in the signature of these absolutely unknown individuals? Can they deliver aught but forged letters of exchange? Might not greater advantage be expected from a downright conquest of Russia? All that took place during the peace negotiations was so absolutely out of conformity with the dignity of Russia, whom every foreigner, enemy, or friend alike had treated with the respect due to a great power, that even a member of the first delegation, the internationalist S. Mstislavsky, a social revolutionary of the left, was oppressed by what he witnessed at Brest-Litovsk. An enterprising journalist earning a fair amount of money during the war by writing military correspondence simultaneously in the government messenger and in semi-defeatist left papers, and a man of very bad reputation, Mstislavsky was included through the insistence of the social revolutionaries of the left, with whom he identified himself in the first peace delegation which started for Brest upon the 18th November. He gave an account of his impressions in a curious pamphlet entitled The Breast Negotiations. https colon slash slash www.yamaguchi.com slash library slash tikava slash tikava underscore twelve. html According to him the delegation was assembled in haste, literally on the go. The only members thoroughly versed in the state of affairs were the three Bolshevist representatives who had received definite instructions from the Soviet of People's Commissaries. The remaining six members of the political section as well as the officers attached to the delegation had not even a precise knowledge as to the limit of the delegation's powers. The above statement was all the more interesting, as all the nine plenipotentiaries, besides the officers included as advisers, were enumerated in the official agenda as members of the All-Russian Executive Committee of the Soviet of Peasants, Workmen's, and Soldiers' Deputies. Obviously, even this exalted rank did not admit its members to the mysteries of secret diplomacy which the Bolsheviks would not reveal to their comrades of the Executive Committee, even when sending them to diplomatic negotiations with the Germans. The final aim of these negotiations is thus defined by Mstislavsky an insistent repetition of the program demands of the Russian revolutionary democracy was expected to appeal to the peoples over the heads of German generals. And not only to the peoples of Germany, Austria, and Bulgaria, but also to our own. The author did not explain why the representatives of an executive committee sitting at Petrograd should find it necessary to appeal to the Russian people from Brest, and with the assistance of Germans, 
when they possessed an enormous mechanism of propaganda in Russia. But he gives a detailed and picturesque account of a festive dinner, and of the contrast between the German delegates with their military mien and pose of men of the world, and the Russian delegation. The latter's composition transgressed all diplomatic traditions, as it comprised a soldier, a sailor, a peasant, a workman, and even one woman, Bipsenko, a social revolutionary of the left. In allotting the places at the dinner table, the Germans acted in strict accordance with the revolutionary table of ranks and classes. The delegation was seated according to revolutionary rank in direct violation of ordinary precedence. The sailor Olich, as member of the political delegation, was placed above Admiral Altfater, etc. This was at dinner. During the negotiations, however, the Germans and Austrians paid scant respect to the political members, and clearly emphasized their contempt of revolutionary right. Mstislavski consoled himself by the thought that after all he and his comrades were fulfilling their duty as internationalists, because the plenipotentiaries of revolutionary Russia were obliged to warn unequivocally and in terms of absolute certainty that a military armistice for the Russian Revolution represented an act of revolutionary offensive, an act not liquidating, but enhancing, the struggle. In other words, he persuaded his readers that they went to Brest to sign an armistice with the Kaiser's generals solely in the interests of a worldwide revolution. Certainly, under such conditions, and inspired by such aims, the plenipotentiary representatives of the Soviet were least of all concerned with the main that is the military, problems of the armistice. No military deliberations concerning the possible terms of the armistice took place before leaving Petersburg. The main body of the military delegation joined us at Skov and Dvinsk. The sum total of our military demands has not been formulated. There exists not the slightest possibility of commencing the immediate task entrusted to the delegation. The attitude adopted by the opposite side towards a delegation of such a standard of competence may be easily imagined. Despite all the esteem and attention of which the delegation was the object throughout its stay at Brest, every contact with the Germans left me with a feeling of profound, withering humiliation. The enemy officers, beginning with General Hoffman, held the Russian army in profound respect. As soon, however, as matters touched upon the revolution there appeared deceit, intimately concealed under a mask of respectful courtesy, but all the more unbearable and oppressing it was palpable in the words and in the eyes of the Germans. And the consciousness of this deceit, the consciousness of our powerlessness to overcome it by our truth, was degrading. The result of these negotiations, whose humiliation was felt even by a delegation of such caliber, was the signing of the first Brest-Litovsk Treaty. While appending his signature to this base document, Mstislavski consoled himself with the hope of a future international socialist conference. Inasmuch as we acted in the name of the Russian army at the first Brest conference, so shall we at the second, international socialist, upon the border of peace negotiations, speak only in the name of the international. Such was Russia's humiliating position during these negotiations that General Skarlon, a member of the second delegation, left the room and shot himself after the very first meeting. Yet, with their customary impudence, the people's commissaries declared, both in their speeches and in the press, that they were working for a universal democratic peace. That the peace was a separate one was the fault not of the Soviet, but of the Allies. The responsibility for the separate armistice rests entirely upon those governments, which have not up to now declared their desire for peace which still continue to conceal their war aims from their own and foreign peoples, wrote the Commissary for Foreign Affairs, Trotsky, upon the 13th December. Five days later the conclusion of a 28 days armistice, until the 18th January, was announced. Separate negotiations became a fact. The Bolsheviks stood in need of them, because they were in haste to replace the external war by an internal civil one. The cessation of bloodshed upon the external front signifies the end of the hecatombs raised to the glory of international imperialism. Such is not the case upon the inner front. Here, the revolutionary troops are fighting against their direct class enemies, against the landowners and capitalists. 
who have assembled under their banner all counter-revolutionary elements officers dismissed from their posts, cadets, storm troops, the upper Cossack class. Victory in this war for life or death between the new and the old Russia is a question of self-preservation for the socialist revolution in Russia. Is Vestia, 24th of December 1917. This article appeared, as if premeditated, on Christmas Eve, upon the day when, year after year, according to tradition, Russian journalists wrote articles upon the subject Peace on Earth. Goodwill to men. It demonstrated with sufficient clearness that it was not pacifist ideals which inspired the people's commissaries to conclude a precipitate peace with Germany, but their desire to have their hands free for another war, the war against the Russian people. The Bolsheviks evinced not a trace of that abhorrence from violence which characterized both the successive provisional governments and their supporters, whether radical or socialist. The Bolsheviks violated both body and soul. Liberty, respect for personality, the press, the right of vote in a word, everything considered to be the indispensable characteristic of a free legal state, was smashed by the Bolsheviks with the furious rapture of conquerors, with the conviction that their Quran alone contained the absolute truth. Their doctrine excluded parliamentarism. It was to be replaced by the Soviets. Of whom these Soviets were composed how the members were chosen, how and by whom the Soviet decrees were executed, it would be both easy and difficult to relate. Chaotic elections to the Soviet at the approximate calculation of one delegate to 1,000 workmen, took place at the time of the March Revolution. However, both the procedure and the character of the elections held much of the accidental and arbitrary and the Soviets of the revolution's early period should be regarded as irregular institutions. At the time of the November Revolution the Second All-Russian Congress of Soviets held its meetings. The Provisional Government of Workmen and Peasants, also calling itself the Soviet of People's Commissaries, was created in its name. The control of their actions belongs to the Congress of Soviets and its Central Executive Committee. Therefore some decrees of the Soviet authorities emanated direct from the Central Executive Committee, and whenever the Bolshevist leaders intended to pass any particularly hazardous measures they always previously passed them through the Central Executive Committee, which was their submissive and obedient tool. In extraordinary circumstances, such as the dispersal of the Constituent Assembly or the Brest Peace, the Bolsheviks called together a Congress of Soviets which for them became means of propaganda and government. Later, already in the summer of 1918 a similar Congress of Soviets, the fifth, adopted the Soviet constitution, wherein were clearly stated its theoretical principles. The fundamental task of the constitution of the All-Russian Socialist Federative Soviet Republic, established for the present transitionary period, comprises the establishment, in the form of a powerful Soviet authority, of a dictatorship of the proletariat both urban and rural, inclusive of the village poor, for the purpose of a final suppression of the bourgeoisie, of an annihilation of exploitation of man by man, and the introduction of socialism under which there are no class distinctions and the state has no power. The class spirit of the Soviet power permeates every point of this constitution. All power belongs fully and exclusively to the laboring masses and to their authorized representatives, delegated to the Soviet of workmen's, soldiers, and peasants' deputies. Only those engaged in manual labor are included under the description of laboring masses. Intellectual work gives no rights whatever. Commercial people, the clergy, the intelligentsia were deprived of their right to vote in the same manner as formerly bad election laws deprived workmen and peasants of a representation. It was the same injustice, only turned upside down, and fraught with a still greater disadvantage to the state, because the Soviet system spurned the most educated, the most thoughtful members of the population who were most adapted to state work. But this was the scheme. In reality, it is not the class which rules but a party. Central authority is in the hands of a small band of intelligence, while the local Soviets are purely party organizations. By means of selection, terrorism, pressure upon elections, and simple extermination of their enemies, the Bolsheviks have ousted all dissenters from the Soviets. 
when naive workmen attempt to elect others than Bolsheviks to this or the other local Soviet, such an inconvenient organization is simply dispersed by the Red Guards. This dictatorship of the proletariat has resulted, by the way, in the fact that the working class, never numerous in Russia, has almost ceased to exist, as the factories are either at a standstill or closed. In place of tens of thousands of workmen there now remain only hundreds. They receive high wages, work little, and represent a new variety of the innumerable Soviet officials. The democratic principle of universal suffrage is violated not merely by the fact that only a certain section of the community is admitted to participate in the elections, but also by the elections themselves being not direct but in a series of delegated selections. From the village Soviet up to the regional, the elections rise in four degrees, with the final result that the Russian peasants are represented by emigres ill acquainted with the Russian language, and still less so with the needs of the Russian people. Other violations of liberty, such as the authorized flood of one type of propaganda and the suppression of free criticism, the public control in all enterprise need not be specified. Meantime, the Soviet competence is limitless, and they represent the supreme power. Former laws are abolished. The new decrees create a veritable chaos in the domain of personal and possessive right, a state of things particularly convenient to the obscure elements affiliated to the Soviets from the outset. To enhance the general iniquity, a mysterious extraordinary commission for fighting counter-revolution, profiteering, and sabotage is working parallel to the Soviet. The foundation of these inquisitorial camarillas was already laid in September, when the revolutionary democracy scared by the Korniloff affair, organized its extraordinary investigation commission. During the Bolshevist regime these Kresvichakers, extraordinaries, became independent institutions from whence originated the warfare against the population, executions, arrests, perquisitions, plunder, etc. At times the Soviet of People's Commissaries uses the Kresvichaker as a convenient instrument for the extermination of its enemies at others they are in a state of conflict with each other. Neither the officially published Soviet constitution nor any of the judicial decrees make any mention of the extraordinary commissions for fighting counter-revolution. It goes without saying that their activity can neither be criticized nor made public. Their staff is not always known. These tribunals of the Middle Ages, the originators of the most arbitrary repressions, form in company with the Chinese and the Let's one of the main supports of the Soviet power. Possibly the Soviet Republic reflected itself in Lenin's dry, schematic brain as the harmonious edifice of a communistic paradise. In reality, it merely represents a series of self-centered organizations, taking no account either of one another, or of the Soviet of People's Commissaries and least of all of the will and interests of the community. According to the number of Soviet members in Russia, so is the number of autocrats possessing the power to dispose of the property, the labor, the life, and honor of every citizen and every citizen's. For performing such autocratic work these committeemen receive good wages, the privilege of driving about in motor cars, of seizing as large supplies of food as they desire, and of plundering, if so inclined as neither free press nor court of justice any longer exist, their activities are of course uncontrolled. It happens, however, that they are sometimes obliged to pay a heavy penalty for superfluous rapacity, and glut of possession, for the communist commissaries endeavor to exterminate property as an institution. As a matter of fact, profiteering is sentenced more heavily than murder by the Bolshevist commissaries. But before establishing the Soviet regime all the political institutions created both by the old and the new regime had to be destroyed. The first few months of Bolshevist rule were dedicated to this process, which was conducted with an energy verging upon genius. Chapter Xeed Constituent Assemblyth part played by the old Zemstvo universal suffrage the dispersion of the Petrograd Municipal Council parliamentary cretinism elections to the Constituent Assembly and their results the first broil in the Toride Palace arrest of the members of the Constituent Assembly the cadets as enemies of the people discrediting the Constituent Assembly the first and last sitting dispersion murder of A.I. Shingraf and F.F. Kokushkin 
The chief watchword of the Bolsheviks was the immediate seizure of power by the proletariat. All the Social Democrats spoke of the dictatorship of the proletariat, but as Lenin pointed out very truly, the other parties were in no haste to introduce it, considering it premature, while the immediate object of Lenin and his followers was to seize power forthwith. On the 9th November, Lenin, together with Trotsky, attained this object, fulfilling one of the fundamental commandments of Marxism. Now they, that is the Soviets, had to consolidate their position. Therefore the war cry of the day was, all power to the Soviets. For the sake of establishing the authority of the Soviets, all other forms of self-government on which the social life of Russia was founded were abolished as an effete regime supported by the bourgeoisie. Both local government in all its forms and also the constituent assembly were classed among such effete institutions, although prior to this the Bolsheviks had given themselves out to be the only true defenders of the latter. In Russia, with its vast distances and highly centralized system of autocratic government, the Zemstvo and municipal institutions played a great part in the development of local public life. They were created in 1864, in the so-called Age of Great Reforms, in the reign of Alexander II. Roads, national education, free medical aid, which had been well organized in Russia much earlier than in Western Europe, assistance to farmers, fire insurance all this had been managed by the elective Zemstvo and municipal institutions. Moreover, in the absence of a parliament and of the political life connected with it, local self-government had been a school for training experienced public men, where forces were grouped and habits formed for wider imperial work. The bureaucratic regime did not love the Zemstvo men for their independence, for their way of looking for support to their constituents, and not fawning on official chiefs. The ministers of the autocracy kept the Zemstvo men under supervision and oppressed and persecuted them. Alexander III was especially jealous of even the shadow of the love of freedom and independent political activity, he even amended the laws passed by his father concerning local self-government by curtailing both the rights of the latter and also the suffrage. But notwithstanding these reactionary efforts, the Russian Zemstvo created in its environment an influential and energetic radical company of men who fought for political liberty. They played an important part in the revolution of 1904-5, many of them were elected to the Duma, where they continued to develop and introduce ideas of right and liberty connected with representative government. Under the Tsar's regime their activity had been rather abstract in character, as Nicholas II, having signed a promise in October 1905 to give political liberty, was so short-sighted that, instead of finding support in national representation, he tenaciously fought against it, preventing the introduction of the most necessary reforms. One of the first tasks of the provisional government was to draw up new laws for local self government and to introduce them as soon as possible. In the summer of 1917, elections were held all over Russia on the basis of this new democratic law. Every citizen, irrespective of sex, had the right to vote on reaching the age of 20 years. The electors showed a strong left or radical tendency in voting, and everywhere socialists were in the majority. The cadets got one third of the urban votes. In the district and provincial Zemstvos, where the voters were mostly peasants, comparatively few of the intelligentsia candidates were successful. These new organs of local self government, full of new men, many of whom had got in, not because they were acquainted with local affairs but simply because their party had to have a certain number of candidates on their party lists, were not particularly successful in the practical management of the complicated municipal affairs. Their activity was an additional illustration of the difficulties which inevitably await a socialistic majority when it has to put its theories into practice. But in any case they were the lawfully elected representatives of the population. They acted in accordance with a clearly defined, established law. They were subject both to the superintendence of the government and to the open criticism of public opinion. They had the right to consider themselves part of the government machine created by revolutionary democracy, and when, in November, the Bolsheviks overthrew Kierensky's cabinet, 
the new organs of self-government opposed the Soviet authorities and tried to defend their independence. But the Bolsheviks, like the Tsarist bureaucrats before them, were intolerant of all independence. As early as January 1918 the Zemstvos and municipal councils were everywhere closed and replaced by Soviets. How this was done may be seen from the story of the short struggle between the Petrograd Municipal Council and the Petrograd Soviet. A Bolshevist struggle always resolves itself into a question of physical force, and the Petrograd Municipal Council was guarded only by a body of Boy Scouts. These boys, with great importance, asked the members of the council for their tickets, ran errands for us all over the town, and in general were both a guard of honor and a liaison service. Of course no one expected any military protection from them. And indeed the municipal council neither expected nor sought protection from anyone. It stood outside any physical struggle, yet considered itself bound to defend the interests of the population to the end to guard that expensive and complicated economic, apparatus which had been entrusted to it. The Electric Trams, Water Supply Lighting, Schools, Hospitals, and lastly, the Food Supply All these first requirements of the capital, which then contained two and one half million inhabitants were in the hands of the Municipal Council. Unfortunately, the proclamations of the municipality, drawn up by the Socialist Center in agreement with the cadets, found sympathizers only among the intelligentsia and a small portion of the working classes, while the masses already looked upon the members of the council as counter-revolutionaries. The struggle between the Petrograd Municipal Council, elected according to an exact and clear suffrage law, and the Petrograd Soviet, elected by some unknown persons and unknown procedure, was not very prolonged. The question was decided not by right, but by bayonets, which were undoubtedly in the hands of Lenin and Trotsky. The open and implacable opposition of the council, its really energetic defense of all the victims of the Bolshevist insurrection, the military cadets, the women's battalion, hundreds of people who were imprisoned no one knew what for all this irritated the Smolny. The time had come to sweep aside this obstacle also, the more so as, according to Lenin's theory, the Soviets were to be the sole organs of authority, administration, and government. The sittings took place every day, but of course the debates were on politics and not municipal business. Civil war aged around. The Red Guards kept appearing in the town hall and then disappearing. No work could be done under such conditions. The only thing to be done was to pass motions of protest, so as to give vent to the indignation felt both by the council and by those around. The last protest of the council was the declaration protesting against peace negotiations begun at Brest-Litovsk by the Bolsheviks, and the assertion that they would never be acknowledged by Russia. During this sitting a crowd of workmen appeared in the gallery of the town hall. They were noisy, passed remarks on the speeches of the members and shouted, you have chattered long enough. We will soon chuck all of you out. The socialist members of the municipal council tried to reason with the workmen, saying, comrades, you have been deceived. Comrades, you are betrayed. What sort of comrades are we of yours? replied the gallery. You are bourgeois, counter-revolutionaries. We will sweep all of you away with a dirty broom. There was anger in the voices and the eyes of the workmen. It was clear that the Bolsheviks had managed to build up a dividing wall between the workmen and the socialists of the center. The day after this insulting and trying scene the mayor and several members of the council were arrested. The Izvestia printed a decree dissolving the municipality because it had lost the right of representing the Petrograd population, having become completely antagonistic to its tendencies and wishes. The results of the election to the Constituent Assembly confirmed this. The Municipal Council has shown counter-revolutionary opposition to the will of the soldiers, workmen, and peasants, and has taken to obstruction. 1st December The next day the sailors and Red Guards with rifles at the ready burst into the hall where the Municipal Council was sitting, just as if they were attacking a strongly armed enemy. The Socialist members began exhorting these new Praetorians, but already the soldiers were deaf to the speeches of their late orators. 
the municipality had to yield to force and to disperse, giving up the town hall to the Bolsheviks. After that, hoping that Lenin and Trotsky would not be in power very long, the council still continued to meet clandestinely, almost like conspirators. These meetings were accompanied by a certain risk, but naturally were of no serious value, as the Bolsheviks had practically seized the municipal treasury and undertakings, and the council they had dispersed had nothing to do but talk. The same short and unequal struggle took place in Moscow and in all other towns taken by the Bolsheviks. Their Zemstva boards were also dispersed. The People's Commissaries abolished all forms of self government and replaced them by Soviets. As the right of all the population to decide questions of imperial importance was to have been exercised in the most authoritative form by the Constituent Assembly, therefore for the Bolsheviks it was an obstacle to the establishment of their party authority, and so they swept it aside. When Tsarism was overthrown by the March Revolution, all parties, all influential currents of Russian political thought were united in the universal acknowledgement of the sovereign rights of the Constituent Assembly, which was to decide the fundamental questions arising out of the reconstruction of Russia. Will Russia be a republic or a monarchy? What rights and relations must be established between the numerous nationalities inhabiting the Russian state? How to settle the agrarian and other social questions? All this was to have been answered authoritatively by a lawful constituent assembly. Its claim was acknowledged both by the right and the left, by Rodzienko and by Chides, and, at least in words, by Trotsky also. One of the first tasks of the provisional government was to create an all Russian election committee for the constituent assembly. The representatives of all parties and all nationalities took part in it. Prominent savants and lawyers were employed on this work, which then seemed uncommonly important and responsible. The president, F. F. Kokushkin, a Moscow professor, a brilliant and widely read man, was one of the idealistic leaders of the Cadet Party. Even the political opponents of the Cadets acknowledged that F. F. Kokushkin combined logical exactitude of thought with definiteness of political convictions and an intelligent comprehension of differing points of view. The Commission had no easy task to perform. There was no serious divergence in fundamental principles. The Socialists and Cadets both supported universal suffrage, based on proportional representation. The disputes were only about the age limit the property qualification, domicile and soldiers' votes. The cadets proposed an age limit of 25 years, a year's residence in one place, and limitations for soldiers. But the more radical elements were victorious. The most democratic suffrage law in the world was drawn up, giving every citizen of either sex who had reached the age of 20 years the right of participating in the settlement of the most important problems of state. It was necessary to organize and hold elections in a country with an illiterate, scanty population, which spoke different languages, and had hitherto taken no part in political life. The delimitation of the constituencies, the order of voting, the guarantee of its legality and correctness. The drafting of electoral rolls hitherto non-existent all this of course required effort and time. Now we think, with a bitter smile, of the seriousness, honesty, and thought with which the best Russian lawyers performed this enormous task in the feverish atmosphere of the revolution. Their conscientiousness bordered on the simplicity of Don Quixote. Even then pessimists predicted that all this was futile and that anarchy would sweep away all juridical schemes and democratic projects. But at those times the enormous majority of politicians of all shades sincerely considered the Constituent Assembly as the sole hope of the young democracy of Russia. Meanwhile the Bolsheviks were already playing a double game, acting a double lie, slandering their political opponents, especially the cadets, accusing them of obstructing the Constituent Assembly and representing themselves as the faithful champions of the latter. In his pamphlet, Political Parties in Russia and Problems of the Proletariat, from which I quoted in detail in Chapter 3, Lenin says that the cadets, in answer to the question, is it necessary to convene the Constituent Assembly? Replied, yes, it is, but no date should be fixed. Let the question be discussed as long as possible by professors of law, first of all because, as Bebel said, 
lawyers are the most reactionary men in the world, and, secondly, the experience of all revolutions has proved that the cause of national liberty is ruined as soon as it is entrusted to professors. According to Lenin, only the Bolsheviks said, it is necessary to convene the Constitutional Assembly, and as soon as possible. But the guarantee of its success and convocation is one and the same, namely, the increase of the number and strength of the Soviets, the organization and arming of the working classes. Before demonstratively leaving the Council of the Republic, on the eve of their coup d'etat he had already prepared for, Trotsky read a declaration containing the following, the government cannot but be responsible to the constituent assembly. Therefore the bourgeois classes, who direct the policy of the provisional government, have made it their object to obstruct the convocation of the constituent assembly. At present this is the chief aim of the centre parties, which guides all their policy, both home and foreign. Hail to the constituent assembly! Thus spoke the Bolsheviks, while they were in the opposition. When they became the government, they made an abrupt change of front, notwithstanding that their first decree, issued on the 10th November, begins as follows to form a provisional workmen's and peasants' government, to be called the Soviet of People's Commissaries, for the purpose of governing the country until the convocation of the Constituent Assembly. The elections to the Constitutional Assembly were not put off, but, on the contrary, a special Yukas confirmed the date which had been fixed by the provisional government, that is the 25th November. On this day the elections began, but they were held at different times in different parts of Russia. As owing to the general disorganization of life it was impossible to complete the technical preparations. The Bolsheviks created such a wave of disorder and lawlessness that many began to doubt whether they ought to take part in the elections when there was no press, no freedom of meetings, no possibility of canvassing, no personal security, and no law. But the Electoral Commission of the All-Russian Constituent Assembly insisted on the election not being postponed. The following proclamation, signed by V. Nabokov, https colon slash slash www.yamaguchi.com slash library slash tikova slash tikovo underscore thirteen dot html president of the commission, was addressed to the people, the attempt to seize power has disorganized communications, created anarchy and terror, and interrupted the business of the commission. Nevertheless, it is necessary to hold the elections wherever there is the slightest possibility of doing so. The gravest responsibility towards the country will be incurred by all who dare to make an attempt to corrupt the elections to the Constituent Assembly, on which the whole country is fixing its hopes. 22nd November. The Izvestia responded to the challenge by printing its own proclamation on its first page, the bourgeoisie, the landed gentry and Berensky's government have for eight months been doing all they could to delay the elections to the Constituent Assembly. They have been persistently and doggedly preparing to obstruct it, because they knew that in the agrarian question the Constituent Assembly would be on the side of the people. Now the elections to the Constituent Assembly are secure, and must take place at the date fixed. 24th November. And in the Petrograd Soviet, Volodysky, an influential Bolshevik, said, we put the question of the elections as a matter to be fought out. The masses never suffer from parliamentary cretinism, and if the constituent assembly goes against the will of the people, the question of a new insurrection will arise. We do not make a fetish of the constituent assembly. If we have a majority in the constituent assembly, we will manage to make it the last parliamentary meeting. We will establish a republic of Soviets. The expression parliamentary cretinism was often repeated in Soviet circles and showed their real attitude not only towards the Constituent Assembly, but to parliamentary politics in general. But this was too strong even for yesterday's friends and near neighbors of the Bolsheviks. The Novayezism wrote, It is pretty difficult to argue on the essence of any matter with public men of the type of Volodysky, men who suffer from all forms of cretinism except the parliamentary variety. The only argument to convince them is the bayonet. Politicians of this kind can only be shown that their hopes of a defenseless constituent assembly are premature and frivolous.
https colon slash slash www.yamaguchi.com slash library slash tikava slash tikava underscore thirteen dot html elections took place under most unusual conditions, inadmissible in any elections. There was no authority to supervise the legality of the elections. The institutions which carried out the process of election, such, for instance, as election committees and municipal corporations, did not acknowledge the authority of the Soviets. And the Soviet authorities did not acknowledge the laws acknowledged by the aforesaid institutions. There was no press. The lists of candidates could only be printed here and there at intervals. But printing offices, premises of party committees, and meetings were all liable to have the Reds come in at any moment and pogrom them. In many towns there was shooting in the streets. The prominent men of all parties except the Bolsheviks and left social revolutionaries had to hide instead of talking to their constituents. Jinov and Avksentov, Tsretli, and Gierinsky, M. Breshko Breshkovskaya, and Chides, all popular socialists whose names were on the lists, did not show themselves at all justly fearing Bolshevist attacks. Those who took the least trouble to hide were the cadets, perhaps because in general they were not used to conspiring. But they paid dearly for their excessive boldness. It is impossible to enumerate all the outrages and the lawlessness that took place in connection with the elections. It was one huge mockery of democracy and its principles. One need not be a scrupulous jurist to acknowledge that the elections to the All-Russian Constituent Assembly so impatiently looked forward to if not by the whole Russian people, then at least by all the literate and thinking part proved a real and tragic failure. The social revolutionaries got the majority at the elections. Then came a few representatives of various other socialistic groups. The cadets were completely beaten, getting only 15 seats out of 600. Their candidates were elected only in large towns which formed separate electoral units. In all other districts the mass of the peasantry completely swamped the urban electors. In order to show the altered mood of the Petrograd electors, I will give the statistics of the elections to the municipal council, which took place on the 2nd September, and the elections to the constituent assembly, which took place on the 25th November. At the municipal elections in September the social revolutionaries polled 205,000 votes the Bolsheviks 183,000, and the cadets 114,000. The remaining votes were split up among uninfluential socialistic parties. Thus, for example, the Menshevik Social Democrats got 23,000 votes out of a total of 503,000. At the Constituent Assembly elections 942,000 votes were recorded. Of this number, the Bolsheviks got 424,000. The cadets got 246,000. HTTPS colon slash slash www.yamaguchi.com slash library slash tikava slash tikava underscore 13. HTML The social revolutionaries got only 152,000, and the Mensheviks, 17,000. Of the votes given to the Bolsheviks, 63,000 belonged to soldiers. But while the Bolsheviks were solid and disciplined, the other socialists were split up into a number of fractions. The largest social revolutionary party had representatives of all its numerous fractions on its Petrograd list of candidates. The same list contained social revolutionaries of national defeatist views, like Irinsky and Avksentov, the impudent demagogue Zimwaldist and defeatist V. Genov, the hysterical Maria Spiridonova, who, together with the left social revolutionaries, had gone over openly to the Bolsheviks, and lastly the former employee of the Tsarist Secret Service, Kamkov, also a left social revolutionary who was on good terms with the Bolsheviks. These persons represented different political and social opinions, and what is more important, different standards of morals. But the poor elector whose sympathies were with the Social Revolutionary Party had to vote for them wholesale, 
both for the honorable and dishonorable social revolutionaries. https colon slash slash www.yamaguchi.com slash library slash tikiva slash tikiva underscore thirteen. html The level of the political intelligence of the social revolutionary Petrograd candidates for the Constituent Assembly may, in some degree, be determined by the following anecdote, related in the social revolutionary Dilo Naroda, cause of the people, the left social revolutionaries took the Soviet of peasant delegates into their own hands. There, with Maria Spiridonova in the chair, an election meeting was being held. The socialists who had gathered round the Committee of the Salvation of the Motherland had brought their election earring literature with them. Maria Spiridonova got angry and demanded that all the pamphlets and leaflets of heterodox socialists should be confiscated and stored in one room, at the door of which she placed a sentry with a rifle, in order that the harmful books should not get into the hands of the peasants. This unfortunate revolutionary, who had at one time herself been persecuted by the Tsarist gendarmes, lost her head on getting into power, and began to treat her political opponents in the good old police way and she had not even the excuse that these were harmful bourgeois pamphlets, as they were the publications of the socialist center. This instance shows how the November Revolution changed the morals of the Russian Revolution and brought into Russian life an utter contempt for liberty and right. No one knew when the meetings of the Constituent Assembly were to begin. The Provisional Government issued a decree in September stating that the elections would be held on the 25th November, and the assembly would be opened on the 11th December. On the 29th November, in a special decree, P. Milientovich, Minister of Justice, and S. Prokopovich, Acting Minister of Justice, confirmed the same in the name of the provisional government. But it was not the intention of the people's commissaries to hurry with the convocation of the assembly. When the counting of the votes began to show that they were not going to have a majority, they tried in every way to discredit the Constituent Assembly. The Bolshevik press, that is the Izvestia, Pravda, and Znamiya Truda, carried on a furious campaign. The election committee was arrested. A guard was placed at the doors of the Torida Palace, where the sittings were to take place. Uritsky, an apothecary, was appointed commandant of the Torida Palace. The members of the Constituent Assembly were obliged to get special permits of admission to the palace from this Soviet guard. The legislators elected to carry out the will of the nation were deprived of all possibility of exercising any will whatever, of enjoying their rights and fulfilling their duties. Nevertheless, the members of the Constituent Assembly made an attempt to meet on the day fixed by the provisional government. This is how it was described in the Soviet communique. In the afternoon of the 11th December a crowd of about a thousand people collected at the entrance to the Torida Palace. The crowd swept aside the guard and part of them burst through to the Torida Palace, though the number of such was very small. Among the latter were twenty members of the Constituent Assembly. This crowd poured into the meeting hall in a mixed mass, occupying less than one-tenth of the seats, etc. The Pravda wrote more definitely. On the evening of the 11th December some score or so of people, calling themselves delegates, but without presenting their documents, and accompanied by armed former horse guards, military cadets, and several thousand bourgeois and saboteur government employees, burst into the Torida Palace. Thus did the Bolshevist press greet the first appearance of the members of the assembly in the Torida Palace. The Social Revolutionaries foreseeing obstruction on Eretsky's part, did indeed organize something like a demonstration, hoping that at least by this means they might force the Bolsheviks to open the doors of the Torida Palace, and that the delegates might hold a private meeting. They had no other object in view, as it was impossible to start work, owing to the absence of a quorum. But even this modest desire could not be satisfied. The members of the Constituent Assembly managed somehow to get into the palace, but their all was in such a turmoil that it was impossible even to discuss anything. On the 13th December the members of the Social Revolutionary Party met in the library of the Duma. A young officer, the commander of the Red Guard, made his appearance and ordered them to disperse. We consider it not only our right, but our duty to remain here, 
answered the members of the constituent assembly. But the officer insisted, while his soldiers showed an evident desire to take the elected representatives of the Russian people by the scruff of the neck and simply throw them out of the Toride Palace. One of the members of the constituent assembly, a peasant, said indignantly to the soldiers and sailors, We have come here to get land, and we find bayonets. Whom are you serving the people or the oppressors? We have our orders. We must preserve discipline, moodily answered a sailor. It was clear that by their clever propaganda the Bolsheviks had discredited the Constituent Assembly. All efforts on the part of the Socialist Center to re-establish the confidence of the masses in the democratically elected representatives proved futile. The League for the Protection of the Constituent Assembly, working secretly in Petrograd, issued a proclamation to the army, We appeal to you, defenders of our country, soldiers of the whole Russian army. Stand shoulder to shoulder in defense of the People's Constituent Assembly. Announce that you place yourself at its disposal. Send delegations, send mandates on resolutions. Loudly announced to the whole of Russia and to all the world all power to the Constituent Assembly. It was hard, it even made one blush, to read this childish babble, this attempt to counteract Bolshevist bayonets by feeble resolutions. The author of this appeal forgot that there was no longer any army, that Duklin, the commander-in-chief, was killed, that the committee had demolished the organizations, that the soldiers had turned from being defenders of their country into a terrible mob in which the voices of madmen and criminals silenced the reproaches and warnings of frightened, decent people. It goes without saying that the soldiers were indifferent to such appeals. Simultaneously with the open persecution of the Constituent Assembly, an open persecution of the Cadet Party was also begun. The impulse was given by chance, but the persecution was not, of course, a matter of chance. Having driven the social center from the arena, the Bolsheviks found themselves face to face with the cadets, round whom all the radical, non socialistic elements had rallied. The pretext was found in searching Countess Painin's house for the persons who had inspired and guided the strike of civil service employees. The Bolsheviks chanced to find one of the vouchers signed by the Countess Sophia Painin, and issued an order for her arrest accusing this woman, who had spent millions of her personal money on the people's cause, of embezzling ours. 93,000. When the Red Guards came to her house they happened to find some members of the Constituent Assembly the Ray.I. Shingraf and F.F. Kokushkin. Both had just come up to Petrograd in order to take part in the inauguration of the Constituent Assembly on the 11th December, and had stayed at Countess Painin's where the meetings of the executive committee of the cadet party took place. The commissaries who were making the search were loath to let such important prey out of their hands. They telephoned to the Soviet for directions. The answer was simple, arrest them. All three were taken off to the Smolny. In the evening Countess S. Painin was taken to the Viborg prison, and the former ministers were taken to St. Peter and Paul's fortress where the ministers who had been arrested at the Winter Palace were still imprisoned. The same day the Soviet of People's Commissaries issued a short, but solemn decree, on the arrest of the leaders of the civil war against the revolution members of the leading institutions of the Cadet Party, as a party of the enemies of the people, are liable to be arrested and brought up for trial by revolutionary tribunals. The local Soviets are charged with the duty of special supervision over the Cadet Party in view of its connection with the Kornilov Khalid in war on the revolution. In a more detailed official communication, the Soviet of People's Commissaries supplemented its accusations against the cadets. I shall quote it in detail, because all the argumentation is so characteristic both of the way the Bolsheviks treat the truth and of their methods of influencing the masses. The Bolsheviks act systematically. They establish certain propositions, most frequently clothing them in short and catchy war cries such as, peace to cottages and war on palaces, down with capitalist ministers, etc., and then they ceaselessly repeat and paraphrase these war cries, attracting attention to them by the very repetition and as it were, hammering them into the minds of the masses. 
In this respect they can teach us something. While they were pressing on as an opposition they only required war cries. In order to consolidate their power they were obliged to modify these war cries gradually and, above all, to give more and more food to the hatred they had roused in the masses. In this respect the cadet party was a tidbit. Distrust and animosity to the cadets had been sown by all the preceding socialist agitation. Menshevik and social revolutionary orators grew black in the face trying to prove that Miley Ukov was an imperialist, that the cadets were bourgeois flunkies, etc. Sometimes they even went so far as to declare that it was better to be under the Kaiser than under Miley Ukov. Many understood very well that they were talking nonsense, but they felt bound to vituperate the party which placed the interests of the state and the nation as a whole above the interests of the workmen the peasants, or any other class, and insisted on the necessity of continuing the war until Germany was defeated. The Soviet proclamation to all who labored and were exploited had been drawn up in haste, and was not distinguished by the usual smoothness of the Bolshevist lie. It began thus, the bourgeoisie, led by the cadet party, got all its forces ready for the convocation of the Constituent Assembly in order to start a counter-revolution. Then followed an enumeration of military conflicts with Kornilov, Kaledin, Dutov, and other white guards who, the Bolsheviks pretended, had declared that the insurrection had been begun at the direct demand of the Cadet Party. Thus a regular civil war has been started on the initiative and under the guidance of the Cadet Party. The central committee of this organization is at present the political headquarters of all the counter-revolutionary forces of the country. This work, which is a direct menace to the cause of peace and all conquests of the revolution, is carried on under the cover of the Constituent Assembly. Then follows the foregoing story of how the bourgeoisie burst into the Torride Palace. The cadets wanted to make the Constituent Assembly into a legal cover for a cadet K lead in counter-revolutionary insurrection. The voice of several bourgeois delegates was to be represented as that of the Constituent Assembly. The Soviet of People's Commissaries informs the masses of this conspiracy, it will take all measures necessary, fully recognizing the enormous responsibility which must lie on the Soviet authorities for the fate of the people and the revolution. The Soviet of the People's Commissaries declares the Cadet Party, as an organization of counter revolutionary insurrection, to be enemies of the people. The political leaders of the counter revolutionary civil war will be arrested. The bourgeois insurrection will be put down at any cost. Down with the bourgeoisie. The foes of the people, landlords, and capitalists ought not to have any place in the Constituent Assembly. Having declared a party which had just in the capital got 240,000 votes to be enemies of the people, the Bolsheviks gave the provincial Soviets a free hand in dealing with the local cadet leaders and electors, and the Soviets took full advantage of this. But the Central Committee continued to live a semi-public life. Meetings were held almost every day. It is true the venue was often changed, as the club of the party was closed and all the furniture, including the property of the servants and housekeeper, had been looted and carried away by the Red Guards. Prominent cadets sometimes did not pass the night at home for fear of being arrested, but they spoke at great public meetings. The cadet newspaper, Reach, was sometimes closed and sometimes appeared under another name, but all the time invariably attacked the Bolsheviks. In it appeared the protests of various organizations against Bolshevist oppression, among others, the protest of the cadets against the arrest of the members of the Constituent Assembly contemptuously sweeping aside the slanderous accusation that our party is inimical to the people, the committee of the party considered that outlawing anyone is a return to medieval barbarity. The party declares that no persecutions, no threats, no oppression will make it turn aside from the path it has taken ever since the old regime, or will force it to cease its struggle for the rights, liberties, and welfare of the people. The cadets were mistaken. The Bolshevist gendarmerie turned out to be infinitely more implacable than the Tsarist gendarmes had been, and the old path of struggle a struggle of ideas and principles was soon barred. It was replaced by stark physical force. But to do the Bolsheviks justice, they forced their way not by means of bayonets, 
but by war cries. The resolutions passed by them at meetings and soldiers' committees helped them to make the Constituent Assembly powerless and futile. Here is one of these resolutions, we, soldiers of the Izmailovsky and Petrograd regiments, declare that the policy of the cadets is also the policy of Irinsky, Kornilov, and Kaledin, entailing the enslavement of the Russian people, and perpetual wars and exploitation of workmen's labor. We soldiers, who are defending with our blood the interests of the laboring people all the world over, will not permit our hard-won revolutionary rights to be violated by Miley Ukov and Co., who want, by means of false elections to the Constituent Assembly, to get their illegal regulations passed in order to enslave anew the rights of Russian citizens. Away with the policy of the cadets in the Constituent Assembly. We demand that reactionaries and counter-revolutionaries, all the Miley Ukov gang, should not be admitted to the Constituent Assembly where the liberty and revolution of the Russian people must be consolidated, and not the counter-revolution and sabotage of the Miley Ukov gang, whose place is in St. Peter and Paul's fortress. The soldiers who passed this resolution did not understand even half of what the expert Bolshevist agitator had palmed off on them. The very word cadet, which had its origin from the initial C and D, Constitutional Democrats, was taken by the masses to mean officers and military cadets. One thing the soldiers were quick to understand correctly, and that was that Lenin was against the war, and Irinsky, Miley Ukov, Kaledin, and the cadets wanted to fight the Germans. If their demands should be supported by the Constituent Assembly, then perhaps it would again be necessary to go to war. The Bolsheviks cleverly took advantage of this pusillanimity of the soldiers. Of all the parties the cadets, with Miley Ukov at the head, were most insistent in their demands for war to the end. Therefore the Bolsheviks nicknamed the Constituent Assembly the Cadet Assembly, although there were only fifteen cadets in it, and all the rest of the delegates were socialists. This was the lie on which the Bolsheviks founded their power over the mob and at the same time justified the reprisals against the theoretically immune national representatives. The Bolsheviks kept declaring that the Constituent Assembly was not the supreme organ of the national will. The electors, politically undeveloped and unaccustomed to appreciate and guard the inviolability of political elections, readily accepted the Bolshevist theory, that as they had elected the delegates they had also the right at any moment to withdraw their confidence from the latter, universal suffrage, which Russian democracy, both socialist and radical, had sentimentally dreamed of for several decades, lost all its glamour in the eyes of the very masses for whose sake the Russian champions of political liberty had won it at the cost of such sacrifice. The Petrograd Soviet no longer promised bread, as the food supply was palpably decreasing day by day. Instead of that, promises of peace shamelessly intermingled with calls to start a civil war, were regularly repeated. Hail to the universal democratic peace. Hail to the international labor revolution. Long live the Soviet power, opening the way to the peace of nations. Down with those who want compromises. Down with the traitors to the Ukrainian Rada. HTTPS colon slash slash www.yamaguchi.com slash library slash tikova slash tikovo underscore 13.html This last cry was a sort of justification of the war started by the Bolsheviks on the Ukraine, and therefore all the more outrageous was the next war cry, long live the liberty and brotherhood of the peoples of Russia. The Soviet called for a fraternal union of revolutionary workmen, peasants, soldiers, sailors, and laboring Cossacks, but required them to carry on a ruthless war against all who did not acknowledge the authority of the Soviets. The Constituent Assembly must acknowledge the authority of the Soviets and the decrees on the land, peace, workmen's control, etc. The cadets are enemies of the people. There is no place in the Constituent Assembly for the enemies of the people. The people ought to recall the flunkies of Russia from the Constituent Assembly. Shame on the Avksentevists and Junovists. On the day after the demonstration in which banners with such devices were carried, an order was issued for the arrest of Avksentev and Junov. They managed to escape, but the Socialist Center, which so short a time before was the center of authority, 
was broken and disorganized. The majority of the soldiers very soon learned the formula that suited them, namely, we do not want to shed our brethren's blood, and, remaining neutral, enjoyed all the advantages of the soldiers' position, but showed no desire to take part in the civil war to which they were at bottom thoroughly indifferent. In vain did the socialist opposition call upon the Petrograd garrison to make a demonstration in favor of the Constituent Assembly, which was to be opened on the 18th January. It was proposed to hold a peaceful demonstration, and indeed it could be no other, as the defenders of the Constituent Assembly had no arms. Someone or other was carrying on hazy negotiations with the officers, persuading them to stand up for the Constituent Assembly. The officers asked plainly, is it necessary to be prepared for armed resistance? The answer was, it is proposed to have a peaceful demonstration, but, of course, anything might happen. The other party, the Bolsheviks, made far more definite preparations for this day. They got out 2,000 sailors from Kronstadt and, arming them with machine guns, ordered them to occupy the Toride Palace. Only those who had permits from Ertsky were admitted. The members of the Constituent Assembly justly considered such a permit derogatory to them, but they were obliged to submit. Two days before the opening day an attempt was made to assassinate Lenin under very strange circumstances, which made people think that it was a simulated attack. Someone shot at his motor car and missed, but this shot gave the opportunity the Bolsheviks wanted. They talked loudly of the terror. At a meeting of the Soviet, 16th January, Zinovov, who had replaced Trotsky while the latter was engrossed in Brest-Litovsk diplomacy, made the following declaration, only one accusation will be brought against the Soviet authorities that have been too lenient with their opponents. The same spirit was shown by Bonch Bruevich, secretary of the Soviet government and people's commissary, who under the Tsarist regime had acquired a certain degree of fame by his articles and researches in defense of religious liberty. Under the Bolsheviks he came out as an enemy to all liberty, and advised the soldiers to allow no agitation in favor of the Constituent Assembly in the barracks. The following motion was passed at this meeting on the day the Constituent Assembly is opened it is proposed to hold a demonstration in honor of the Constituent Assembly, the watchword of this demonstration being down with the Soviet authority. Saboteurs, bourgeois, and their minions will take part in this demonstration. In view of this the workmen and soldiers were requested not to leave their works or barracks, and the Soviet authorities promised to put down most ruthlessly the movement directed against itself. Such promises they knew how to keep. On the 18th January the first and last sitting of the Constituent Assembly took place. On the same day the demonstration took place, in spite of all obstacles and threats a demonstration made in answer to the appeal of the Committee of the Defense of the Constituent Assembly. In the center of the town, on the light Ine, near the field of Mars, and on the outskirts of the town, a considerable crowd of demonstrators collected. The bulk of them belonged to the educated classes, there were many women, schoolboys and students, clerks and officials. There were also some workmen. Again red revolutionary banners were carried, which such a short time ago had waved victoriously in all the streets of Petrograd. But now the Red Guards took away these banners of liberty and tore them into shreds. Both sides were boiling with hatred against each other, and the rifles went off of themselves. A volley was fired on the lightener, injuring not only the demonstrators, but likewise chance passers-by, children and women. Gorbekvskaya, a young girl student who was carrying the red banner of the social revolutionaries, was shot down, a similar fate overtaking Lodzhnov, a social revolutionary peasant member of the Constituent Assembly, and several other persons. The obstinate demonstrators would disperse when fired on, and then again walk on in a crowd, carrying their cherished banners with the device, Hail to the Constituent Assembly and in the very hour while the rifle fire was rattling, in the Toride Palace, surrounded by machine guns and guarded by inimical sailors, the elected representatives of Russia began their vast and onerous task of reconstructing the state on new, free, and democratic principles. The revolution had cleared a way for them for constructive work, 
and had thrown among the masses socialistic ideas, or rather socialistic appetites, because it was difficult for semi-illiterate people to grasp socialistic ideology. The people had given their votes, their confidence, their fate to the representatives of the socialist parties. All other political groups were set aside. It might have seemed that the revolutionary democracy, which since March 1917 had reigned in the Torridi Palace, might now celebrate its complete victory. But this day was no holiday rather a day of mourning. In cautious words, a theory not fully worked out, irresponsible promises all that the revolutionary democracy had lived for during the months of its spiritual dominion over the masses had borne poisonous fruit. Like dragon's teeth cast into the earth by the hand of the sorceress did the evil spirits of hate and anarchy arise out of the earth and there was no escaping them. A series of scandalous scenes took place in the Constituent Assembly. Quarrels arose about everything about the right of entry, about who should open the session. The Soviet of People's Commissaries considered itself privileged, and wanted to determine the procedure. The social revolutionaries, who were in the majority, wanted the chairman to be elected from their party. Two chairmen were elected simultaneously. There was a struggle, and Sverdlov, the nominee of the Soviet, was victorious. This took place to the accompaniment of a clamor of shouts and shrill cries, the public taking a lively part in all this. With their caps on their heads, rifles in their hands, and cigarettes between their lips, the soldiers and sailors strolled all over the palace, even in the hall where the members were sitting. They occupied the gallery, the passages between the members' seats and behaved themselves not like a guard in a legislative assembly, but like ill-disciplined warders in a prison. When the delegates wanted to enter the hall, at first the sailors would not let them in. One of the delegates said indignantly, How dare you exclude us? Don't you know who we are? The young sailor answered in an offhand manner I know, you are the servants of the people. We will give you orders and you shall obey us. The Bolsheviks got their own way. The All-Russian Constituent Assembly was turned into a barrack room meeting, where it was not the voices of the national representatives that predominated, but the voices of those who leant on their rifles. After Sverdlov had read the declaration of the Soviet, a president was elected. The Bolsheviks, perhaps as a joke, took Maria Spiridon over for their candidate. She was a left social revolutionary. Her name had made a stir not only in Russia, but also abroad. During the revolution of 1905 she was about 20 when she killed a provincial official who had been very brutal in suppressing the revolution, and M. Spiridonova won fame not so much as a bold terrorist as by those insults and tortures to which she was subjected by the gendarmes. After a trying period in prison she was tried and sentenced to hard labor in Siberia. The revolution set her free. Her one-time martyr's halo secured her a prominent place in her party. But all her speeches and actions showed an unbalanced and hysterical nature. Her escapades were at first found amusing, but later roused indignation not only among the radicals, but also among such socialists as had not lost their heads. Her association with an unmasked agent provocateur, whom she made every effort to save from trial, was especially repulsive. In the Social Revolutionary Party she occupied a far more prominent place than the old revolutionary Breshko Brezbkovskaya, Vera Finna, etc., with whom Spiridonova could not, of course, compete, either as regards ability, education, or stability of moral principles. This hysterical woman, this mistress of a secret police employee, was the person whom the Bolsheviks wanted to make president of the Constituent Assembly. They did not succeed. The Bolsheviks, even including the left social revolutionaries who joined them, were in the minority. Spiridonova got 158 votes, and Janov, the social revolutionary candidate, got 244. But even this signified little, and was of no practical importance. The National Assembly was already doomed. The Bolsheviks demanded that the Constituent Assembly should confirm the decrees and resolutions of the Soviet of People's Commissaries enumerated in Sverdlov's declaration. These were not few in number. They were in substance as follows, 
Russia is to be declared a republic of Soviets, who hold all power. Society is to be organized on socialistic principles. Private property in land is abolished and replaced by nationalization. Workmen's control is established, the banks become the property of the workmen's and peasants' government. Universal compulsory labor is introduced. A socialistic Red Army is to be formed and the propertied classes are to be totally disarmed. All loans are repudiated. The Constituent Assembly is to put the stamp of its approval on all the decrees and, besides that, to join in the foreign policy of the Soviet authorities in cancelling all secret treaties for the attainment, by revolutionary measures and at any cost, of a democratic peace between nations, without annexations or indemnities, on the basis of the free self-determination of nations. But this was not all. The Soviet of People's Commissaries demanded and this showed their haughty, deep-seated contempt of the people's will at the Constituent Assembly, whose sovereign right all parties without exception had proclaimed and acknowledged, should renounce its rights and transfer them to the Soviets. I quote this clause in its entirety, as it shows clearly the theoretical attitude of the Bolsheviks to the essence of Soviet authority. Their theoretical attitude, I say for in practice they were obliged to simplify everything, making the bayonet the source of their authority. Having been elected on the basis of party lists made prior to the November Revolution, while the people could not, as a whole, rise up against their exploiters, did not know the full force of their opposition in defending the privileges of their class, and had not practically begun to construct a socialistic society, the Constituent Assembly would consider it radically wrong even from a formal point of view, to place itself on a level with the authority of the Soviets. Power must belong exclusively and wholly to the working classes, to their fully empowered representatives the Soviets of workmen's, soldiers, and peasants' delegates. Supporting the authority of the Soviet and the decrees of the Soviet of People's Commissaries, the Constituent Assembly acknowledges that its objects are limited to the general working out of the fundamental principles of the socialistic reconstruction of society. At the same time, striving to create a freer and more voluntary and therefore fuller and firmer union of the working classes of all nationalities of Russia, the Constituent Assembly limits itself to establishing the fundamental principles of the Federation of the Soviet Republics of Russia allowing the workmen and peasants of each nationality to come to an independent decision at its own authoritative Soviet Congress as to whether they wish to join in the federal government and other federal Soviet institutions, and if so, then on what basis dot the position of the social revolutionaries, to whom this ultimatum was presented, was not an easy one. Much in the Soviet declarations was a repetition of their program and formulae. The Bolsheviks had the right to point the finger of scorn at the social revolutionaries, who did not applaud the clause about the nationalization of land, the liberation of the working classes, a revolutionary democratic peace without annexations and indemnities. When it was the turn of the social revolutionaries to explain their program and v. Junov began to read his declaration, at times he seemed to be repeating the declaration of the Bolsheviks themselves. They shouted to him, You are too late. We have already passed all this. And they were right. But Vichinov still hoped to regain his lost popularity. He began by praising Zimmerwald, that mighty protest of the socialists of all countries against the fratricidal butchery. The Russian Revolution was born with words of peace on its lips, and the Russian Revolution cannot but remain true to the watchwords of democratic peace without victors or vanquished. All the land must become the property of the nation, without any indemnity to former owners. It is of course necessary for the working classes to take into their own hands the management of all the production in the country, and after a period of control of production, to pass from factory autocracy to an era of compulsory labor in all branches of production. The same old trite socialistic speeches. But still, to the demand for submission to the Soviet, Junov answered evasively, and haughtily, I cannot conceive how the lawful will of the majority of the population, expressed by means of votes recorded by the most perfect system in the world, can be subjected to any kind of obstruction, sabotage, unless that of madmen. His speech, 
like the speeches of two other former socialist ministers Prince Tsretli and M. Skoplev was interrupted by hostile cries. After the Bolshevist coup d'etat, this was the first public engagement between the socialist center and the left wing. The Bolsheviks behaved with the impudence of victors. Hangman. Traitor. You would down soldiers and workmen. Your hands are bloody. They shouted during Zretli's speech. This evidently touched him to the quick, for he began to assure them that the Constituent Assembly would abolish capital punishment. The Bolsheviks threw another accusation in his face, saboteur. Saboteur. Well, if you have undertaken to introduce socialism, and throw the blame of the non success of the socialistic experiment on the bourgeoisie, then you stand self condemned as unfit, he replied but it was too refined an answer and was above the heads of his audience. Poor Zretli. It was the second time that in the fine hall of the Torrida Palace he had had to make his farewell speech before political enemies whose hands were raised to strike him down. Ten years before he had parried the blows which were showered on him by Stolypin, the omnipotent Tsarist minister, who wanted to break, not only the revolution, but also the independence of the young representative regime. Stolypin ordered all members of the Social Democrat Party to be arrested. Prince Tsretli, who was then quite a young man, knew of this, but instead of saving himself by disappearing, as his friends proposed, he mounted the rostrum in order to expound his views for the last time boldly before the whole of Russia. Then his fiery, eloquent speech breathed a proud faith in the righteousness and the strength of the Marxist doctrines and in the saving significance of the future revolution. Even those who did not share his views listened to him with involuntary respect. And now again Zretli is a representative of the people. Again he stands in that high rostrum. Again, as before, the open prison doors are ready to receive the bold leader of the Social Democrats. But what a change! The revolution that ennobling, abstract revolution he had dreamed of, for the sake of which he had suffered penal servitude was shattered, disfigured, broken. Now it was not the Tsarist but the socialistic police who were ready to take him to prison, and perhaps to execution. No wonder that Zretli's speech breathed bitterness and impotence. For it was not from his foes but from erstwhile friends that he had to defend what he still styled the democratic conquests of the Russian Revolution. What might be simply called Russia's right to life and liberty. The tragedy of his position was increased by the fact that he could not help remembering his own former speeches. Speaking of peace, he said, you may cry, Kalidinist. To every sentence of mine, and perhaps at that moment the supporter of the ruinous policy of army committees understood how the Soviet as first elected had cleared the way to Brest-Litovsk. The Bolsheviks interrupted all the speakers and would not listen to them. Their plans were already made. By their scandalous behavior they had compromised the Constituent Assembly as much as they could and then they employed the favorite method which they always used for breaking up a meeting they left the hall after having entered a reasoned declaration of the cause of their withdrawal. They announced that the constituent assembly, in refusing to carry out the will of the commissaries, had thrown down the glove to all laboring Russia. In the constituent assembly, Kierenskys, Avksentovs, and Junov's party of right social revolutionaries have got the majority. This party, which calls itself socialistic and revolutionary, is guiding the struggle of the bourgeois elements against the workmen's and peasants' revolution, and is really a bourgeois party. The present counter-revolutionary majority in the Constituent Assembly, elected by out-of-date party lists, is a revolutionary back number. The social revolutionaries interrupted them by laughter or by indignant cries of lies and the soldiers and sailors kept thumping the butts of their rifles on the floor of the hall. And this noise announced more plainly than any declaration that the Constituent Assembly was a failure. The powerless majority hastened to pass several resolutions. The Russian state was declared to be a federal republic. It was declared that the right of property in land within the limits of the Russian Republic is abolished henceforth and forever. Their declaration concerning the war was hazy and ambiguous, 
owing to an attempt to combine obligations to the Allies with Zimmerwald, in the name of the peoples of the Russian Republic, the All-Russian Constituent Assembly, expressing the immutable will of the people to terminate the war immediately, and to conclude a just and universal peace, proposes to the Allied powers that the exact terms of peace should be determined in concert, for the purpose of presenting these conditions to the Central Powers. At the same time, regretting that the negotiations with Germany, begun without any preliminary agreement with the Allied democracies, have assumed the character of negotiations for a separate peace, the Constituent Assembly continues to preserve the armistice established, and has taken upon itself the further conduct of the negotiations with the hostile powers, in order that while defending Russian interests the universal democratic peace may be concluded in accordance with the will of the people. All these three declarations were passed at four o'clock in the morning without any debate. The voters could hardly hear the text of the declarations. The soldiers and sailors who crowded near the delegates' benches became clamorous. One of the sailors came up to the president and announced, I have been ordered to inform you that all present are to leave the hall as the guards are tired. The delegates shouted, We don't need any guard. The sailor insisted, and made Genoff adjourn the meeting. The secretary had barely time to read out the above mentioned declarations when, hastened by the soldiers' mockery, and partly by their rifle butts, the elected representatives of the Russian people were obliged to quit the Torridi Palace, the doors of which closed on them forever. The next day a decree was published dissolving the Constituent Assembly. The real essence of the decree was as follows. The old bourgeois parliamentarianism is effete and incompatible with the aims of realizing socialism. It is not general, national institutions, but only class institutions, such as the Soviets, that can overcome the resistance of the propertied classes, and lay the foundations of socialistic society. The part of the constituent assembly left after the withdrawal of the Bolsheviks can only serve as a cloak for the attempts of bourgeois counter-revolutionaries to overthrow the power of the Soviets. Therefore the Central Executive Committee has resolved that the constituent assembly be dissolved. The Soviet of People's Commissaries entrusted this to the Central Executive Committee, so as to be able to assert that the dissolution of the constituent assembly was in accordance with the will of the people which they could now counterfeit with still greater impunity. This destroyed the last help not only of the revolutionary democracy, but also of all who still dreamed that it was possible to organize the new regime in free Russia by peaceful methods, without civil war. Now came the terrible days of disappointments and calamities which, in a greater or less degree, had gradually to be experienced by all classes of the population, but first by the leading circles of intellectuals, who at once grasped the full extent of the political catastrophe. It was a real tragedy for those members of the provisional government who were imprisoned in the Peter and Paul Fortress, N. M. Kishkin, A. I. Konovlev, M. I. Tiraschenko, A. V. Kartashev, Paul Chinsky, M. Treshikov, M. Bernatsky, and Smirnov. In the beginning of December these were joined by three members of the Constituent Assembly, A. I. Shingarf, F. F. Kokushkin, and Prince Dolgoryakov. The conditions of their imprisonment were truly awful. The Russian educated classes, fighting against Tsarism, were not accustomed to dread imprisonment. Many brutalities were practiced in the Tsarist prisons. But the brutality and lawlessness of Bolshevist prisons exceeded anything that had been known under the Tsars. In the fortress it was damp, cold, and dark. At first the prisoners were allowed no outdoor exercise, then they were permitted to go out, but for a very short time. Food could be brought to them from home, but everything had to be eaten cold. The chief thought of the imprisoned ministers was how to keep warm. However, all these physical privations could not be compared with their moral sufferings. The arrested ministers were in the so-called Trubetskoy Bastion, enwrapped in heroic legends of the martyrs of Russian liberty who had been imprisoned there during the 19th century. The bastion had its own guards with a sailor at the head, so that the fortress was under two masters. The young and honest sailor behaved with great decency towards the prisoners, and formed, as it were, their own inner guard. 
This was absolutely necessary, as the rowdy garrison, composed of shady, if not criminal elements, was capable of any crime. At its head was their elected commander, an orderly named Pavlov. This coarse, savage, almost illiterate soldier mocked the prisoners with all the shamelessness of a petty adventurer who was maddened by the prisoners' mental and moral superiority. The former Minister of Public Worship, A. V. Kartashev, an inspired philosopher, who had the passionate saintliness of an early Christian, was placed by the soldier Pavlov for several days in a wet cell, without any light, bed, or food, except a piece of bread. And this was not a solitary case. The arrested politicians lived in an atmosphere of constant degrading annoyances and mockery, behind which ever lurked the terrible phantom of a bloody death. Most of the ministers were cadets, that is, according to the terminology of the Bolsheviks, counter revolutionaries, Kaledinists, and enemies of the people. The soldiers considered themselves free to treat them as they liked. More than once, threatening shouts were heard in the corridors give them to us. What is the use of being on ceremony with bourgeois? We will show them a thing or two. These were the same cries that were heard before General Duckman's death. The relatives, the numerous friends, and political adherents of the prisoners were in constant alarm for their lives. Having made the members of the provisional government prisoners, the people's commissaries brought no accusations against them, did not put them on trial before any court but kept them as hostages in the fortress under conditions which remind one of medieval torture chambers. All efforts to obtain their release proved futile. The only hope was the Constituent Assembly. The ministers talked of it when they met during their short outings in the prison yard. They prepared for it, hoping to render an account of the activity of the provisional government to the nation's representatives. Konovlev who had replaced Irinsky the day of the latter's flight, had been elected to the Constituent Assembly. He was entrusted with the task of preparing for the government's appearance in the Torida Palace, and he did draft a speech. It seemed impossible that the Supreme Master of the Land of Russia, as it was the custom to call the Constituent Assembly, would not release from prison those who had so diligently cleared the way for national representation. This help and the friendly relations which had arisen among the prisoners in the tragic environment of life in the fortress gave them strength to bear the physical and moral sufferings and privations. Nevertheless, the health of the prisoners was undermined, and their relatives, with the aid of the doctors, managed to get some of the ministers transferred to the hospital. On the evening of the day when the Constituent Assembly was open two ministers of the Provisional Government, F. F. Kokushkin and A. I. Shingarf, were taken from the fortress to the Marie Hospital. The same night sailors and Red Guards came to the hospital and brutally murdered both. Kokushkin was killed at once, probably without waking from sleep. Shingarf lingered for several hours, one mass of wounds those in his head and stomach causing him tortures. His relatives could not be fetched, as by someone's mysterious orders that night all the telephones in the hospital had been disconnected with the exchange. Shingraf died in delirium, speaking of his children with anxiety and alarm, and then whispering something about his murderers. The doctors who were present said that he seemed to be murmuring words of forgiveness. That is very possible, and very like him. Shingraf was one of those Russian intellectuals who made a cult of self-sacrificing service and love for the people. Imprisoned in the fortress, and expecting death at any moment, not only did Shingraf not abandon his faith in the people, but with the incurable obstinacy of an idealist wrote in his diary, if I were offered to begin everything all over again or stop it, I would not hesitate for a moment to begin all over again, notwithstanding all the horrors the country has gone through and this is why. The revolution was inevitable, because the old state of things had outlived its time. The equilibrium had been disturbed a long while ago, and the foundations of the Russian state, which we so aptly termed a colossus with feet of clay, were supported by the ignorant masses of the people, deprived of any connection with the state, frequently deprived of even common patriotism. The striking disparity between the heads of society and the lower strata at its base, between the leaders of the state in its past forms, as well as the leaders of the future, 
and the mass of the population struck me while I was yet a young man, during my first years of university life. It was not only a danger to the existing order, which would not have mattered much, but it was a great danger to the state. These ideas led me to the conclusion that it was necessary to draw the higher and lower strata of society together, to establish a firm and real connection between them. Then everything seemed useless to me science, art, politics unless they had that object in view. That is why I gave up my previous plans of devoting myself to science, which had an attraction for me, in order to go to the people as a doctor. He had built up all his life on the idealization of the people, on defending the principles of the widest democracy. Both he and Kokushkin were real spiritual champions, who cast aside all that was personal, all that was egotistical, in order to serve the abstract principles of truth and right. And their murder, so brutal and meaningless, is one of the most terrible and repulsive proofs of the criminal venom with which the Bolshevist revolution had poisoned the national soul. The crime remained unpunished, and not finally investigated. There is reason to think that Lenin took no part in planning it. At any rate, when, on the morning after the murder, the friends of the surviving ministers went to the Smolny, as dark threats had also been uttered against the latter, Lenin was thunderstruck and apparently even disturbed by the news of the crime. Articles appeared in the Izvestia, condemning the murder it is true, from a special Bolshevist point of view, but still, condemning it. Apart from everything else, it is bad from a political point of view. This is a fearful blow aimed at the revolution, at the Soviet authorities. Such crimes are capable of undermining the faith of the masses in the revolution, and the revolution lives and rests only on the sympathies and faith of the masses. As the assassins were sailors the naval commissary, Dibunko, who had himself taken part in the massacre of officers at Petropavlovsk, published the following order. This affair must be thoroughly investigated. The honor of the revolutionary fleet must not bear the stain of an accusation of revolutionary sailors having murdered their helpless enemies, rendered harmless by imprisonment. I call upon all who took part in the murder if these were misguided persons, and not counter-revolutionary oppressors to appear of their own accord before the revolutionary tribunal. It goes without saying that this original method of discovering the criminals led to nothing. No one gave himself up of his own accord, though several persons were arrested. Among the latter was Private Basov, who had accompanied Shingraf and Kokushkin from the fortress to the hospital, and then had brought in the murderers and held the lamp over the beds while the scoundrels were shooting their sleeping victims. Thus one of the accomplices was found. But it was not known whether they had acted on their own initiative or had been instigated by others, if so, by whom? by a small gang? Or by some more responsible organization? There is cause to think that the last is most probable. The local district Soviet took some sort of part in the crime. At any rate, the detachment of sailors and Red Guards, before bursting into the hospital, called at the Soviet for some reason or other. But the people who tried to discover the chief criminals were firmly assured that the principal clues led to the commission for fighting the counter-revolution, sabotage, and profiteering. Many deeds of darkness were, and are, perpetrated in this institution. This commission had occupied the house of the former prefecture of Petrograd, 2, Gorokhovaya Street, and some of the former policemen, spies, and secret agents had entered the service of their new masters. Apparently, German agents also found easy access to this secret office of the Inquisition where the fanatical and lunatic political formulae of the Smolny were converted into regular crimes. Such division of labor had the effect of making Lenin's position easier, removing from him, as it were, part of the responsibility for the specially bestial acts of the Soviet. It was no easy matter for the uninitiated to penetrate into the secrets of Bolshevist actions, and, especially, to understand the division of jurisdiction between the Soviet of People's Commissaries and the Commission for Fighting the Counter-Revolution, and Lenin always reserved the right of throwing the blame on the latter. But it goes without saying that the moral responsibility for the murder of Shingarf, Kokushkin, and many others falls wholly on the Soviet. It was the Soviet which aroused that blind fury in the soul of the people, 
egging on the masses against the educated classes, and foully slandering the most honorable statesmen. Under the influence of their furious, lying agitation, the unfortunate, uneducated, embittered, bewitched people took its friends for its foes, and its bitterest enemies, who were driving Russia to ruin for its friends. Possibly the sailors who shot the sleeping arrested ministers imagined that they were administering revolutionary justice, executing counter revolutionaries. They could have had no intention of robbing, for they took nothing, stole nothing. They came, murdered, and then vanished. They went to report their achievement to someone who had sent them. But to whom? That is the question. Who wanted the death of these two men? Kokushkin was a scholar, for whom politics were what military service is to a conscripted soldier. He fulfilled his duty honestly and boldly, but loved thought better than action. Shingarf, from the time when the Bolsheviks seized power, fought openly, attacked, exposed, constantly called upon his hearers to struggle against the usurpers. His words about the German mark found in a room after a Bolshevist raid, his constant reminder of the connection between the Bolsheviks and the Germans, lead to fearsome suspicions. Who knows but that German Marx had something to do with this murder. Only judicial authorities, independent, accustomed to the support of the law, could have discovered the real culprits. But there was no justice. There were only revolutionary tribunals caricatures of courts of justice. The murdered men were members of the Constituent Assembly. Both believed in Russian democracy. Both hated oppression and lawlessness. During both Tsarist despotism and revolutionary demagogy they were bold and honest champions of freedom. They bore, and even overcame, the persecutions of Stolypin and other Tsarist ministers. But left despotism, with the red banner of socialism waving over it, proved incomparably harsher and more perfidious than the old regime. The friends and political adherents of the murdered men, and indeed all thoughtful and honest Russians, felt this heavy sacrifice to the revolution very keenly. The death of these two prominent politicians was a terrible loss to Russia. At that time, people had not grown accustomed to crime. But even the details of the murder committed in the capital bear witness to the powerlessness and moral degradation already permeating the people. For if the indignation roused by the murder had been active, then the Soviet of People's Commissaries would have been forced, if not to lay down its power, then at least to discover and punish the culprits. But the conscience of the mob had already been poisoned. Already the passion for destruction which follows upon a revolution was assuming more and more terrible and criminal forms. That is why there was no difficulty in dispersing the Constituent Assembly or in persecuting and murdering the people's representatives with impunity. By their work of destruction the Bolsheviks seemed, as it were, to pander to the secret desires of the masses roused by revolutionary license. And the Bolsheviks proved past masters of destruction, and of defending their work of destruction by words that were lying and cynical, but intoxicating to the mob. In the end of January, when reporting to the Third Congress of Soviets on the dispersion of the Constituent Assembly, Lenin said haughtily, Yes, we are oppressors. Trotsky supported him. We have trodden underfoot the principles of democracy for the sake of the loftier principles of social revolution. We are against oppression, but we will not yield our power without a ruthless struggle. And the sailors Alasniakov, who took part in the dispersion of the Constituent Assembly, formulated his political greed of Bolshevism in still simpler terms, we will not exchange our rifles for a voting paper. At least this was candid, and more sincere than the first watchword of the Bolsheviks, hailed to the Constituent Assembly. Chaptics of Bolshevist government economic fantasies expropriate the expropriators a blow at the world bourgeoisie the budget of the Bolsheviks the workmen's control contribution Lenin's speech the abolition of justice revolutionary tribunals judgment pronounced on Countess Painin and General Boldy ref indulgence shown to a secret agent hostages and executions without trial struggle with the press the press and elections campaign against the church the clergy and the intelligentsia holy procession the Bolsheviks, who generally speaking are very consecutive in theory, 
have applied higher principles of social revolution to all branches of life, to economics, to justice, to the press, and even to the church. It was not difficult to abolish political freedom in the interest of a class, and actually for the alleged rule of the proletariat, seeing that the old regime had died, and the new representative one was not yet formed. Much more difficult and unrealizable was their effort to rebuild the complicated system of national economics, which was previously based on personal property and private initiative, subjected to, but not restricted by state laws. In economics, as in politics, the Bolsheviks aimed at absolute submission of individuality to the state. And according to their scheme the state acquires such absolute power over the property and life of everybody as not only the Romanovs, but even the despots of ancient Assyria or Egypt never dared to dream of. In this respect the Bolsheviks are more insatiable than all the imperialists of the world. Starting from the Marxist principle that only the state has the right to dispose of every man's work, seeing that any other labor organization gives birth to capitalistic exploitation, the Bolsheviks desired to make the Soviet power the only employer. To this end they nationalized the banks, industry and trade. All state loans were cancelled. All payments on coupons were stopped. The land and the factories became the property of the workers. The houses were confiscated. Additional inmates were installed by force in private homes, and even the furniture in them nationalized. The latter measures, however, are of secondary importance, they are meant partly for the greater humiliation of the bourgeois, and partly with a view to general compulsory equalization. First, we must distinguish among the economic Soviet measures, that which is done for the purpose of carrying out new socialistic principles from what is done for the weakening and in some cases simply for the ruining of the bourgeois, including the intelligentsia. The second category requires no criticism by logic. It must rather be examined from the standpoint of morals, as in it we see only the fury of civil war sown by the Bolsheviks. The Soviet leaders yield easily to wrath, as, like all despots, they feel that their power cannot last long. Their weakness is organic, internal, because their theory is unrealizable and they are unable to create new forms of production. Economics have their laws, which are stronger than the will of despots even of socialists. It is quite possible to take away personal property from those who have it. But to distribute the confiscated property justly and equably among all the inhabitants proved to be impossible. Still more impossible was their system of state direction of labor, that is, their particular form of state serfdom. The old serf system died in Russia because it proved inefficient not only morally, but also economically. Now the Bolsheviks have made an experiment in state serfdom in one part of Russia, and have failed. One of the reasons of their failure is the fact that under their system labor bears a still more acute and more compulsory character than under that of capitalism. And yet theoretically the Soviet power is considered to be the dictatorship of the proletariat, a dictatorship of men of physical labor. And who can compel dictators to work? Seeing that there are undoubtedly learned men among the leaders of Bolshevism who are well informed on economic questions, and that Lenin himself began his career with scientific economic researches, they certainly can see the weakness and instability of their economic prospects, and they name in advance the culprits of their unavoidable bankruptcy. It is, certainly, the bourgeoisie and its creatures who are guilty by sabotaging the Soviet power's measures. Prince Zretli was right in saying in the Constituent Assembly that this accusation is a proof of the poverty of socialism. But it was in the first March Revolution that the apparatus of capitalism was shaken, the economic commanding staff weakened, all employers, directors, engineers, discredited, and all discipline, without which no productive, collective labor is possible destroyed. That the modern capitalistic regime has engendered and is fostering social diseases and injustices is a plain truth, against which no thinking, honest man will seek to argue. The question is, how can mankind be cured of these ailments, how to create a commonwealth founded on justice and humanity? What has happened in Russia shows that socialism does not hold the keys to this paradise, and that a different morality, 
different methods, a different attitude to human mentality and to every man individually are required to create a new mankind. The extreme wing of the socialists completed and deepened what had been done, if not under the guidance, then at any rate with the encouragement and approval of the socialistic center. They carried the system to an extreme, and thereby fully revealed its defects. The incitements against the bourgeoisie were a necessary part of their work, because in this way the class consciousness was elucidated, according to the favorite expression of the Marxists. Civil war was an inevitable consequence of this acute antagonism of interests of one class against another. Having carried through the coup d'etat, the Bolsheviks through the Commissary of Labor, Chlyapnikov, addressed an appeal to the workmen, calling on them to put the revolution and its conquests on a firm basis. The propertied classes are endeavoring to create anarchy and the ruin of industry by provoking the workmen to excesses and violence over the question of foremen, technicians, and engineers. They hope thereby to achieve the complete and final ruin of all businesses and eventually to close the doors of all the mills and factories. The Revolutionary Commission of Labor asks you, our worker comrades, to abstain from all acts of violence and excess. By a joint and creative work of the, labor masses and proletariat organizations, the Commission of Labor will know how to surmount all the obstacles in its way. The new revolutionary government will apply the most drastic measures against all industrials and those who continue to sabotage industry, and thereby prevent the carrying out of the tasks and aims of the great proletarian and peasant revolution. Executions without trial and other arbitrary acts will only damage the cause of revolution. The Commission of Labor calls on you for self-control and revolutionary discipline. 12th November. Thus, while inciting against the skilled industrials, as being not only the chief enemies of the revolutionary people, but also lunatics, who have themselves ruined their businesses to spite the workmen, the Bolsheviks hypocritically took refuge in a spurious warning against violence. As a matter of fact these arbitrary acts not only tallied with the theory of class hatred, carried to the point of class extermination, but at the same time led surely to one of the goals of the Marxist movement in general and its Bolshevist faction in particular. The socialists had always clamored for the disorganization of the bourgeois regime, and the Bolsheviks have accomplished this part of the program with success. This was a necessary stage on the road to the substitution of the socialistic regime for the capitalistic. This substitution could only take place after the fire of the world revolution had destroyed the old rotten props of the bourgeoisie. Russia's example must carry away the proletariat of the whole world. Seeing that Russia is a backward country with a small and unorganized middle class, it will be easiest of all to make the revolution, or as Lenin said, the social experiment in Russia. Even if it is not possible to achieve final success, the road will be opened and an example shown. As Lenin was not sure of the duration of his power, he hastened to make the experiment as quickly as possible, without at all guaranteeing success, or stopping to think of the sufferings of the people over whom he had seized power. With regard to Russia he acted not with the strict firmness of a surgeon who wishes to save the patient, but with the cold cruelty of a vivisector, who does not care whether the rabbit dies after the experiment or remains crippled for life, dragging out a miserable existence. The Bolsheviks always considered their acts from the international point of view and endeavored not only to sweep the Russian bourgeoisie from the face of the earth, but also to carry disorganization into the capitalistic regime the world over. In their official issues published in Geneva for circulation in Europe, they characterize the importance of the economic decrees of the Soviet of People's Commissaries as follows. In the preface to the decree on the nationalization of the banks, they say, This is a dagger thrust straight into the heart of the capitalistic economic system. It is well known that in our time the bank is the real center both of production and of exchange in every country. In this capacity it directs world policy, and the terrific explosion of the present war must be ascribed precisely to this concealed power. Hence the monopolization of the banks is a decisive step towards the downfall of contemporary imperialism. 
it is the foundation of new economic relations, where gold will cease to have power. The decree for the stopping of the payment of coupons is accompanied by an identical note. The cessation of payment of coupons and dividends is closely connected with the annulment of the foreign loans, proclaimed by the government of the Soviets. Both these measures, as also the nationalization of the banks, are directed against the very foundations of capitalistic finance against its system of credit. It is certainly not easy by one blow to liberate economic life from this complicated network. Capitalistic finance is continuing in Russia and against Russia its underground work. But the Soviets have shown how to break its backbone, and its hour of downfall is near. They certainly succeeded in breaking the backbone of the Russian financial system. Russian money has lost all value on the world market. Even in Russia it is enormously depreciated. And it could not be otherwise when the whole Bolshevist financial system is built exclusively on the printing of paper money, not guaranteed by any kind of reserve. This leads to a hypertrophy of the budget of the Soviet of People's Commissaries. As they have created a monstrous bureaucratic apparatus through trying to turn almost everyone into officials, their budget has reached simply comic proportions. With the general disorder and absence of records, nobody will be able to fix exactly the expenditure of the Soviets. In summer 1918, however, the Pravda published a speech of M. Kukovsky, Commissary for Finances, delivered by him at the Congress of the Soviets, in which he pointed out that it would be necessary to expend during the first half year 24 billion rubles, whereas the revenues would not exceed 1 billion and even that was not quite certain. Since then the expenses of the Soviets have grown still more, because in view of the rise of the prices of foodstuffs, living has become very expensive, and it is necessary to raise the salaries of the officials. Besides, the expenses for the army are continuously growing. And the revenues come only from forced contributions from the inhabitants and chiefly from the printing machine of the state. The socialization of the land destroyed the possibility of taxing the landowners. There are no trade profits because private trade is stopped, and nationalized trade brings only losses, as also does industry, now transferred to the hands of the Soviet workmen. The Bolsheviks did not risk nationalizing all, industry at once. They did this gradually and in most cases not entirely but only partially. They established, however, the workman's control. The details of this are set forth in a long decree which curiously enough contains a clause providing for the right of the proprietor to lodge a complaint against the decisions of the workman's Soviet. In fact, however, the proprietor is quite powerless before the will of the undisciplined workman. During the first period of the Russian Revolution, the more reasonable socialists, and also in part the radicals, recognized the need of introducing state control over industry. The road to this was already prepared by the regulation of the distribution of orders, raw material, produce, and transport, which had become familiar during the war in all belligerent countries, including Russia. But to hand over the whole business into the hands of the workmen was certainly a product of socialistic rule. The Russian workmen had neither any experience nor professional organization, nor even elementary economic knowledge. Their control mostly meant looting and rioting. They dismissed engineers, technicians, foremen, and generally speaking the whole skilled staff. On railways the workmen elected pointsmen as directors. One of the principles of the Bolshevist reconstruction of life was the right of the whole staff to participate in all matters affecting the concern or institution in question. In the universities, the doorkeepers and floor sweepers took their seats beside the professors to decide together academic questions. In the hospitals the lowest menial attendant selected or dismissed doctors. In schools the maid servants were appointed to the post of lady superintendent. This brought such chaos into life that finally even people who were willing to carry out their functions under the Bolsheviks were involuntarily compelled to practice sabotage. In a paper dated October 1918, that is, a year after the Bolshevist coup d'etat, 
an order of the Bolshevist Commissary of Moscow was published in which he complained that only secret saboteurs served on railways, and as a result of this there were 2,000 unloaded cars accumulated in the Moscow railway junction. The fundamental idea of the dictatorship of the proletariat regarding the right of physical toilers to dictate their will to all the rest, and especially to the brain workers, who formally directed and organized the working energy of the nation was carried out by the Bolsheviks to its uttermost limits. One can only wonder at the economic flexibility of the Russian people, who still manage to live in some way in spite of the absurdities of the economic and administrative fantasies of the Soviet dictators. The reason for this is that Russia is an agricultural country, that the town population did not exceed 10% of the whole. It is now even less. Thus in Petrograd, for instance, there were two and one half million people at the time of the Bolshevist coup d'etat, and ten months later only 800,000 remained. The people in the villages remain unconcerned, are trying to lead their lives independently of Bolshevist fancies, and when pressed too hard by the commissaries get peace by paying or else by shooting them. The result of the workmen's control showed itself very rapidly and led to a complete ruin of production. The workmen proved unable to conduct any complicated business, they sold the raw material and shared the money among themselves. The Soviet of People's Commissaries was compelled to subsidize even those concerns which had quite a short time previously given good profits. This demoralized the workmen and turned the factory committees into assemblies of parasites. Lenin and his adherents kept stubbornly repeating to the masses that their welfare would be secured as soon as they took from the bourgeoisie all it had filched from them. The primary axiom that labor is the essential condition of life is set aside and replaced by the tempting dream of an everlasting repartition of property. The land, factories, capital, houses, furniture, clothes all must be divided. Then will come an end to the idleness of the landowners, capitalists, engineers, directors, and all other counter-revolutionaries, and the peasants and workmen, in their turn, will be able to become idle. How often at improvised street meetings the absurd words were heard, we shall take everything from you, we shall divide all and each will get 100,000 rubles. This was said with a threat. The opponent more often than not being a badly dressed intellectual, with patched boots, who perhaps never held so much as a 1000 ruble note in his hands, tried in vain to make the dreamers listen to reason, but where will you get so much? Rich people are not so numerous. You will begin to divide and end by plundering, and all the same there will not be enough for everyone. From all sides angry eyes are fixed at the insolent bourgeois. Not enough you say? Probably hidden away in all the drunks? Don't like to part with it? There'll be enough for us. You've drunk enough of our blood. The idea of requisitions, for which there was a formula in the Communist Manifesto expropriate the expropriators has utterly shaken the people's wealth, sapped productivity, disaccustomed the people to work, and killed the basic conceptions of right, law, and justice. The plunder was not restricted to landlords' estates, private capital, and factories. Annexations and indemnities, which the socialists feared so much in international relations, were applied to the widest extent in internal life. The Soviets, revolutionary committees, extraordinary commissions, all sought annexations and imposed indemnities on the inhabitants of the conquered towns. Such was the system of government. When the naive president of a provincial Soviet asked for money from the Soviet of the People's Commissaries they mostly answered, haven't you got any rifles? The picking of pockets proceeded with an extraordinary rapidity. But to whom and where the money went nobody knows, and probably never will know exactly. In any case the members of the committees and the commissaries were not in need of money. Plunder became a custom people boasted of it as of a proud achievement. If on the one hand petty pickpockets, especially when caught red-handed, were ruthlessly shot, on the other hand the Soviet leaders and their press systematically encouraged plunder. In February 1918 Lenin uttered in the Smolny farewell speech to agitators bound to the provinces. The program stated by him is marked by tempting simplicity. We have before us two strong foes. 
The first is international capital. There is no doubt that so far it is stronger than the Soviet Republic and that their existence alongside of each other is impossible. But the capitalists are already sending to us their commissaries, and will perhaps recognize the Soviet power and even the annulment of the loans. Lenin explained this concession on the part of the capitalists of the allied countries by the enthusiasm with which the legislative work of the Soviets was met by the workmen of the whole world. Our position is absolutely solid, because we have behind us all the workmen of the entire world. But in order to strengthen it, we must struggle with the second for internal ruin. Neither the Tsars, nor Kerensky's authority could organize the distribution of foodstuffs. The Soviet power must surmount this difficulty and, before all settle the economic life of the villages. No one will help you, comrades. The whole bourgeoisie, officials, saboteurs, go against you, because they know that if the people, whose common property was hitherto in the hands of capitalists and village tight fists, now divide all among themselves, they will clear Russia of drones and weeds. In the villages the rich peasants will be against the Bolsheviks, but it will be easy for you to fight there, because the masses will be with you. They will see that not punitive expeditions are coming to them from the center, but agitators, bearing light into the village, eager to rally all those who work for themselves and do not try to live at the expense of others. A struggle will blaze up between the rich and the working peasants, and the poor ought to be helped not with a book, but with experience of a personal struggle. External war is ending. That is unmistakable. Now begins internal war. The bourgeoisie, having hidden their plunder in trunks, are saying quietly to themselves, never mind we will wait a little longer. The people must make them return what they have plundered. You must do this on the spot. It will not be the police who will compel them to do this. It is for the people to do this, and there is no other means to fight with the bourgeoisie. Pravda, February 19. It was in this cold-blooded and well-thought-out way that Lenin instructed the agitators to organize a general wholesale plunder. Like all Lenin's acts this speech is not an accidental outbreak of wrath, but only a link in his consecutive, systematic heartless work. It is natural that with such encouragement of wholesale violence the Bolsheviks were bound to cancel justice. The juridical statutes of Russia, created in 1863, in the so-called epoch of the great reforms in the reign of Alexander II, were constructed on a very humane and well-proportioned plan. Even the later innovations which aimed at restricting the independence of the courts could not injure the main foundations of Russian justice. But the Bolsheviks destroyed it by a single decree. They said that the former laws were created to support the bourgeois regime and to protect the institution of property. The old courts were guided by these laws. Hence there was no more need for these courts. There was no need of any juridical standards. It would be enough to have revolutionary tribunals, through which the people themselves would punish or pardon. On November 24, a decree was issued abolishing the Senate, the higher courts, and all other courts of justice. Their functions were to be carried out by special judges, elected through the Soviets. It is said that when Shkeglovatov, one of the most hated of the Tsar's ministers, who by his contempt for law and for the independence of the judges, demoralized the Ministry of Justice at the head of which he stood, read, while imprisoned in the Peter and Paul fortress, the decree for the revolutionary tribunals he sarcastically said, and yet the cadets repeatedly charged me in the Duma with turning the tribunal into a weapon of political struggle. How far the Bolsheviks have left me behind! He was right, seeing that the Bolsheviks denied the chief factors of justice recognized in modern society the independence of the courts from the authorities and politics, and the guidance of the judge by exact and definitely established laws. Clause 5 of the decree declared that the tribunal was to be guided in its decisions and sentences by the old laws insofar as these laws were not cancelled by the revolution, and do not contradict the revolutionary conscience and the revolutionary conception of right. In a note to this clause it is explained how to distinguish existing laws from non-existing ones, 
seeing that there has been no official decree for the cancelling of all the laws. Cancelled are to be considered all laws contradicting the decrees of the Central Executive Committee of the Soviet of Soldiers, Workmen, and Peasants, and of their government, or their minimum programs of the Russian Social Democratic Party and of the Party of Social Revolutionaries. With one stroke of the pen the programs of parties, written more for propaganda's sake than for use, obtained the force of law. What new jurists were called on to see that the new justice should be carried out? In a detailed memorandum for the organization of Soviet justice https colon slash slash www.yamaguchi.com slash library slash tikava slash tikava underscore fourteen dot html we find the following, our republic is based on the juridical consciousness of the masses, and not on the consciousness of the class of oppressors. It does not need to create legal principles or special laws which would fetter the masses. On the contrary, it needs a law coming directly from the depths of the people. Neither does the Republic require a class of skillful and cunning jurists, who, under the outward guise of legality, defend the narrow interests of the propertied minority. It requires judges who know how correctly to reflect the people's juridical conscience, and who are interpreters not of their own conception of right, but only of that of the mass of the people themselves. Such an attempt to elucidate the direct ideas of justice from the depth of the people's wisdom was undertaken even before the Bolsheviks came into power. At the beginning of the first revolution, when Kierensky was Minister of Justice, the Tribunal of the Justices of Peace, police courts, one of the best Russian juridical institutions, was subjected to a radical change. Besides the judge, elected by the municipal council, representatives of the workmen's class and soldiers elected by the local Soviets appeared in court. Thus the attempt to add representatives of the proletariat class to deal out justice was made at the time when the revolutionary democracy was in power. The high courts were not abolished then, but their authority, particularly in the provinces, was greatly diminished. The Jews instruction were not able to draw up their inquiries. The crowd forced its way into the cells, released the prisoners, and held the court officials under perpetual threat of violence. The sentences could not be served, because there was no police or administrative authority who could see that it was carried out. But the Bolsheviks went farther. They not only abolished the old courts, but replaced them with new, the political meaning of which is quite definitely formulated in the decree. Revolutionary tribunals of workmen and peasants are instituted for fighting with the forces of counter-revolution, for the adoption of all measures to defend the revolution and its conquests against them, and likewise for the settlement of special cases in connection with fighting against speculation, profiteering, and sabotage, and other misdeeds of merchants, industrials, officials, etc. These tribunals consist of a president and six members elected by the Soviets. The mixing up of political opponents, counter-revolution, and speculators in one category is one of the methods habitually employed by the Bolsheviks to obscure the popular mind, and to lay the whole guilt for the economic ruin on the opponents of the Soviets. The hungry crowd, frequently without waiting for any tribunals, settled in its own way the cases of the so-called speculators, whose only fault often was that they were found in possession of several pounds of flour or sugar. The revolutionary tribunals exercised judgment not so much upon the speculators as upon counter-revolutionaries, that is, the political enemies of Bolshevism. In Petrograd the tribunal started working at the end of December. One of the first cases dealt with was that of Countess Sophia Painin who was under indictment for the embezzlement of 92,000 rubles. The Soviet authorities had at their disposal all the buildings of the law courts abolished by them, but with their customary longing for palaces they seized the small but pretty palace of the Grand Duke Nikolai Nikolaevich, former commander-in-chief of the Russian army, and installed in it the new People's Tribunal. All the entrances were occupied by sentries armed with rifles whose duty it was to check the passes, as nobody was allowed to enter without a permit. And yet on the day of the Countess Sophia Palin's trial the White and Gold Hall rapidly filled up. The audience consisted of friends of the accused, her colleagues on various public bodies, 
journalists and workmen who were attached to her through visiting the people's palace she built for the workmen. There were also many lawyers. The Soviet had just abolished the bar. When the lawyers met to discuss the situation, the sailors chased them away. The lawyers, however, had had time to pass a protest against the destruction of Russian justice, and decided that they would visit as far as possible the sittings of the tribunal in order to fight by all means against it. The trial of Countess Paynon resembled a scene from a historic drama. She was an aristocrat by birth and position. After having given all her knowledge, energy, intelligence, and means to the interests of the democracy, this woman, whose working life and whole ambition aimed only at the education of her own people and the honor and freedom of Russia, was accused of embezzling state money. No direct charge of counter-revolution was made against her, but the cadets, to whose party she belonged, were proclaimed enemies of the people. Her arrest and trial increased her popularity. The Petrograd University gave her an honorary doctor's degree. A series of protests, signed by organizations and individuals, appeared in the papers. The prosecution instituted against her revived in the public mind her twenty years of benevolent activity. This woman, on whose side stood, it may be said without exaggeration, the whole of honest Russia, was being tried by a group of nobodies elected by no one knew whom. At the judge's table sat several men with unintelligent surly-looking countenances, partly in soldiers' tunics, and partly in workmen's clothes. They remained silent. The president, also a workman, tried to overcome his confusion so as not to lower the dignity of the revolutionary tribunal. But there was no real assurance either in him or in his comrades. What struck me was that there was no air of triumph in these victorious revolutionaries, but rather they seemed to feel guilty and ashamed. It was the same look as the Red Guards had, when some days after the coup d'etat, they disarmed the indomitable women's battalion. Evidently the general and outspoken indignation had at first a depressing effect, even on the Bolshevist commissaries. The trial of Countess Paynon produced the impression that not she but the Soviet of People's Commissaries was at the bar. All that was said in favor of the accused was an accusation against them. Her chief defender was a workman. With sincere emotion he narrated how, thanks to the accused, his whole life became changed. He had lived in darkness and emptiness until he met Countess Paynon. She had taught him to read. It was in her people's palace that he acquired general human interests, he the began to think, began to live for the sake of thought and truth, felt that joy of intellectual effort which may beautify any life. The workman finished with the words, for all that you did for me and many of us I bow low to you. During the reading of the protocol and the indictment Countess Paynin remained calm and reserved. 